uh mr ramakrishna um you you Sorry, gentlemen, I got disconnected uh, from the Zoom. Uh, so if we have the per I have the permission from everyone, can we start off with the plenary sec session second? Uh, do we have uh, Mr. Ramakrishna? Uh, Mr. Ramakrishna, uh, so it's 11.30. With your permission, can I start with this session? Yes. All right. So thank you. Thank you, sir. And a very warm welcome uh, to the third World Future Fuel Summit. I very warm, oh, extend my very warm welcome to all of you. This is the plenary session second in Hall B. And this session is going to focus on advanced biofuels and beyond. Uh, the chair for this session is going to be Mr. Ramakrishna Vaibhi, former chairman, working group on biofuels, Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas, Government of India. Uh, very warm welcome to you, sir. You're going to be the chair for this session, sir. And Thank let you. me introduce the key speakers for this session. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Karyakos uh, Maniatis, former DG ENER, European Commission, Belgium, Mr. Faisal Rahman, Country Director, Kim Paulus, India, and Head Bio2X, Fortum, India, Mr. Amol Nisal, Assistant Vice President, uh, Future Fuels, uh, Prague Industries Limited, uh, we have Mr. Ravi Gupta, Executive Director, Sri Renuka Sugars Limited, Professor Dr. Ng, Thomas uh, Wilner, Chemical Engineering, Head of the Process Engineering Research Group, Hamburg University of Applied Sciences, Germany. So a very warm welcome to all the speakers. It is indeed a great pleasure uh, that uh, we've been joined in in this very important uh, session by all of you. And now I hand over the virtual mic uh, to Mr. Ramakrishna uh, to please uh, begin with the proceedings and please chair the session. Over to you, Mr. Ramakrishna, sir. Thank you, Aishwarya. Uh, let me at the outset uh, thank uh, the organizers of the World Future Fuel uh, 2022 uh, for uh, inviting me to uh, chair this uh, particular session. I feel honored. And uh, we have uh, a wonderful set of uh, uh, you know, experts on uh, the panel uh, today, and the subject, uh, you know, is quite an interesting uh, thing. And uh, uh, you know, talking about uh, the advanced biofuels and uh, beyond. So uh, we we all know that uh, the world has been uh, really uh, moving towards uh, uh, low carbon and ultimately towards uh, zero carbon uh, uh, kind of uh, technologies, zero carbon fuels, etc. Um, and uh, uh, at the global level, uh, there are several initiatives on um, different um, type of uh, fuels based on different type of resources and different uh, conversion pathways. So we are looking at uh, uh, ethanol uh, as a fuel to be blended with uh, gasoline or as a replacement for gasoline, biodiesel, we are looking at HVO, we are also looking at uh, uh, you know, uh, the compressed biogas, uh, the replacement for uh, natural gas. And then, uh, you know, uh, we are also uh, looking at uh, sustainable aviation fuel, which can replace uh, the aviation uh, transport fuel. So, um, 
when uh, you know when we are uh, talking about all these kind of initiatives at uh, the global level um, you know every nation is coming forward and uh, making certain um, uh, commitment uh, towards uh, you know zero carbon uh, uh, footprint and as i see it uh, in the uh, fields area uh, slowly the world will be moving from uh, you know liquid fuels uh, to gaseous fuels and once again when we are talking about gaseous fuels uh, we will be ultimately looking at uh, uh, you know uh, the biomethanation uh, as uh, the solution and ultimately uh, we are all looking at um, completely zero carbon fuel which is uh, hydrogen so uh, it, this is the kind of uh, energy uh, transitional path that uh, we are looking at um, you know that uh, you know opens up uh, quite a few uh, opportunities uh, but uh, at the same time it also poses uh, uh, a lot of uh, challenges uh, uh, in terms of uh, various technologies uh, which are being at a different uh, uh, you know uh, the maturity level some of the technologies are at the laboratory some of them have been demonstrated on a pilot scale some are uh, been commercialized there are certain technologies which are under commercialization at this uh, point of time but you know when we are also looking very aggressively on this kind of a energy transition but uh, the big question mark that we have is that do i you know, uh, you know, put my fingers into one of these technologies or wait until uh, the kind of transition is complete. So, uh, you know, so, so for example, we are talking about second generation ethanol today. Uh, and then, um, you know, uh, at this point of time, we, it has its own challenges. But then if you are ultimately moving away from uh, liquid fuels to gaseous fuel, so do I need to, uh, you know, invest in uh, second generation and how long this transition is going to take? So we have challenges when it comes to the maturity of the technologies, the challenges we have with uh, regard to scaling of the technologies, and, uh, you know, the uh, government policies, it keeps changing all the time. And then uh, the financial institutions who are supposed to be financing this kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, technologies, uh, you know, they are uh, quite complacent about uh, the pace at which this kind of transition is happening and they will have to think twice whether they should really be, uh, you know, uh, financing uh, uh, this kind of section and whether that kind of money is, uh, uh, you know, investment is uh, protected, etc. So obviously an, any investor will also have to think uh, uh, twice. So, uh, I, I mean, you know, we ha do see opportunities, but we also see quite a few uh, challenges here. So I am only hoping that uh, all the panelists uh, today will be able to throw some light on uh, some of the issues and concerns that we have. And um, how do we address uh, uh, all these kind of issues and concerns as we uh, move forward? So, uh, you know, uh, without taking uh, too much of a time, uh, you know, I would uh, like to start with the very first speaker. Uh, as, as I see it, you know, we have uh, five speakers uh, today and we have uh, about uh, an hour and a half. So may I suggest that each of the speaker uh, take about uh, 12 to 13 minutes for their presentation and leave about a couple of minutes for uh, interaction with uh, the participants or with the fellow panelists. And then uh, probably at the end, we may still be left with uh, another seven to eight minutes uh, for uh, inter-panel uh, discussion and uh, any other question the other participants uh, may have. So let's start with uh, Mr. Kariakos uh, Maniatis, who is a uh, good friend of mine. We have been working together for I would say, almost a decade now. Uh, <laughs> he holds a PhD and he has held uh, various positions uh, in uh, Directorate uh, General for uh, Energy since 1998 in uh, uh, Europe. And he recently superannuated, that's in April 2020, as the principal administrator. So uh, he managed uh, Director, Gen Director General of Energy uh, demonstration component under uh, framework program of uh, Commission on Advanced Biofuels, played a very important uh, role in uh, market development of advanced biofuels, including uh, setting up of uh, alternate uh, renewable transport uh, PL forum. Uh, and incidentally, I had an opportunity to uh, be the India lead on the RPL forum. 
uh, thanks uh, Periakos for having facilitated that. And it was a great learning for me too. Um, and he has led uh, the work on the subgroup on advanced um, uh, biofuels. And uh, I have preserved that report of SGAB, which is an excellent report that uh, was developed under your uh, leadership. Uh, con currently, he's the advisor to ETF Lawrence. And um, together, we are organizing uh, the EU India BC 2022 on 2nd, 3rd, and uh, 4th March uh, of this year. Uh, so, uh, over to you, Mr. Periakos uh, Maniatis. Uh, looking forward to your uh, views on some of the issues that I raised. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you please put on my presentation? First of all, I would like to thank you very much uh, to thank the organizers from the World Fuel Future Fuel Summit, and specifically Mr. Anil Garg for the invitation. I've been participating in three other conferences he's been organizing. And of course, Mr. Ramakrishna, it's always a pleasure to working with you. And thank you for this very good presentation that you did. Uh, can we have the, my presentation, please? To the back end, my presentation, please. Uh, if you have not, are you able please to show my presentation, somebody from the back end? Uh, we can't see your presentation, sir. If you can share the screen, uh, it'd be great. I've sent it before by email. Yeah. Let me just confirm. Give me, give me a minute, please. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So basically, um, what I'm going to be presenting today to you, it is just my personal opinion, looking where the way we have come, where we have to go. And of course, key point here is we have to use the biofuels, but for what purpose? Our main problem is we have to decrease the use of fossil fuels. Say, next, please. Right. So we have to design the point for because by 2050, we have to decarbonize the economy. And there are two key questions we have to answer as far as biomass and biomass is concerned. The first is, do we have sufficient sustainable biomass resources to be used the fifth of the value chains? And here we don't only have to look about energy, we're also looking about chemicals and other uses in the construction industry and so on. And the second question is, do we have the technologies? Because, okay, you may have the biomass, but if you don't have the appropriate, efficient, and effective technologies, you cannot meet the target. So let's look at the problem and the means we have to address it. Next. Next, please. All right. Now, this is the problem. Next. Right. Now, this is the problem we are facing. The global carbon cycle shows that on the left-hand side, basically, we emit it on, I would say, annual basis on the average, about 9.4 gigatons of carbon per year. This is a significant amount. The atmosphere cannot take care of it. Some goes into the oceans, some goes into back to the soils, some goes back into the biomass. But this is the common problem. How can we address it? And the question is, do we have the right policies? Next one, please. Right, this is, a very interesting presentation I've seen from Professor Newman, uh, it's a figure basically, about the waves of innovation. We see that we started back in 1785 with the water power, then about 18, uh, 1840s, 1830s, we moved to the steam power and then railway came, steel came, cotton came, then we, we went to the third wave, coal, electricity, chemicals start coming to the market. We moved to the fourth wave, which is oil and gas, and of course then, the economy, in a way, uh, exploded to petrochemicals, electronics, aviation, space. We moved to the fifth wave, which were the digital networks, and then by technology and nanotechnology start playing a key role. And now we're in the last one, at least the one we are present, which is the renewable energy system. And we have sustainability issues. We need lithium batteries, electromobility, uh, smart cities, secret economy. There is no waste. We have to use everything. Next one. Next one, please. Right, so this shows basically, I'm now moving into the European Commission. Again, these are my own personal opinion. Do we have the right policies basically? And we see here that on the left hand side, you see that the, what it shows where we're going, the, let's say the use of fossil fuels has been reduced. However, we have to go much faster. 
If you see on this graph on the left hand side, if you see the top black line, you see that this is the effort the community has to do in about 2020, where we are now. If we don't do the right policies now, it will be impossible to meet the targets by 2050. And if you see the second, the more inclined um, line arrow, it is really dramatic. That means the investments that the society will have to do in Europe, they're going to be significant. And of course, everybody knows that in Europe we have the Renewable Energy Directive. It is the only legislation I know that has been revised twice before the member states were able to take it in national legislation. And this clearly shows that basically the European Commission realized some time, two, two, two years ago, that we were not on the right track. We didn't have the right policies. And of course, now came last year the Fit for 55 has been proposed that aims to achieve 55% emission reduction by 2030. So we need stable policies. Mr. Ramakrishnan mentioned that the investor would not invest money unless they are certain that there's going to be a long-term policy for the next at least 20 years so that they can have a payback on their investment. Next one. Next one, please. Back in, thank you. Now, very quickly, I'm going to go through a study I had the pleasure to uh, do with uh, Dr. Kajubi uh, Panucci from the Imperial College, and that was funded by Concave. So Concave wanted to see what is the biomass availability in Europe, do have enough biomass to produce biofuels. And this is basically uh, the amount of biomass that there is in Europe, the availability of bioenergy. There were three scenarios, always low, medium, and high. Of course, the low, there is low biomass mo mo mobilization that increases to the high mobilization. And of course, they will start using marginal lands, abandoned lands, and so on. And you see that basically there, are some, there is some difference between 2030 and 2050, but it's not dramatic. Next one, please. Right, then after that, we look at the technologies. And on the left-hand side here, that's how the way we look at the technologies. On the left-hand side, the red lines are the value chains that they are commercial for the moment. And this, of course, is starting from an aerobic gesture of biomass to produce biogas, then by removal of carbon dioxide, we move to biomethane, and of course, there's very big demand about biomethane in order to uh, decarbonize uh, transport and also to inject it to the grid. On the other side of the graph, we have basically the HVOs, that means the used cooking oils, uh, algal oils, and so on. And of course, by, they can be hydro-processed to produce paraffin biofuels. On the left-hand side, the green, it shows that uh, the FOA, sorry, the FOA on the small square means first of a kind plant. So indeed, we see that the cellulosic ethanol, basically, it's now coming to commercialization. There are the plants in India with plants and Campolis and the plants, there are plants in Europe being built with, uh, with Clarion. And we see that, for example, we'll start with, with biomass. There's the extraction of sugars. If you want, you can process the sugars to fermentation for ethanol, or if you want from the sugars, you can go to chemicals. And then you have the lignin, and again, from the lignin, either you can burn it to produce energy, or you can, again, uh, produce further chemicals. And again, you can start from ethanol and upgrade to paraffin fuels for aviation and so on. In the middle, the blue line, there are the, there are the technologies that now they're still trying to come to, let's say, to penetrate the market. There is very big development, but still we don't see the large-scale demos industrial plants that we've seen in the other three body chains. And for example, I'm not going to go through all of them because of time, in gasification produces a synthesis gas. If you want from that, you can generate ethanol, uh, or if otherwise you can upgrade it with a catalyst to, to generate a, a very big, let's say, uh, list of projects, synthetic biofuels, chemicals, and so on. Next slide, please. Right, then what we, one back, one back, please. All right, what we try to do, we try to put the technologies based on the TRL level, the technology readiness level, and more or less the same thing. And again, you see that on the commercialization side, uh, the, let's say TRL level of nine, basically you have anaerobic digestion and hydrotreating, while cellulosic ethanol comes into this area. Uh, all the other, or the majority of them, they are still in uh, demo and economic viability. And in the bottom, we also introduce the e-fuels. And on the top, the green lines, of course, they are the biological conversion. The red one is the thermochemical. And the bottom is the, what we call the e-fuels from renewable hydrogen and, uh, and hydrocarbons. Next one, please. Right. 
These were the results of the study about the availability, the availability of biomass. And basically the first row, you see the, the estimated biomass of bioenergy. Uh, you see the amounts in MTOE in 2030 to 2050. But of course, part of that is needed to go to biochemicals. It's needed to go to construction. It's needed to go for paper. So this is the amount of biomass. The second row shows the amount of biomass that can be imported in the European Union. The other row is basically after subtracting all the other uses for chemicals, uh, construction, paper and everything, what is really left for biofuels or bioenergy. So, and we add the, let's say the second row, the 48 for 2030, for example, to what's available after subtracting all the other uses. In the bottom, we get the actual amount of biomass left for producing advanced biofuels or for using transport with the value chains we discussed earlier. Next one, please. Next one. Right, this was the, the assumption we did. And from here, I'm not going to go through that because it's going to take too much time, but I would go just for the first one. What we assume is that by 2050, there's going to be sufficient renewable hydrogen available to be used also in biofuel production, and particularly in the gasification process, because with that, we increase significantly the carbon conversion ratio. Next one. Next one, please. And here I will try to go fast. Basically by using this assumption, we see that we can produce, let's say in 2050, up to about 160 to 255 MPOE of advanced biofuels. It's because of the time I will go fast. Next one, please. Right, so let's start to see where we are. We see that there is significant progress on electrolysis, batteries. Uh, one more. Okay, let's, let's stay on this one, just leave it. So basically that shows, yeah, the significant progress on electrolysis, batteries and other technologies. However, the cost remains still very high for the consumer. I mean, I cannot afford more to buy a car car here in Europe. Then we have the CCS and CCU still remain elusive and very little progress has been reported. However, promoting the use of renewables, although it has been successful policy, it is inadequate to ensure that we're going to achieve the 1.5 degree scenario by 2050. To do that, we have to have new legislation to reduce the use of fossil fuels. This is otherwise, this is the key target. Otherwise, we're not going to make it. This is my personal opinion. It's not the opinion of the European Commission. And of course, we see that all the EU major oil majors and also the US participants, they have put forward their net zero 2050 strategy. So it's time that we sit down with them and discuss how we're going to achieve the road to decarbonization. And of course, we may not forduce, forget the civil society. It's extremely important to be included in the discussions. Next one. Right, so to summarize, biomass and bioenergy are very critical to meet the 2050 targets. There are sufficient quantities of sustainable biomass to produce sustainable advanced biofuels, of course, in the European Union, but I'm certain if we do the right analysis in all the countries like in India, we're going to find come to the same results similarly. At present, they need policy balance support to compete against the fossil fuels. However, if we have legislation to curtail the use of fossil fuels, we wouldn't need to go on supporting the advanced biofuels and the renewables in general. So biomass can be indispensable for stabilizing the power grid because it is, we can use it whenever we want it. It can be storable. Uh, we, it can provide sustainable biofuels in sectors like aviation, heavy duty transport and maritime. It can secure negative emissions via CCBS. And it can, of course, very important, provide uh, job in rural areas. And of course, uh, we have to support it to whatever policy extent. Next one, please. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I will try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pericles, for uh, that wonderful uh, presentation. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't see any questions in the chat box. Is there going to be another question answer kind of a session? Yeah, I think Ravi probably has a question. Maybe I think Ravi uh, should ask. Yeah. No, no, it's such a wonderful presentation, Doctor. They're really very encouraging. Uh, I have two questions for you. In Europe, uh, particularly in EU, uh, you have this uh, successful uh, production of biomethane through the agriculture residues, like grasses and so, and how much is it? 
I don't know what you mean the amount of biomethane. Yeah, so so the quantity of biomethane, how much production of biomethane is there through the agriculture residues as of today? I don't know the number, but I can find it sent to you. I'm okay. sorry about that. It, right. it changes rapidly because new plants are coming, continue specifically countries like Germany, France, Sweden, they have new plants continuously. And and what is your view on the bagasse based ethanol? Is the technology successful? And what, what are your views on that side? Bagasse for cellulosic ethanol? Baha, yeah. Oh, but, yes, I mean, Use this ethanol is... Ethanol from bagasse, yeah. Uh, producing ethanol from bagasse is very successful. I mean, you have, you have Prats working very much on that in, in India. Uh, you have the, the Brazilians are also doing an extremely good job on that. So, uh, yes, why not? It is working well. It's working well. But again, I mean, cellulosic ethanol starts, it is still a young child. We have to take good care of it to make it grow. Thank you, doctor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, question, uh, Ravi. And thank you very much, uh, Karyakos, for uh, that wonderful uh, presentation. Um, with the permission of other speakers, uh, I would uh, request Ravi to uh, make the presentation because I believe that Ravi has a flight to catch. Thank so, you. So uh, maybe I think, you know, we will uh, jump the line and uh, let Ravi uh, uh, do the talking. Uh, uh, Ravi Gupta is the executive director of uh, uh, Renuka Sugar. So Renuka Sugar is a very large uh, conglomerate of uh, sugar mills. I think they have about 11 uh, uh, mills in the country with uh, uh, sugar production, ethanol, power generation. Uh, you know, uh, as far as uh, the first generation ethanol goes, I think they generate something like 930 uh, uh, kiloliters per day is the kind of capacity. And then uh, bagasse based power of 242 megawatts almost 135 megawatts is being exported. And uh, 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 Mr. Ravi Kupta has been, uh, uh, you know, uh, comes with uh, the background on forest management and uh, overall has about uh, 25 years of experience in uh, uh, with sugar, grains, alcohol, and uh, oil seeds. He's a very strong believer in uh, ethanol program. Uh, he's also the chairman of the uh, ethanol Exam Committee of uh, the ISPA, Honorable uh, Member of the Western India Sugar Mills Association, and also a member uh, of Task Force on Sugar uh, in the Confederation of Indian Industries. And he is also uh, a member of the Ethanol Group of uh, Indian Federation of uh, Green Energy. So uh, over to you, uh, Sravi Gupta. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ramakrishna. Uh, and uh, I must thank you, thanks our organizer, particularly Dr. Nilgar, who seems to be extremely passionate about the biofuels now. And, you know, a carbon energy, carbon energy conference and with biofuel makes a very opposite and a very uh, interesting, uh, you know, combination. So I thank Dr. Nilgar for inviting me. And I particularly thank uh, Ramakrishna sir, and he is one of the authorities on the biofuels. I have been interacting with him and he has held a very important position and he still works for biofuels. It's always a pleasure to get into any association where he is chairing. So uh, thank you very much. So I have a small presentation uh, for you. I'll try to finish it in 10, 15 minutes. Is the presentation visible? Yes. Yeah, so uh, one second. Just give me one second. There is some problem. I'm not able to flip the slides. Mm. Sorry for this technically glitch, but I'm not able to flip the slides. What do we do, organizers? Dr. Ramakrishna, uh, what I suggest, what I suggest is that you know, uh, you know, your full screen, reduce it and try changing it. Let us see. Or what yes, I what you, I suggest, you can reduce, sir. You can reduce uh, or just stop the presentation mode and see if that works for you. One second. 
Dr. Ramakrishna, why don't we do one thing? Let the other present presenter uh, present the presentation for the positive type. I'll come as next by the time I'll sort it out. Uh, sure. Because yeah, somehow it them, seems uh, it seems that I my computer is hanged. Okay, okay. Um, uh, what we will uh, do is you know we will uh, move on to Mr. Faisal uh, uh, Rahman. Uh, he is the country director of uh, Campolis and uh, he is the head of Bio2x at uh, Fortum. So he's also the director of the Assam Bio Refinery Private Limited, a joint venture of Fortum and uh, Numaligar uh, Refineries uh, Limited. Uh, this is one of the very large uh, second generation ethanol uh, production facility that is being created in uh, the state of Assam with uh, bamboo as the feedstock. And we have Faizur Rahman, who has about 20 years of experience in the automobile sector, agri products, energy, and uh, you know, his interest has been uh, bioeconomy. So let's uh, hear from Faizur uh, Rahman on uh, the kind of challenges that he has been facing with regard to the setting up this plant and his general views on uh, the advanced biofuels and uh, the kind of uh, roadmap for the future. Over to you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Is it visible? No, no, no not yet. Not yet. So just let me try. Mm. Yes, we can see the yeah. presentation now. Can you put it in the full screen mode? Yes, it is visible. Uh, Mr. Mr. Faisal Rahman, you have to unmute. So you muted. Mr. Rahman, uh, you have to unmute. So we can see your presentation, but uh, your mic is muted. Uh, Mr. Rahman, can you hear us? Yeah, now your yeah, now. Yeah, I think you can start. We, we can't hear you, Mr. Eman. Mike. Can you see me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Try to share my screen once again. Let's see if it is working.
can you hear me now yes yes we can hear you so there is a problem i think whenever i share my screen then the video got stuck so maybe i can uh, send my presentation to the yes, organizer so please send the presentation at email at dr nilgar2011 at gmail.com so i will upload from over here and i request uh, chairman to please uh, uh, invite mr ravi gupta so we will uh, share this presentation have you received the presentation yeah. from, uh, yes. ravi gupta yes sir uh, may, maybe i think you know ravi gupta can start the presentation and uh, rahman uh, can in the meantime send his yeah, yeah. presentation over to the back end. sure sir sure ravi gupta ravi ravi ji you have to unmute and start sharing yeah yeah the back end can start sharing now ravi gupta's presentation yeah yeah thank you doctor thank you chairman i think there's some technical glitch that when you load the presentation the presentation gets stuck <clears throat> punita are you uploading the presentation please back end punit back end punit are you uploading the presentation please yeah yeah we will see just thank you very much am i audible yes yeah thank you very much so i have uh, uh, named this presentation the uh, title is role blending program and chasing the fortunes because i genuinely believe that uh, this whole program of ethanol has brought lot of fortunes and we are still chasing for the better fortunes so uh, with that note i would like to start my presentation next slide please you see it is very important for anyone when you talk about ethanol blending program in india it is much required that we understand the sugar industry with it because ultimately the sugar cane and the sugar becomes the raw material for uh, the ethanol what happened uh, that in india there was a new variety of sugar cane which was discovered in the northern india and due to that variety our sugar production uh, you know which used to be around 27 28 million ton uh, suddenly turned out to be 33 34 million ton so we had 6 million ton of excess sugar year on year and it had it had become a problem for the government because of the very high sugar cane prices in india uh, we were globally export uncompetitive and the government you know had to do Uh, export of excess sugar by providing incentives, and a nearly one and a half billion dollar of uh, uh, incentives uh, was given in a year to export that sugar, and the sugar which we were producing was surplus year on year. So this problem had to be solved, and we kind of was in a very very hope, hopeless situation. But I must congratulate the government of India for this that they have created this hopeless situation. into such a hopeful and optimistic situation that it has turned the fortune of this industry if you look at the green line in 2021 21 22 we had to export nearly 7 million tons of sugar and with the ethanol program you know india will come into a situation where we may not have to export anything and every surplus of sugar will be used for the ethanol blending in the country next situation next uh, slide please puneet yeah so these are the bars which shows the surplus in 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 21 22 if you see that we had a 9 million tons of surplus and we will have 6 million tons of exports 
and only 3.2 million tons will go for the ethanol blending program. And going forward, this 3.2 million will go into around 5 million tons of sugar into ethanol. So what we are doing in India is basically whatever surplus sugar which we are producing, rather than exporting to the world market at an incentive, the Indian government has created a great win-win situation in which all the surplus sugar will be used for producing ethanol blending program. Next. So also, why I say that ethanol is changing fortunes? Because the government has kept the ethanol prices in a manner that it is based on the raw material prices of the agriculture crop. For example, uh, the ethanol prices uh, based on uh, uh, of sugar-based product is based on the FRP of sugarcane, and even the grain ethanol prices are based on the uh, MSP of uh, uh, those crops. So it, it has assured a minimum income to the farmer, which has been the objective of the government. It has saved a lot of subsidy because year on year, otherwise India had to subsidize sugar exports. Rather than giving subsidy, we have reduced our import dependence on, uh, on uh, petrol. It is a green fuel and carbon reduction, which is major, major component of it. And it, has, it is creating employment and rural income because most of the industry, sugar industry, is based out in the rural areas. So it creates the rural employment and rural income. Energy security is a very big aspect because 85 to 90% of our transportation fuel is met through the import of crude. So the ethanol blending program has given a lot of energy security to the country. And last but not least, you know, with this ethanol blending program coming up, there is a lot of innovation which, is, which has happened within the industry. You know, suddenly the sugar industry has started talking about bio CNG, uh, green hydrogen. Yesterday, I'm in Pune. I was, I had a uh, presentation from someone who is saying that uh, you know we can do electrolysis of the COT, which is produced by sugar industry. Have the green uh, energy which we have. We have cogeneration plant and use that energy to to produce hydrogen for the aviation fuel. So a lot of innovation has also come because the whole culture of the industry has changed to consider sugar industry as the, as the uh, green energy industry. Next. Next, please. Uh, so this is the, uh, uh, you know, ethanol program performance. If you look, look at uh, 1920, we had only uh, 1.7 billion liters of ethanol added into control. And in the year next, it became 2.9. And this year, you know, as the things are going, we have already contracted 1.8 billion, 3.8 billion liters of ethanol, and another 3.8 has been, another 0.38 has been added in this uh, reset tender. So India will be at least mixing 4.2 billion liters of ethanol, and this is by far the largest growing ethanol program across the globe. This year, our ethanol uh, usage in petrol will go up by 40 percent. So there is a real performance which is happening in the industry. Next. And government has been supporting. These are the, uh, you know, basically the prices which government pays. And the government has set the ethanol prices based on the uh, sugar which is uh, lost in producing ethanol. So we have this B heavy molasses, which are sugar rich molasses. We have sugar cane juice, which is pure sugar. So the government has kept the prices made from this uh, raw material uh, higher because the more sugar is converted into ethanol. So the government is supporting the program and government is supporting the program by understanding the whole dynamics of this industry. Next. Next, please. Uh, and uh, ethanol policy changes are even faster than the industry would have expected. I'll tell you the recent changes. Next. In India, uh, these are the January 2022 figures. Our ethanol program is 8.75% till January as compared to 8.1% last year. And uh, so year on year, we are increasing our uses of ethanol. Our four states have already reached 10% ethanol blending program, which is Maharashtra, Karnataka, UP, and Andhra Pradesh. 
OMCs is which is called the uh, oil marketing companies. They uh, have a requirement around 4.6 billion liters, which is easy to uh, fulfill and the industry is equipped to do that. And another thing which in India has happened, earlier we were making ethanol only from the final molasses, which was, which was after taking out all the sugar from uh, the sugar cane and A stage and B stage and C molasses were the molasses where the sugar was minimum. But now the C molasses sugar, C molasses ethanol is just 3.2%, which means that we are making ethanol from sugarcane juice and the B molasses, which are sugar rich molasses and trying to convert maximum sugar into ethanol so that we have more quantity of ethanol and we have less sugar production as, as uh, you know, at the same time. Indian fuel ethanol consumption, as I was explaining, is risen by 40%. Next. Uh, the government recently has increased the ethanol blending uh, percentage from 10 to 11%. The thought process being that the states which have already achieved 10%, they can go up to 11%. Government recently came with a policy that there will be additional levy of two rupees per liter on the uh, fuel which is unblended, with, which is sold without ethanol. This is just to make the ethanol even more competitive. And recently, government also came out with a uh, with a policy that the ethanol, which was required in the faraway areas in this country, for which I will show you the graph in the subsequent stage, they will be given additional uh, benefits so the sugar mills can go in the farther area and supply ethanol. Flex fuel car rollout plan is in place, and I am hoping that by January 22, 24, we will have flex fuel cars in India. And ethanol pump, where 100% ethanol shall be available, is I am also very hopeful will start in 2024. The most important thing is that the uh, roadmap for 20% ethanol blending by 2025 is very clearly, it is target oriented. PM himself has announced that program. And within the target, we are, in fact, we are, um, uh, we are much earlier than the target rather than behind the target. So I see India in 2025, uh, maybe even uh, slightly earlier, going to a 20% ethanol blending uh, program and very successfully. Next. Uh, this is the thing which I was saying, all the green color states were either not uh, adding ethanol into the fuel or they were adding less than 10%. So the government came out with the policy that if you supply ethanol in these green area states, which is eastern state and northeastern state, they will give you additional incentive of the quantity based on the quantity you supply. So this strategy has worked very well. In the recent tender, 40% of the quantity was quoted for these deficit states, which is a great achievement. And uh, for the first time in the, in the difficult areas of Jammu and Kashmir, the ethanol will, will be blended with petrol uh, with this policy of the government. Next. Uh, going forward, uh, I think the government is um, uh, definitely of the view that the uh, increase uh, in blending percentage will happen as more ethanol is produced. Flex, flex fuel cars will become a future. We look forward that 100% ethanol distribution at pump so that the customer has the discretion like what they have in Brazil that he can either opt for a 100% ethanol or, for, or the gasoline. And next, last but not least, we have to go further into innovation that can we make ethanol from bagasse? Can we make, can, should we encourage biogas from the press mud, which is the byproduct of the sugar industry and so and so forth. So that innovation will have to be take place. Next. Next, please. Takeaway, uh, biggest takeaway, as, I was, as was, I was saying in the beginning, government has turned a distressed situation into fortunes. Why I say distressed situation? Because sugar surplus was so much that either government had an option to uh, continue to give export subsidies or government had an option to, uh, you know, ask farmer not to plant cane, but, but for the farmer welfare, 
the government has turned into a, a distress situation into a fortune, uh, fortune. Ethanol blending definitely assure a minimum support price to the farmer because ethanol has become a, another outlet and the pricing mechanism is such that the farmer will continue to get a minimum support price for their crop. And this program is farmer friendly, which brings energy security and clean environment. And I'm very, very hopeful the way the government is uh, doing, this program will be very, very successful and India will be looking forward to 20% ethanol blending by 2025. Next. I thank uh, everyone for the patient uh, hearing and uh, assure that the uh, whole industry is working towards achieving this target and we will not be behind our target. We will be in fact, uh, finishing it much ahead of the target. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gupta ji. And um, I have one uh, quick question uh, for you. Uh, you know, now uh, I have always been saying that oil marketing companies have to reposition themselves as energy companies. And that's true with uh, the sugar industry also. Uh, as I see it, uh, very soon sugar is going to become the byproduct. And uh, the energy will be the focus of the sugar industry. So, you know, uh, currently, you know, you have been looking at uh, the sugar being converted, but uh, you did touch upon uh, the potential with uh, bagas to be converted into ethanol through second generation. And you also have uh, bagas as well as the uh, press mud uh, uh, and other other waste streams that comes out, uh, which can uh, really help generate uh, compressed biogas also. So uh, what is the, I mean, you know, on the, uh, potential that is there as far as the compressed biogas as well as on the second generation ethanol. Uh, the uh, sugar industry seems to be going a bit slow. You know, what is it that is uh, stopping them from going aggressively on uh, those opportunities? You know, uh, thank you very much, sir, for asking the candid question. And let me uh, give a very candid reply on this. You know, sugar industry is very, very positive on bagasse based ethanol. In fact, Eisen in Brazil also said that they have the technology and they can uh, make bagasse based ethanol. But to be honest with you, uh, the, the, uh, the assurance on paper is more than assurance, it is practical. But sugar industry is definitely looking at it and in a very, very positive manner. Uh, I personally tell you that I had uh, uh, some people approaching me. They said that, you know, you give us the bagasse we will take out the cellulose and give you lignin back, right? It all looks very promising. It all looks game changer. But somehow, uh, one uh, have not seen the successful pilot projects yet. I think also the industry had been very busy in uh, making ethanol from sugar. But now industry has a little bit breathing space and industry is very, very proactively looking at a uh, bagasse-based ethanol. As far as Pressmut bio-CNG bio is concerned and biogas is concerned, Industry is going very, very fast in this aspect. I am in Pune, sir. So uh, I natural gas, sugar and allied uh, industry. They have already put up a biogas plant. The challenge which we are facing in terms of biogas is that how to transport that biogas to the consumption center. Right, making biogas is absolutely not an issue, and it's a low cost, low capital cost uh, plant. And it can be the erection can be done uh, within one year, and industry is positive. Only challenges which we are facing is on the distribution of biogas. That how do we bring it to the consumption center? So one of the ways which we are innovating within the industry is that why don't we have the bio CNG plants in our uh, uh, factory itself and encourage all these tractors and agriculture folks to you to convert their uh, you know, uh, automobile into biogas so that the consumption in village. So the the industry is doing it. Challenges on the distribution. I think over a time it will also get solved. Yeah, I think even that, has, you know, probably you had to think in terms of uh, how you can do it in a very distributed way rather than uh, looking at uh, the energy consumption centers in big cities and things like that. So yeah. thank you very much uh, for that uh, presentation, uh, Mr. Gupta ji. Without losing any more time, I think uh, let's... Uh, go to presentation from uh, Mr. Rahman. Uh, I have already introduced uh, Mr. Rahman, who is the country director of Campolis uh, India and the head of the Bio2x uh, forum. Uh, so over to you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for introduction and uh, for uh, uh, good presentation. 
may I have my presentation here? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Ravi, I think uh, uh, we need to talk because I think we have technology which can convert the bagasse into, into ethanol. I will try, I will reach you uh, separately. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, because we see that almost like 40, 50 million of bagasse is available and we need to convert it into uh, 2G ethanol. And definitely the presentation is up, you can start. Uh... Yes. Thank you uh, for this for this opportunity, Mr. Gurk, for, for bringing this one. So today the topic is uh, biomass to biofuel. And uh, I would like to add that we can go a little beyond that biofuel also. But definitely, this is the buzz where we need to, we need to make sure that we are delivering to the needs of the country. We require to cut down our import, as Mr. Gupta was highlighting. And we need to make sure that our farmers are also winning out of this uh, proposition. And it's a fantastic scheme. I think government is being supportive. And government have been very innovative also, seeing the conditions, how the 2G technologies are faring. They have also promoted the 1G technology uh, for the time being. If I may go to the next slide, a uh, 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 couple of slides on, on about what, what we are. We are Fortum. Uh, uh, it's a Finland-based company. A sizable uh, balance sheet, uh, a decent amount of people working for Fortum as of now, and uh, uh, profitability is also quite decent. We have a pan-Europe uh, presence now, along with Russia. And in India, our major uh, operations, or let's say that uh, what we are doing beyond Assam by refinery, is uh, having the solar assets. We have solar development, solar developer. And we also have interest in providing the infrastructure of charge and drive business um, for electric vehicles. So some setups there. Next slide, please. And Campolis is, uh, uh, is our subsidiary company, which bring the technology of this Pharmaco, Formico Bio, which we are utilizing in Assam for setting up the first uh, uh, commercial plant. We are using their bamboo and, uh, and the byproducts are ethanol and all those things. Talking more about this thing, about the financing of this sector and uh, whatever we are, we are changing, whatever the various technology stages we are having. Uh, this technology got developed in last uh, couple of decades uh, back in Finland. And now we are also setting up this commercial plant in Assam. And I'm pretty sure that by the year end, we would be able to complete our mechanical completion, if not the overall completion happening seeing the number of waves and the, and the uh, like ferocity of this COVID waves coming in, I think we would be allowed to work more, uh, more focused now with the continuity over there. And we are expecting that uh, we would commission it. The technology of Campolis, may, may I have the next slide, please? Yeah. So the technology of Campolis and the vision of full term is, is a perfect example how we should look into the future, how we should be seeing that what's happening around us and what we can expect uh, we are going to get. When solar and wind are taking the center stage of uh, providing us the energy requirement, they are providing us the electricity, which is coming as cheap as any other form of energy and as renewable as you can expect from them. We believe very strongly that in coming decades, it's going to be the it's going to be the market for sustainable material. It's not going to be for the power and electricity people are going to be uh, fighting for. There are going to be surplus uh, electricity for everyone to consume, even in India and the developing nations like ours. But this is going to be a demand for sustainable material. How my how my furniture is being made? How my car fuels are coming? How my cars are being made? And all those things are going to be coming to the, to the minds of the consumer. And we need to get ourselves prepared with the technologies which can answer these questions. And we need to make sure that we are developing the high value uh, products by using the biomass if it's possible or maybe other ways so that we can, we can uh, make uh, the world more and more sustainable in, in coming future. And that's exactly what we are trying to do with this Fortum Bio2x program plus campus technology. That's what we are, we are doing here. Next slide, please. This is what we are uh, very much capable of doing right now. We are ready to fractionate this uh, biomass. Let's assume that we are using bamboo in, in Assam. And as I promised Mr. Gupta that uh, we are quite capable of handling bagasse also. And we have a very intensive uh, research program 
which shows that we can handle wheat straw and rice straw also uh, in the country. At least for converting it into the biofuel, we are very, very much uh, uh, comfortable. We can uh, uh, showcase our results and we can show the samples also. And simultaneously, we are developing the other uh, uh, other chemicals, or as we say that the chemical properties, cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. We are really, really developing the high-value products uh, from the biomass. And the best part of this uh, whole process is that that we don't look from the output point of view. We look from the biomass point of view and how we can make the best utilization of it, how we can go and achieve 90 plus percent efficiency of biomass utilization. We try to produce the value products which have a commercial value and a sustainable uh, utilization also so that nothing goes waste out of it. Because if we try to, if we try to achieve one thing, like uh, we try to produce ethanol, and then we don't know what to do with the rest of the uh, chemical properties of, of, of the biomass. Then again, we are going back to the same situation that we are not making the best utilization of it. So our focus is that we can convert the biomass in more valuable products, more valuable products like ethanol, like dissolving pulp is possible with cellulose, like uh, with hemicellulose, you can go to the furfural. And, and if, if you please present the next slide also. This is a kind of a, uh, 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 industry we are, we are trying to cater. We are not limiting uh, to one industry. And this is the, the challenge also that uh, we, are not, uh, we are not only in the one industry. So we try to develop the products which can be, which can be utilized or which can be absorbed by, by many uh, industries and make their own supply chain sustainable. Next slides, please. This is a rough calculation, rough estimation. If we try to compare ourselves with a with a pulp mill, and just a reminder, Finland is a agro-based uh, economy. They are quite quite good in in making pulp mills uh, across the world. Uh, they are they are supplying to that. And if you try to compare what we are trying to do here, we are we are getting the 90% efficiency of our biomass, like sugarcane or, or bagas or ba bamboo or wheat straw, whatever we are using. We can, we can convert into some valuable products out of it, at least 90% of the efficiency we can achieve if we compare it with pulp mill or, or a targeted ethanol production. Next slide, please. This is what I was talking about when I say that uh, we are producing the products which can go into the multi industries. It is not only for, for one industry, like furfural can be used for for uh, fuel additives, it can be used for lubricants, it can be used for, for jet fuels and pesticides and many, many more utilization because we don't have a global, global uh, furfural supply chain, means like a very, very stable supply chain. That's why many industries don't uh, try to utilize it. But the way we are going in, uh, that Assam biorefinery is coming in and many more refineries to be followed with it we can actually create a huge amount of uh, furfural requirement and people can use it. And this is going to be sustainable and I'm pretty sure competitive also. Next, please. Same is the case with the another byproduct which is coming from our refinery, acetic acid. We can, we can use it as a solvent. We can use it as an adhesive in the textile industry, in the coating uh, material. Next, please. And I think the biggest uh, biggest hidden treasure in, in this uh, whole thing is lignin. We need to we need to make uh, better utilization of it rather than converting it into uh, or burning it into uh, making power. But we need to see what what we can actually make the good use of it. We can use it as a laminate. We can use it into the tire industry. It's a, a injection molding. We can use it insulation. This material can be utilized. That's where we are coming in. And that's uh, what we believe we can actually uh, provide with our technology as of now also. The next project which we are focusing, definitely in Assam biorefinery, we are producing uh, furfural acetic acid, ethanol, and we are uh, converting our bio coal into, into CHP because we want to make, uh, we wanted to make our biorefinery self-reliance of steam and power. But this option is always available with us. We can convert some part of it into lignin and make uh, our commercials more viable for us. Next, please. 
So this is a snapshot. We have already uh, achieved somewhere around like uh, seventy percent of the total uh, completion of our project. And as I said in before, that we are very, very uh, uh, hopeful. We are pushing ourselves. We are pushing our team, our vendors, everybody, that we want to achieve the mechanical completion in the third quarter of this year. And we would like to go for the uh, overall completion, overall uh, uh, commissioning of the project, if possible in this year or very early next year. That's our target over there. Some uh, numbers for you. Next slide, please. And I think this is exactly what uh, Mr. Gupta was trying to highlight into that point that what we can do with our farmers, what uh, we can take to the rural uh, sector or what we can take to the villages of India. Because now we are talking about the uh, real agri-based uh, industry over here. We can create uh, employment generation in uh, harvesting, bamboo harvesting, what we are doing in Northeast and the transportation, because we are talking about like 80 to 100 trucks movement daily. So there is a huge amount of transportation uh, is required. There are people who are going to get more money uh, in Northeast. It's going to be bamboo growers. And if we talk about North, uh, let's say rice straw, wheat straw players, then they can get it uh, some money for, for their uh, straw, which they are burning right now. We know that how uh, big problem we are facing in Hello, Freeman, are you there? Am I audible? Yes, yes. In between, I think we lost you. Yeah, sorry for that. So we are going to create some employment and definitely we are going to create more and more entrepreneur because the whole supply chain for this biomass is going to be quite diversified. We are going to use... Um, uh, uh, bamboo over there, we are going to use uh, other materials, raw material for that over there. And then the huge amount of uh, sustainable uh, products going to come out of it. That's what we are doing. I have uh, some photographs for the refinery. Uh, if you guys can please uh, display them. Meanwhile, if anybody have any comment, any questions, I would love to answer that if it's possible for me or I can come back to you guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I think, you know, we did uh, lose some time because of some of the technical glitch that we had. So maybe I think, you know, uh, we should, uh, to, in, in order to be fair to the other two speakers, uh, I would rather like to start off with the presentation. Uh, we'll have a presentation from Mr. Amol uh, Nisal. And at the end, if there is some time left, we'll come back for uh, any questions. Uh, Mr. Nisal is the assistant vice president of uh, Raj Industries, and you know, we all know that Raj has been a technology leader. Uh, they have been a leader in the first generation ethanol, second generation ethanol. They have also been uh, doing a tremendous amount of research work in the area of uh, compressed biogas and sustainable uh, aviation fuel. And Mr. Nisal has been with uh, Raj for more than 15 years now. He's been uh, 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 handling the business development, the strategy, sales project management for both conventional as well as advanced biofuel. He has a keen interest in uh, circular economy, environmental sustainability, and uh, life cycle analysis. So currently, um, he is uh, enabling the production and use of sustainable aviation fuel on a commercial scale at uh, Praj. So over to you, Mr. Nisal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ramkrishna. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Anil Garg for inviting me for this session. It's uh, absolutely a great pleasure to participate in this session chaired by Mr. Y.B. Ramkrishna. And it was also nice to see the variety of topics covered by uh, eminent speakers in two days of this conference. And this is my second year of uh, participation in the conference and it's been an absolute pleasure. So uh, let me start my presentation uh, on the topic of advanced biofuels and beyond. 
the content of my presentation is that uh, you all know about Raj, uh, but here uh, there are some uh, uh, important updates that I want to share with you in this forum. Uh, then I will talk about Raj's biomobility platform, wherein we are providing technology solutions for uh, renew renewable transportation fuels, thereby helping in decarbonization of transport. Uh, then I will talk briefly about the Infinity technology, our second generation ethanol technology that has been uh, commercialized uh, over the last uh, 15 years. And uh, we are seeing uh, some fruitful, uh, some fruits of that uh, technology commercialization in, in the form of uh, uh, commercial scale plants. Uh, I will also touch upon the sustainable aviation fuel technology uh, for which we have a collaboration with uh, GEO Incorporation in USA. And uh, then I'll just uh, sum it up in the, in the last slide. So as you know all about Praj, uh, that uh, Praj is a, a company, a global leader in providing bioprocess solutions in the area of uh, renewable transportation fuels. Uh, it's a listed company with revenue of around $200 million. Uh, 1,000 plus references over 100 countries in the world. And uh, recently there, there have been uh, many awards and accolades received by Praj. Uh, it has been uh, acknowledged as the best place to work, number one. Uh, it has also been uh, uh, received as the second hottest uh, uh, company in the advanced bioeconomy by Biofuel Digest USA, the largest uh, biofuels daily uh, in the world. And recently, our uh, esteemed chairman, Dr. Pramod Choudhury, has been received George Washington Carver Award 2020 for innovation in industrial biorefineries and agriculture. And just uh, uh, last week, uh, he also received an important award uh, for Dr. Holmgren uh, for uh, Dr. Holmgren Award for lifetime achievement again in the area of advanced bioeconomy. So Praj has got many verticals, but bioenergy has been the uh, prominent vertical of Praj, wherein we, we, providing, we are providing solutions, technology solutions for first generation, second generation ethanol. Uh, we are also providing solutions related to uh, compressed biogas, biodiesel, etc. And recently we have started providing solutions related to sustainable aviation fuel. But apart from that, we have, uh, uh, we have a high purity solutions department wherein we provide the uh, uh, technology solutions for pharmaceutical industry. We have engineering business for uh, providing solutions to brewery as well as uh, to oil and gas industry. And we have a dedicated research and development center that has been established around 12 years ago. And that has been backbone of Praja's technology development uh, for second generation ethanol, for renewable chemical and materials and bioproducts. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, Praja has uh, more than 1000 references in more than 100 countries of the world. And these are some of our esteemed customers. You can see all the multinational companies, global MNCs in this list. And uh, we provide end-to-end uh, -end solutions. That is, uh, we have expertise across value chain, right from research and development, technology and engineering, process equipment, uh, commissioning and construction of the plant, project management, and life cycle management. So we have more than uh, 1,000 people on our role and many on, uh, uh, on the contract uh, to provide all these end-to-end services for our uh, customers. And uh, as I talked about research and development center, that has been backbone of Praj's technologies for last 12 years. Uh, so uh, we have five divisions in uh, our research and development center. Uh, these are the analytical sciences, scale up and process engineering, bioprocess technology, molecular and microbiology, and chemical sciences. And uh, our research and development center has been instrumental in uh, developing the technology for second generation ethanol as well as uh, developing technologies for various renewable chemical and materials and bioproducts. So I will now talk about biomobility platform. <clears throat> as we all know that recently uh, the COP26 was concluded in uh, Glasgow, England, and uh, our honorable prime minister Modi have made a very ambitious uh, commitment uh, at, at this global forum, wherein he talked about uh, uh, fulfilling 50% of energy requirement uh, through renewable energy, uh, cutting down the emissions by 1 billion tons in next 10 years, bringing down the carbon intensity of economy by 45% uh, in next 10 years, and most importantly, achieving the target of net zero uh, by 2070. And not only India, but uh, more than 100 countries have also pledged uh, 
uh, for net zero targets and the whole world is moving towards uh, sustainability and uh, net zero goal in order to achieve uh, achieve the ambitious climate goal of uh, uh, limiting uh, global warming to 1.5 degrees celsius and uh, for this reason uh, biofuels and circular bioeconomy is going to be a pillar of energy transition not only in, for india uh, but also for the entire world and that's why we see biomass is going to play a very important role in coming future now when we talk about the advanced bioeconomy how will that advanced bioeconomy will look so with uh, this cop26 there will be the boost to development of decarbonizing energy transition technologies and climate innovation uh, most importantly waste will not be a waste but it will be a valuable feedstock so there will be efforts uh, in capturing and monetizing waste and residues uh, there will be efforts in developing low carbon intensity product and services and uh, there will be a lot of uh, uh, there will be the carbon intensity aspects involved in all decisions in every business decisions there will be price of carbon factored in capital projects there will be development of carbon markets uh, there will be also better cost of capital and finance for the firms that are uh, on the path of decarbonization and uh, sustainability aspects are going to play a critical role uh, under esg uh, in coming future and all this uh, gels well uh, for the advanced bioeconomy and these will be the major drivers for advanced bioeconomy in the world so uh, when when we see the advanced bioeconomy we will see the greater contribution of bio based low carbon and sustainable fuels chemicals and materials in the global economy uh, as i said waste and residues are going to be a preferred feedstock for bio based products then we will see uh, the application of biofuels in new areas such as aviation and marine industry we are already seeing a lot of commercialization efforts a lot of policy drivers uh, are being placed for uh, commercialization of uh, sustainable aviation fuel uh, new technologies and products will get rapidly matured uh, so uh, technologies related to saf marine biofuels green hydrogen and uh, apart from that ccu is also going to uh, going to play a crucial role in uh, for ci reduction and uh, we will see ccu uh, also a part of future bio refineries so this is going to be the integral part of future bio refineries uh, we will also see the increased use of renewable power at production plants uh, because solar and wind power is going to uh, be available in abundant uh, supply and circularity in process design that is reduce recycle reuse and recycle uh, that will be the uh, default aspect in any process design in any aspect of uh, design and uh, apart from that uh, we will also see the application of data science and new technologies for sustainability so uh, we are seeing the application of blockchain technology for uh, tracking down the uh, feedstock and uh, and uh, proving the sustainability of the feedstock so as i said like sustainability and ci reduction aspects uh, are going to play a critical role in advanced bioeconomy and all the major decisions that we take in our everyday life uh, mr nishan uh, I, i see that you still have another 15 16 slides so uh, yeah uh, i'll just uh, cover i fix minute so you need to yeah uh, so <clears throat> yeah under under bio mobility platform we are providing technology solutions for uh, first generation second generation ethanol uh, biodiesel uh, biomethanol uh, and uh, uh, we are utilizing the agricultural residue and organic waste to produce low carbon transportation fuel across all modes of mobility so uh, under the bio mobility bio mobility platform we have uh, first generation and second generation ethanol cbg and biodiesel commercialized already commercialized Uh, in the market and uh, uh, we are in process of commercializing green hydrogen sustainable aviation fuel and marine biofuels in uh, uh, in near future one of the uh, advantage that uh, india has is about the abundance of the sustainable feedstock so as uh, we we have seen in our earlier presentation india still produce approximately 5 to 6 million tons of excess sugars Uh, india also has around 23 to 25 million metric tons of uh, surplus uh, starchy feedstock in terms of rotten or spoiled grain uh, that is unfit for human consumption and uh, also there is a significant uh, quantity of surplus uh, agricultural residues like uh, rice straw wheat straw bagasse etc and uh, this feedstock is going to drive the production of various biofuels 
such as uh, first generation and second generation ethanol cbg and most importantly sustainable aviation fuel in near future and we are going to see a uh, lot of important uh, advantages because of uh, this uh, uh, energy transition uh, ghg emission reduction will be in tune of 16 million metric ton uh, more than million people will get employment more than uh, 30 million farmers will get uh, progressive benefits and uh, there will be a cumulative forex savings in tune of around 27 billion dollars in next five years now talking about the second generation ethanol technology uh, we have named this technology as infinity uh, because it brings infinite possibilities to the environment and energy challenges confronting manca mankind. Uh, so we are using the uh, nature's endless resources that is agricultural biomass, agricultural residues for, uh, for this uh, technology as a feedstock. And when we see the technology development journey, we started, uh, est we established a pilot scale plant to process one ton per day of uh, biomass back in 2009. Uh, we scaled it up uh, to 12 tons per day industrial demo scale plant uh, in near Pune in 2016-18. We carried out extensive process integration and optimization. Uh, and uh, the result is that uh, we are now setting up three commercial scale facilities for uh, three different oil companies, that is Indian Oil, Bharat Petroleum, and uh, Hindustan Petroleum, for production of uh, around 100,000 liters per day of uh, cellulosic ethanol produced from rice straw. So the infinity technology, second generation technology has got some unique uh, advantages such as it can handle complex feedstock. It has uh, uh, it has best in class yields and low processing cost. And uh, most importantly, we are not uh, seeing any solids handling issues in this uh, technology. Uh, one of the important factor is that we have mapped uh, more than 600 samples in our dedicated research and development center in Pune uh, to understand about the complexity and variety of various agricultural residues. So more than 600 samples have been fingerprinted till now at our uh, laboratory in Pune. And recently we have collaborated with a Swedish company called SICAP uh, for, <clears throat> for integrating Infinity technology with uh, SICAP's, uh, uh, SICAP's uh, second generation ethanol technology based on soft wood, which is called Cellu app. So together we have come up with a new technology called Cellunity that will handle the, uh, the soft wood for conversion into ethanol. And this is a picture of our second generation smart biorefinery that, uh, that is uh, near Pune. Uh, it can handle variety of feedstock. It, it has the capacity to uh, process 12 tons per day of uh, agricultural biomass. And it is fully integrated with energy, water, and has the effluent treatment as biomethanation. Now, I'll just briefly talk about sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, we have a collaboration with uh, GEO Incorporation. Dr. Patrick Gruber, uh, who is the CEO of uh, GEO, will be talking in the next session, and he will talk more about uh, his company, GEO. But here I will talk uh, briefly about our collaboration with GEO, wherein we are uh, commercializing the alcohol to jet technology based on biobutanol or isobutanol as an intermediate product. So this technology can handle first generation sugars such as molasses or syrup, as well as second generation of sugars such as agricultural residues for conversion into biobutanol or IBA. So Praj has adopted GEO's technology for uh, feedstock uh, in India, such as uh, sugarcane molasses, sugarcane syrup, as well as uh, second generation feedstock uh, and has uh, uh, optimized the technology further. The next step of the technology is the conversion of isobutanol into hydrocarbons such as uh, sustainable aviation fuel and isooctane as a co-product. Isooctane is a premium premium gasoline that is uh, typically used in luxury cars as well as in the racing cars. It's a 100 of octane uh, premium gasoline. So uh, as, as I've shown here, Praj has carried out extensive technology adaptation and optimization of GWOT's technology for Indian feedstock and uh, together with GEO, Praj, uh, Praj and GEO are offering uh, technology equipment and services for, uh, for our uh, potential customers to convert first generation and second generation feedstock into sustainable aviation fuel through alcohol to jet pathway. Can you please conclude in one or two minutes? So can get yeah, on. sure. And recently I will also uh, mention about uh, an MOU with Indian Oil. Uh, 
uh, as you know this uh, was in public news uh, around october so uh, praj industries and indian oil have joined hands in commercializing various biofuels uh, so starting with uh, sustainable aviation fuel and uh, we are in process of uh, establishing facilities related to sustainable aviation fuel based on alcohol to jet technology so uh, that's all from my side i believe that climate in innovation would require need of sustainable need of disruptive business models value chains and technologies for achieving net zero emissions and advanced bioeconomy is going to play an important role in that i would like to thank you all thank you thank you uh, uh, i think you know without uh, losing uh, much of the time you know let's move over to the next speaker uh, dr thomas uh, wilner uh, he is a professor for uh, chemical engineering at hamburg university of applied sciences uh, and he is the head of the process engineering there uh, he is a, a doctorate in uh, thermochemical liquefaction of wood from uh, hamburg university uh, he has uh, been a development engineer earlier with uh, tyson group currently he has been with uh, the hamburg university um, you know and he teaches thermal processing engineering thermodynamics alternate fuels etc and uh, continues his research in uh, waste to alternate uh, fuels climate protection in uh, in transport and heating sector so he has been chairman of a uh, couple of uh, uh, different working groups and he has also been a consultant to german government uh, on uh, mobility and uh, fuel strategy so over to you dr vinay Mr. Ramakrishna, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, and see me. <laughs> thank you so much for your kind introduction, and I would like to thank also Dr. Randy Gark for uh, inviting inviting me for his uh, presentation, and I say welcome to all the participants uh, around the world. <clears throat> and now I share. This so can you see the first slide yes wonderful yes there are uh, two main pathways uh, for the transition of the transport sector number one is the electric mobility and number two is the, the alternative fuels also beyond biofuels and um, to be honest in germany and europe we have a uh, ideologically driven discussion about what is the best solution and i want to help to come back to a fact based discussion and what we are what are we talking about um doing all this uh, these efforts uh, is we want to uh, do climate protection <clears throat> and as a matter of fact um the climate change is a phenomenon of natural physics so that means we have to consider physical laws and what uh, many politicians don't want to recognize is that physical laws are not politically negotiable <clears throat> so uh, and who is telling us the physics and the mathematics from uh, derived from this it's the ipcc the inter governmental panel on climate change they um, give us the figures the data what you are talking about and they say um regarding the 1.5 degree target and um the politicians are still committed clearly committed to the 1.5 degree target so let's talk about that they say we have a, a global co2 emission budget and that is uh, getting less and less and less and at the beginning of uh, this year it uh, was 260 gigatons of co2 according to the ipcc uh, special report <clears throat> in october uh, 2018 and what is the uh, current global level of annual co2 emission that's 40 gigatons so every year we have 40 gigaton less budget <clears throat> that means the time 
the time left for climate protection is very, very short. You see two lines here in this diagram. You see uh, no action scenario, the red one, that's the status quo. If we keep it, then we have just 6.5 years left. <clears throat> that's nearly nothing. If we start globally with um, CO2 reduction, all around the world, then uh, and we might follow the more or less the green line, I called it correct action scenario, then we'd gain more time, we would double the time, but uh, 30 years is also not that much. <clears throat> Politicians talk about target years 2050 and so on, that's not anymore uh, in this range. <clears throat> and if we wait one more year, we uh, lose time for the correct action scenario. <clears throat> what can we derive from this um, facts? We can derive three criteria for all climate protection measures. It means all climate protection measures has to meet, have to meet these criteria, three criteria, no delay. We have to start immediately with CO2 reduction. <clears throat> and the second one is no greenhouse gas export. That means we have to look at the whole value chain upstream and downstream. It doesn't make sense uh, to implement a measure in one country, which causes um, um, higher greenhouse gas emissions in other countries or sectors. <clears throat> and the third one is also very important. Um, it's a global task, it's a fast rollout is needed of successful approaches. And I can say uh, climate protection can succeed globally in international cooperation or it will not succeed. <clears throat> what does it uh, mean now? Um, let's analyze these two main pathways, electric mobility and alternative fuels. <clears throat> Let's start with the electric mobility. If we look at these three criteria, we come to the conclusion that uh, the battery, battery electric vehicles do not meet any of the three climate protection criteria because of a long delay caused by the battery backpack. That means more CO2 rather than less CO2 building the cars. And the next one is we have a high greenhouse gas export involved because of uh, more CO2 in countries where the batteries are produced. At the, um, and we have, secondly, more CO2 from power production. <clears throat> and here I must um, emphasize, please note that uh, the calculation of the power mix is wrong. All the studies um, in favor of uh, battery electric vehicles um, calculate with the power mix, but that is wrong. We have to uh, calculate with the fossil marginal power. And there is uh, a lot of literature um, on that. And you can have this uh, presentation and at the end of the presentation, all the literature and all uh, the references are given. And it's um, easy to understand. Um, if you look at um, an electric grid um, as it is, then um, all the renewable power is already in the grid because um, we have the focus, the priority on uh, renewable uh, power. But if you have an additional demand of more power, then you have to activate the fossil marginal power. That means additional uh, demand ac activates the fossil part of uh, the power production. So, uh, therefore, we have to save power and not to increase the demand of the power. <clears throat> and the uh, third one, fast rollout, does not make sense uh, due to the failure in the first two criteria of the um, electric mobility. That means. What is the result in view of climate protection? Um, electric, mobility, electric mobility is definitely no suitable climate protection measure that we have to clarify. 
I'm not against, to be uh, uh, honest, I'm not against um, electric mobility in general, but here we are talking about climate protection. Yeah? Uh, uh, electric mobility can be uh, fine uh, in, in uh, um, major cities and big cities and so on and so on, but it's even then no climate protection matter. That is the point here. Um, the next is I want to give two more examples um, um, about more problems. Um, an exaggerated ramp up of electric mobility maximizes the raw material dependence on China. I, would, I will show on the next slide. And the next one is it would maximize the risk of blackouts um, because of the extremely high power peaks involved. Um, the um, government of the uh, UK has already passed a law that uh, it's forbidden to, uh, to have a private charging of electric vehicles in uh, some morning hours and some evening hours starting from uh, next month. So uh, the focus, the exaggerated focus on electric mobility would be a major strategic mistake. Here, uh, the slide. Um, in view of the raw material situation, you, um, it's uh, based on an international energy agency uh, study, and it shows clearly the dominance of uh, China in all critical raw materials for electric scenarios. The copper, lithium, nickel, cobalt, and rare, rare earth elements are all dominated by China. So uh, prices will increase dramatically uh, if we focus on electric uh, mobility only. What about uh, alternative fuels, um, also beyond uh, biofuels, but including biofuels, of course. <clears throat> uh, the scientific analysis shows clearly they can meet all three criteria for the effective climate protection. So as a result of this analysis, uh, the refuels or alternative fuels must be a matter of priority and Again, there's um, a lot of literature in, on that. <clears throat> but what are we talking about alternative fuels? In many discussions, uh, just one of uh, these uh, five groups are mentioned. We are uh, talking at least about five families or groups of alternative fuels. The first is uh, very well known, the first generation biofuels already in the market the biodiesel and bioethanol, including biomethane, and they are all from agricultural crops. <clears throat> and they are doing um, a very good job right now uh, in uh, effective CO2 reduction, <clears throat> more than 80% uh, CO2 reduction in, in, in Europe. And this next one is, we have heard a lot of about that uh, second generation biofuels, including hydrogen and biomethane, <clears throat> and the liquids and the gases. And they are from waste and residues uh, from an, uh, a lot of sources, uh, such as agriculture, forestry, wood processing and food industry and, and, else, and so on. The third one, don't forget, is um, the non-biogenic waste fuels, uh, so-called recycled carbon fuels. Um, for instance, uh, from plastic waste. And the fourth one is the e-fuels, uh, the pure renewable electricity-based fuels, so e-fuels or power to X fuels. And again, uh, including the gases, uh, liquids and gases, um, gases um, including ammonia. <clears throat> and here um, it's uh, the chance to activate uh, production in countries with a surplus of renewable energy. But please don't forget the fifth high efficient uh, hybrids, uh, high combinations that uh, is the waste-based and biomass-based e-fuels. And I want to show you a few examples. Let's start with uh, the group number two, because the first generation is very well known. Um, what's uh, the typical path pathways for second generation. Um, we have heard uh, we have the uh, very well, uh, um, very uh, good pathway of uh, second generation bioethanol. Um, that's already uh, in the presentations before um, talking about. But here I want to show the 
other alternative um, with uh, pure hydrocarbon fuels or methanol at the end. And here we have the gasification, the syngas pathway. And here you see uh, a few uh, chemical formulas <clears throat> starting from biomass, um, adjusting the carbon monoxide, CO and hydrogen ratio by the shift reaction and coming in the third step to fischer tropsch or methanol synthesis um, by catalytic uh, processes. <clears throat> so at the end, we have uh, uh, nice uh, fuels and we can start from any kind of uh, the biomass. And here uh, in Europe, we have some uh, big projects about that. <clears throat> we have um, the Biolic pilot plant um, at uh, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany that is, um, has been engineered by Air Liquide. Uh, we have global players involved. And a second one is a demo plant, BioT fuel project, uh, where uh, Tristan Krupp um, is uh, doing the gasification. <clears throat> and here we have the torrefaction uh, first step in the biolic uh, process on the left side. So we have pyrolysis first and then gasification and uh, synthesis. And on the right side, bio fuels, we have torrefaction first um, to um, um, make uh, the uh, biomass uh, more uh, uh, brittle and similar to coal. Then we can go into the gasifier and then we do the synthesis. <clears throat> and all uh, projects have proven uh, the long-term operation. <clears throat> and let's uh, have a view on group number three, uh, the plastic waste. Um, conversion. Here we have the OMV. It's uh, the mineral oil company in Austria, and there is a re oil uh, project, the re oil pilot plant already uh, in operation. And they are uh, planning uh, expansion in demo scale and production scale up to 200,000 tons per year at the end. <clears throat> What's about uh, the e-fuels uh, group number four? <clears throat> Here we have also big projects started in the world. Uh, just two examples here, but there are many more in the world. Um, on the left side, the Haruoni project in Chile from uh, Siemens Energy and Porsche. Here we combine hydrogen and CO2 from the air um, to come to um, to your hydrocarbon liquid fuels uh, via methanol. <laughs> but at the end, we have the gasoline for the cars. And uh, they start with 100 ton per year. Then they want to expand to uh, 40,000 and 400,000 tons per year uh, in 2026. That's uh, the plan. And on the right side, um, where Tusen Trupp and many others are involved, uh, Tristan Krupp is doing the electrolysis for hydrogen production. It's a NEOM uh, project, solar project in Saudi Arabia, also a very big one. In this case, uh, ammonia is um, the focused uh, product. That means hydrogen from the electrolysis and nitrogen from the air. <clears throat> Let's have a look at the uh, okay. last um, group. Can you yeah. uh, conclude in the next two to three yeah, minutes? I'm, nearly to uh, at the end, <clears throat> that's uh, the, the last group, uh, number five. Here we have uh, the waste-based um, e-fuels with very high efficiency and low cost. Here uh, we have a project in Germany in, uh, at our university in, uh, in cooperation with the next oil company, a young technology company you can meet in the internet. And what uh, are we doing? Um, we have a two-step approach. Um, the first one is uh, reactive distillation, cracking and deoxygenation step, the ready process. The ready is uh, from reactive distillation. We produce um, a bio oil, a clean distillate, and we need just a little bit of hydrogen. And that is uh, an e fuel part. In this uh, case, a very low demand of hydrogen. 
at the hydrotreating step for drop-in fuel production. And we're just uh, building uh, the pilot plant is under construction for 100 tons per year um, at our university site. And um, next year, uh, the demo plant for 1,000 ton per year module is uh, planned at the customer site. And what I want to emphasize is um, it's always said that electromobility um, is so um, highly efficient and um, e-fuels need much more electric power. That is not true. In this case, it's the other way around. We uh, just, oh, um, it's a missing um, a number. I uh, want to uh, will add this and it's only five kilowatt hours missing uh, this number. I will correct this. It's only five kilowatt hours per hundred kilometers uh, uh, driving uh, in this process all over the two uh, steps. And that is by factor three to five less than for battery electric vehicles. So uh, the, the five is missing here. Um, so I come to the conclusions. I'm at the end. And what we have seen is um, the alternative fuels, including beyond biofuels, can meet all three criteria for climate protection. And we're talking about all five process groups. And they are equally important, all of them. And um, we have a very high potential um, taking all five groups together. And there's uh, more than enough available in the world. Uh, the waste-based e-fuels uh, can ramp up immediately and they have low power demand, low cost. And that's the next point. Um, it's all, uh, it's, in many discussions, it's said uh, that uh, alternative fuels are very expensive. That's not true. The production costs are now uh, nowadays um, commercially uh, low, <clears throat> lower than uh, commonly expected. And the last point, we need all effective options and electromobility is according to scientific analysis, uh, definitely no effective option for climate protection. And I close with uh, this small joke and thank you for your attention. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, I, I, I think, you know, we have already uh, run out of our time by almost uh, 14, 15 minutes. Uh, however, uh, if the uh, organizers uh, permit us, uh, there could be one or two question or quick interaction between the uh, panelists. Uh, can we have uh, Rahman, Maniatis, uh, and others uh, there? Ah, Ms. Nisal is there. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, uh, it's been a wonderful uh, presentation from uh, uh, each one of you. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, you, you, each of the presentation deserves uh, probably a lot more than uh, the time that has been uh, allotted because there is so much of learning uh, you know, that one can go through. But however, uh, uh, you know, the, this kind of um, you know, conferences, uh, we do have limited time and within the limited time, we have to make uh, our views uh, presented uh, effectively. Um, but Aishwarya, if we have uh, uh, some two, three minutes, uh, we would like to see if uh, the panelists have any questions or any last comment to uh, make. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Okay, so it's now open. So uh, there can be any kind of quack cross question between the panelists or otherwise, uh, you know, uh, if you have one quick comment to make, it's open. You're on mute, you're on mute. You had to unmute. Yeah, sir, uh, Faisal, this side. Please, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. So I'll just say that it's a wonderful session, uh, nice learning. And I think the journey which we have embarked, we need to carry on on this path. And we need to see that how much we can diversify in terms of product portfolio so that uh, we can actually achieve the sustainable development. That's what I would like to uh, comment, sir. Thank you. Yes, I mean, uh, what I would like to say is that uh, from my side, I see there is enormous progress being done. On the other hand, I see a lot of criticism come from biomass and biofuels and bioenergy in general. At the same time, although the fossil fuels are being criticized, there is nothing being done to really 
in a way, reduce their usage, unless, of course, we try to promote renewables. So we need to change the balance. There has to be more actions to limit the fossil fuels rather than try to promote, I would say, uh, renewables and biofuels. So we need a change of mind and legislation. That's the most important thing. Yeah, I agree with you 200% on that. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Wilder, do you have anything or Ms. Nisal? Yeah, I, I would like to just comment that uh, India is uh, very well placed uh, to embark on the path of advanced uh, biomobility or advanced bioeconomy because of the rapidly maturing technologies as well as abundant feedstock availability. And uh, that's why like the climate innovation is going to play a critical role in near future. That's my comment. Oh, Thank, okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Wilner? Yes, uh, um, what we've seen is we have the technology, but um, the investors need incentives and they have to come from reliable um, politics and reliable uh, regulations. Um, there uh, we have some, um, uh, we, we miss this uh, reliable uh, politics, um, especially in, in Europe. Uh, but we need it all over the world. We need the international cooperation. Otherwise, we will not succeed in uh, climate protection. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. I think, you know, uh, a lot of things have been covered. We have looked at uh, various uh, resources, the status of the conversion uh, pathways that we have, and uh, the kind of uh, gaps that may be there in policy or also looking at uh, the kind of uh, continued uh, support from the governments on the policy as well as financing of this sector. Uh, I think uh, wonderful points have been uh, presented and uh, it's been a very good uh, session. Let me take this opportunity to throw, thank all the uh, panelists uh, and uh, I will hand it over to Aishwarya uh, for uh, the concluding remarks. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it was indeed a very, very uh, thought-provoking session on uh, advanced biofuels and beyond. And I'd like to thank all the speakers, uh, uh, Dr. Miniatis, uh, Doc, uh, Mr. Fezur Rahman, uh, Mr. Anmol Nisal, uh, Professor Ding, and Mr. Ravi Gupta for a very thought-provoking uh, session. And I'd especially like to thank Mr. Ra Ramakrishna YB for chairing the session so beautifully and thanking all of you gentlemen for taking uh, your time out and giving us such an, uh, an exhilarating and thought-provoking uh, session on this very important uh, topic related to biofuels. I'd like to thank all of you and uh, with that uh, we wrap up this plenary session and we'd head for a very short break and uh, we have more plenary sessions coming up uh, in the post-lunch session. we would start with um, a session on advances in sustainable aviation fuel uh, in Hall B that will be at uh, starting at two o'clock. So thank you so much for having joined us uh, in this uh, session. It was wonderful having all of you uh, in the program today. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.
Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. How are you? How are you, sir? So we, uh, this is the plenary session that we're going to start in uh, another one minute. Uh, Mr. Das, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Mr. Das, uh, we are just to, we're just going to start in about a minute from now. I'm uh, making just sure that all the participants are here. So the key speakers for the session is uh, Mr. Mike, we have Mr. Dr. Patrick, um, Mr. Harshit Agarwal, we have Ms. Ekta Agarwal. All right. Uh, I guess we have all the speakers here. So with your permission, Dr. Da uh, Mr. Das, uh, can I start the session? Yep. Let's start the session. All right, so good afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to the plenary session. Uh, and this session is going to focus on advances in sustainable aviation fuel. And I'm very delighted uh, to have with us, uh, let me introduce the chair for this session first. We have uh, Mr. S.K. Das, Senior Vice President, Engineering and Maintenance, Vistara Tata Sia Airlines Limited. A very warm welcome to Mr. Das. Thank you so much. Uh, we are really delighted to have you in this session. Let me also introduce the key speakers for this session. We have Mr. Mike McCurdy, Managing Director, Energy Advisory, ICF International Inc. USA. Very warm welcome, Mr. Mike. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Patrick Gruber, CEO, Jevo Inc. USA. A very warm welcome to Dr. Patrick. We have uh, Mr. Harshit Agarwal, Deputy Country Sales Manager, Process Licensing, Accent Solutions, and we also have uh, Ms. Ekta Agarwal, Assistant Director, Aircraft Engineering Directorate, General of Avi Civil Aviation, Ministry of Civil Aviation, Government of India. Very warm welcome to you as well. And I'm very delighted to also have uh, Colonel Rohit Dev, retired Chief Operating Officer, uh, PRESPL. Very warm welcome to all of you. And... Uh, Without wasting any more time, I'd request uh, Mr. S. K. Das to please uh, begin the session. And, uh, uh, Mr. Das, uh, it, it is your prerogative. You want to take uh, the presentations first and then uh, at the end go with the question and answer session. Or would you want uh, a speaker to finish and then uh, move with the question and answer session? Uh, it's totally your prerogative. I'd request you to, uh, to please begin the session, handing over the virtual mic to you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Ashira. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the summit. And this is actually exciting, very exciting, rather, to lead such a wonderful team of foundation from all over the world. And I'm feeling privileged to so, see so many speakers and the leaders of the bioavision and sustainable fuel at one uh, platform. This is really quite interesting. So I will go for the speakers first, then perhaps we'll go for the question and sessions. But I would like all the speakers to focus on three key elements of the sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, basically, what we are talking about, how to sustain the aviation, and what are the emissions reductions we, goals we are talking in the aviation, and perhaps on the biofuel in aviation, the roadmap and the future. And I would expect everybody to touch on these basic points, because we know that uh, this session has been going on, and we have been talking about the carbon emissions, net zero, and... Uh, uh, Kosia and all those factors in the various forums and talking, but I would expect the speakers to touch up the, some of the points, which will give more insight of what actually being done to have the sustainable aviation fuel as a complete roadmap and the ecosystem. So I leave it to the speakers whether they want to talk about this or they would like the presentations so that we can see on the presentation and perhaps we can have a question and QA session later on. Thank you. And I would like to call Mr. Mike McCarty to start the presentation or the talk about the sustainable aviation fuel and I hand over the mic to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dash. And uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Garg and the rest of the, the team at World Future Fuel Summit. Um, so, 
my presentation here today, um, focused on sustainable aviation fuel and really the emerging feedstock opportunities for the, uh, for the fuel. So globally, uh, SAF production is, is very much taking off in the near term. Uh, we've, we've begun to hit the hockey stick uh, phase of SAF evolution, and, and we have quite a number of facilities coming online in the near term to produce SAF and deliver it to the, uh, the market. Um, many of these SAF facilities are focused, uh, at least initially, on the, the state of California within the United States. Um, the SAF really has a, a stack of values um, beyond the, the value of the physical fuel. So in, in California, at least, they, they get a, a $1 production or blenders tax credit. Uh, they get paid for the physical fuel. Um, on, on top of those two items, they, uh, they get additional value from the US renewable fuel standard and the California low carbon fuel standard. So when we start taking a look at uh, a gallon of, of SAF in the United States, uh, they're, they're receiving about seven and a half to eight dollars per gallon of fuel. And that gallon of fuel generally costs five dollars to five and a half dollars to produce using uh, low carbon oils like renewable or not, uh, use cooking oil, distillers, corn oil, fats and tallows and other, other uh, renewable oil sources here in the United States. And so we're seeing a very rapid expansion, um, just the announced facilities between uh, renewable diesel, which most of these facilities produce both renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel at the same time. Uh, we're really looking at, at having enough capacity come in to, to eclipse the on-road market and actually maybe even saturate the, uh, the SAF market in California. So while it's, it's a great, the, we're getting all this uh, fuel into California and the United States, the, the problem becomes we start looking at the available feedstock supply of these renewable oils. So here in the, the United States, and, and once again, I apologize, we're done, this is all in pounds, but um, uh, when we look at the various renewable oil sources of, available in the United States, there's somewhere about, um, uh, 3.3 billion gallons, or about 12.5 billion, gallon, billion liters of feedstock available for this uh, renewable diesel and SAF. So, so these feedstock constraints are really creating an opening for uh, ethanol and, and biogas SAF. So uh, our clients are, are in we work with a, a number of airlines around the world, um, really starting to take a look at the other methods to produce SAF and, and the feedstocks that might be available in the near term. And so looking through the, the various um, ASTM pathways to produce SAF, uh, the two that we see the most interest in, in the near term here is alcohol to jet. Um, now that's the uh, pathway A5 under the um, ASTM standards. And then also we see uh, developers and airlines looking at biogas as a, as a near-term feedstock option. Um, so both of these options, um, most of these SAF pr uh, production facilities really have four steps. They have a, kind of a feedstock deconstruction step where they take the, the biomass and get it into uh, intermediate carbon, different uh, different pathways use different uh, carbons. Um, alcohol to jet usually uses either ethanol, a, a two carbon chain molecule, or ice, uh, butanol, a four carbon chain molecule, or um, uh, others use uh, carbon monoxide in just a single carbon molecule. So, and then these facilities, they they break down the feedstock into the same immediate carbon. They go into, um, they assemble these carbons into a renewable diesel. And then they um, isomerize that uh, renewable diesel to make SAD. So why alcohol to jet and biogas is so exciting for, for many of these developers is that you, 
essentially you're, you're only building the back half of the plant. So you can leverage existing ethanol assets, you can leverage existing uh, biogas assets um, to deliver this SAF. So India in particular is, is attractive for alcohol to jet because the, the 2018 national biofuel policy is really driving significant ethanol production in the country. Um, as you can see here on the chart, um, India has dramatically increased the number of its ethanol distilleries um, due to the national ethanol blending rules, as well as the, uh, the name, nameplate capacity of those facilities. So most of the technologies require or produce about 0.5 to 0.6 liters of SAF per, per liter of um, ethanol consumed, uh, pardon the typo there. So with a nameplate capacity of about 4.2 billion liters, uh, you're talking about delivering somewhere around 2 billion liters of uh, SAF if you ended up moving all your ethanol capacity over into that uh, SAF market. And then similarly, uh, we are seeing a lot of, um, our sit India does have a lot of biogas production. Um, much of it is still being stood up under the SADAP program. But uh, if the program really does reach its 15 million metric tons of uh, biogas per year, um, that would uh, yield about 6 billion liters of SAF for India. So um, the, most of the fischer troped processes that convert um, carbon monoxide into SAF produce about 400 liters per metric ton of fischer trope or metric ton of uh, biomass fed. So another very exciting opportunity for India um, using this pathway. And another very interesting uh, concept for all of our producers, or in particular our investors in these uh, SAF production facilities, is that there's a lot of concern that the, the on-road fleets will move to electricity or hydrogen. Um, and we do expect that to happen over time. We're seeing a lot of electrification of the um, medium duty uh, kind of transit buses in, in that uh, sector. A lot of that uh, de current demand is moving to electricity. So we see the renewable diesel uh, kind of moving next into long, uh, long distance trucking. Uh, and in the long distance trucking sector, we're starting to see a lot of hydrogen uh, start showing up, uh, hydrogen trucks, hydrogen fueling stations start showing up in that sector. Um, and so we expect the re renewable diesel to start getting pushed over into the SAF market. But the, the nice thing about the SAF market is that uh, even by 2050, the aviation fuel is expected to be 78% SAF. So uh, when you're investing in these facilities, um, you, even if the entire road fleet electrifies, it goes to hydrogen, you you're still have a demand for your product as, as late as 2050 and, and beyond. The other real benefit for India uh, with regard to SAF is the, the jobs and the development opportunities that uh, SAF presents for uh, India. Um, India does have a significant um, bioenergy industry at, at this time. You've got about 85,000 jobs in biogas, 35,000 in, in ethanol production. Uh, those are both expected to increase significantly here in the near term as the setup program and um, national and ethanol programs expand. But uh, it's also very important to look at the, the number of jobs that are getting created with these investments. Um, now, IRENA, which is the International Renewable Energy um, Association and, and the Air Transport Action Group, uh, you know, started taking a look at the, the jobs created uh, per dollar invested. And, and these are global figures but uh, globally from uh, 20, 
10 to 2019. Um, 23 jobs were created for every million dollars invested in bioenergy. And that compares to 2.7 jobs invested for every million in solar, 1.1 jobs invested in wind. So when you really take a look at renewable energies, you're really getting a, a great opportunity, return on investment, uh, domestic, uh, domestic production. So you, you're not um, importing as much fuel as well as rural development. So in conclusion, really the first item is that feedstock limitations are gonna cap the liters that can be produced from uh, renewable oils. And because of that, airlines and, and industry are really looking to ethanol and biogas to close that gap in, in supply in the near term. And so uh, additionally, those that are investing in these projects uh, to produce SAF, um, we're expecting that uh, capacity to move to SAF as the passenger fleets electrify and heavy duty moves to hydrogen. So you've, you've got uh, long-term demand for offtake on these facilities. And finally, India has uh, significant jobs potential for if it moves into SAF production here in the near term. And I'm um, excited that a num number of the additional speakers on the panel will be going into a lot more detail on some of these items, but uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Dash, and uh, I'll return it to you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for the nice presentation and quite detailed and giving the enriching experience about how India is trying to cope up on the various mass productions of the ethanol, by mass, by gas. And we have a couple of questions. Perhaps I will leave the QA session to the end so that everyone can participate in the discussion. So I would like to invite Dr. Patrick to come on board and give his presentations and speak about the sustainability of Hi there. Thanks for having me. Um, I will put up the screen right now. If it cooperates. Oh, get out. Well, I can't find the top here. There we go. Almost. All right. So we're a public company. And uh, so a lot of what I say here is all, you know, it's fair game stuff. You can use it anywhere. One of the places I like to start when I talk about SAF or any other renewable resource-based product is that you have to think a little bit differently about it because you have to consider where the raw materials come from and you have to consider exactly how it was made in order to sort through it to find out if it makes actually sense. We start with this principle that I learned at Cargill many, many years ago, decades ago. It's called, we want to make the world a better place for uh, by improving the standard of living for all living people. Now, my whole life has been involved with doing renewable resource-based products. Uh, displacing petroleum-based products. And so this is a real thing. And here's why is when there's a lot of issues in and around this space, whether it's, you know, you've got, of course, greenhouse gases, but, you know, these things, they touch each other, whether it's energy and pollutants and human health and sanitation, all these things, in fact, are interrelated. And this is a reality. So when you're starting to sort through what's sustainable and what isn't, you actually have to consider all these things. And that's what we do and how we think about things. So we are very much involved throughout the whole of the business systems. And we are, by the way, one of the only the few producers of uh, SAF in the world so far, which is amazing. This is a key point. There's not simple answers. You have to look at everything and measure it and pay attention to it and understand it as one's thinking about what works and what makes sense in the long hey, Patrick, run. So, sorry to interrupt you. Can you go to the present uh, presentation mode rather than the presenter mode? What we can see is the presenter mode. Oh, okay. you see the presenter mode? Okay, let me just try this again. Hold on. You can go to the presentation mode rather than the presenter mode. Okay, just a second here. Go presentation mode here. Oh, we can see the presentation. 
Now you can? No, or we not? cannot see the presentation. Hold on. Puneet? All right. You still only see the presentation here. Cannot see. And now? No. Really? earlier it was coming and the presenter mode perhaps you can go to that mode and change the display setting over there what you have done earlier okay Yeah. This you can see. Yeah. Yeah, you can continue on that, not an issue. All right. So one of the things, uh, and believe it or not, we were into a lot of folk who still don't understand that uh, you know, greenhouse gases come from burning of fossil fuels. It's quite astounding. But in this space of working in the when people are trying to do uh, these transportation fuels, they, they're confused. They think that you know, if you for instance, um, they have a, you have to take into account the whole of the life cycle from where you get the carbon source in the first place all the way through the whole life cycle all the way back. And people get really confused. And the challenge here is to try it, make these jet fuels, they have to be exact drop-ins. Um, Mike just went over and talked about the enormous market demand. I don't need to mention that. And of course, when we're talking about these jet fuels. They truly are drop-ins. They've already proven. They already work. We sell the stuff on a regular basis. It's flying all over the world already. And um, we can use a variety of feedstocks. It's, we're people who do carbohydrates to hydrocarbons. And I'll talk more about that. Now, here's a technical reality is that, you know, when you burn these uh, hydrocarbons, it, make, it releases an awful lot of energy and makes carbon dioxide and water. And you have to do the reverse of this in order to make a jet fuel. Nobody can avoid this. There isn't a single technology by anybody out there who doesn't do this. Everyone has to do this. There is no choice. So you have to do the inherent reverse of burning. That means at least that it has at least as much energy as the jet fuel would have released. You have to pack that into it. And then you have to do it in such, with a process that doesn't make a massive footprint on the sustainability front, real practical chemical engineering stuff here, real fundamental principle. So how do you do that? Well, you got to start with a renewable carbon source. And these are the ones that make the most sense. We're the carbohydrate people. So we look at all these different types of things, residual starch or sugar molasses. We work with Praj on um, the various sugar sources in India and uh, rice straw and things like that. They all can work, but gas and wood, all these things. Now, what matters is what's their sustainability footprint, what's their cost, and how available in any one location, because you can easily stimulate bad behaviors too. And of course, the vegetable oils and the gas. There's also e-capture as a possibility. But in any case, you have to do it on a fundamental basis. This is a chart that shows the amount of availability worldwide of carbohydrates compared to vegetable oils or rendered fats or biogenic waste compared to what the jet fuel demand is. There's lots of carbohydrates available. That's why there's interest in these carbohydrate routes. These kind of things never make a lower carbon fuel. No, because you know, you're using coal, natural gas, or even uh, plastics that are liquefied and turned into jet some way or gasified and turned into jet, that still releases fossil-based jet fuel. Our system looks like this. It is taking the carbohydrates using photosynthesis that saves a lot of energy. We use fermentation technology to convert the carbohydrates to uh, ethanol or isobutanol, and then do a chemical process to convert those things. And in fact, it looks more like this is photosynthesis captures the CO2 
Um, we work a lot with Praj on alternative feedstocks. We work with Axons on the hydrocarbon technology. I know that Axons will be talking a little bit here. They have a great technology that converts ethanol into hydrocarbons. And uh, we have uh, really good technology that converts isobutanol into hydrocarbons. Right now, this plant over here on the right is being built in India uh, by Praj. It's for us. It'll be about three, it's small. It's about 3,000 tons. And uh, Praj, of course, has done cellulosic residues to make sugars, rice straw, bagasse, sugar molasses, waste grains, and things like that. So I think between our partners here, between Praj and Accents, I think uh, anyone who wants to do anything in India, they'd be set up. Here is what the life cycle looks like for a product like ours, the life cycle footprint. This is taking into account in our case, we're using corn in the US as a feedstock. We separate the protein and oil from the carbohydrates. Uh, they use sustainable agricultural practices where we're building our plant. And so it's actually negative in terms of its carbon score. We use renewable electricity, we're building a wind farm. We build a wastewater treatment plant that does biogas to offset the natural gas. It is these two things that drive the footprint. It's the electricity and the gas that drive the footprint. We eliminate those, we can wipe out the footprint. And it becomes very interesting then because we're gonna to get to a net zero plant. And that's what we're working on. It'll be about 60 million uh, gallons of hydrocarbons up in Lake Preston, South Dakota online in 2025. There's also possibilities in the U.S. for sequestration, and that can drive it even further negative, which is very interesting when you think about a negative CI score. Now, remember, this is all the way from measuring CO2 at the farm into the ground, into the crop, into the plant, then, burn, then measuring it at, at the tailpipe of the jet. What's interesting is that you can impact this by other techniques. So, for instance, if they change growing techniques, in our area, they use low-till and no-till, I mean, special cultivation practices where they don't till the ground. And in that case, you can get to minus 70 CI score. Minus 70, cross the whole of the life cycle. That means soil carbon is being built up. And of course, we believe that in proving that uh, field by field level, we have programs to do that. And of course, we throw carbon capture on top of that sequestration, you can get to even more negative. Now, what's interesting then, is you can imagine if you're down in the minus 90 CI score, that you can blend almost, that's two, get one gallon of petro fuel could be blended with one gallon of SAF and you come up net zero. That's a pretty interesting. And so there by no means are we done with technologies on how to capture carbon, utilize it and leverage these things. It's quite an interesting game to play. We, of course, believe in counting carbon from the front to the back. We're setting up this business called Verity Tracking. Verity Tracking uses a blockchain technology to track the capture of carbon at a farm or wherever it is. If it's over in the forest, we're using wood feedstocks or whatever agricultural residues. And I'll track it all the way through exactly where it came from, what land, how it got there, what energy was used, what chemicals were applied, go into our plant and measure the um, you know, like where the electricity source came from, the gas source came from, et cetera, attach all that stuff in a blockchain and put it onto the product and uh, when it goes to market. So there'd be no question. We think this is the only way really to eliminate all the sustainability questions. Just measure everything and be done with it. We have the technology to do it, so we're gonna do it. Of course, it isn't just good enough for us to say it works well. We work with RSB, the certification agency, and ISCC. We've already done a prototype program for our Verity blockchain, uh, and it works. And I'd say the business is growing. We have about 100 million gallons under contract to take or pay contracts. we got a billion and a half gallons in negotiation, three billion in contracts in our hands uh, with Delta, Total, SAS, Tropical Comar as customers and uh, uh, MOUs with Chevron to grow big. And then we'd also do uh, business aviation. And so you'll see us involved in both ethanol into hydrocarbons and uh, isobutanol into hydrocarbons, alcohol to jet. We're gonna be all over it and try to grow. Our goal is to be about a billion gallons by uh, 2030. And uh, I think we have uh, uh, these technologies are not new. How do you make a really low CI? That's new. But the technologies themselves are not new. You can just put them together and go make them happen.
Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Patrick. Uh, that's a good insight of uh, calculating the life cycle from start to end. And as you rightly mentioned, the energy footprint of the energy you have to put back into the SF and calculating the carbon footprint from that point of view is really interesting. And that's everyone should be measuring to come out to the carbon net zero rather than increasing and going on the negative side. That's quite interesting. And perhaps you will again lead to the question uh, QA session to the end for the panel to ask if they have got any other points on that. Uh, with this, I would request Mr. Harshit Agrawal to come and give his presentation and take it forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Das. Uh, are you able to see me? Yeah. Uh, just allow me to just uh, share my screen and uh, hopefully it works. Let's see. Uh, let me know once my screen is visible to you. The screen is not visible. I think you have pinned me, looks like. Is it visible now? Not yet. Harshit on a green point at the bottom. Is, yeah. is it visible, visible now? Yeah. And I, I believe the slides are also switching, right? Yeah, yeah, it's switching. Okay, okay, good to know. So uh, welcome ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I mean, as my co-speaker mentioned that aviation fuel is an area under a lot of discussion today. And it is one of the realities that this SAF makes only a very small portion of the aviation fuel available today. Uh, well, uh, they still require significant investment. Uh, and if they have to reach the availability and let's say the price competitiveness necessary to fulfill aviation needs, the technology pathways uh, are maturing and SAF production facilities are being announced uh, with increasing frequency. So when we think about SAF, we have to approach it differently because feed is different, the scheme is different, the dynamics are different. Uh, although all the activities right now are quite focused in Europe and North America, they are the front runners. But uh, aviation efforts to be inclusive, SAF production must be available and affordable in all markets. And this is where I think India presents a good opportunity considering growth of Indian aviation industry and the forecast of India becoming top three market by 2025. So in view of that, and during this transition, Exens have uh, developed or, or acquired a range of pathways to provide required tools during this transition. So this PPD will be focused on the pathways, the technological side of the story. However, uh, when we look at these pathways, we'll also briefly look at what Exens does and uh, maybe a bit of history about these pathways or the rules. So if I start with Exens history, well, Exens is primarily a, a French company and we have been, uh, we started our business in the area of oil and gas and petrochemicals. This is our bread and butter. So. Uh, when I say that, it means uh, we have been providing units and licenses for oil and gas refineries around the world for the last 60, 70 years with the help of IFP. And IF, when I say IFP, it's French Institute of Petroleum. Uh, we are actually active in five markets, oil and gas and petrochemical. These are two of our bread and butter. Uh, gases, well, this uh, division uh, we got it after our acquisition a couple of years back and then lastly uh, alternative and renewables and water treatment solutions in terms of process licensing uh, these are the things that we are really looking at and we'll also discuss these two these uh, alternative and renewables today we, in terms of our experience on the left side of the slide you can see 
uh, I mean, we have been in this area of, uh, of licensing industrial units providing know-how for last several years. So we have more than 3000 uh, licenses around the world and we have been supplying 70,000 tons of catalyst each year to all these refineries. So it is just to give you a, an idea of uh, what is our background and uh, just to tell you that, you know, uh, uh, the strength of exence in these areas. Now, it is very well known that exence industry, uh, aviation industry is one of the growing consumer of fuels, which means uh, it is expected that the emissions will go up in the years to come. And hence, there is a need to de decarbonize it. And this is what I think uh, fellow speakers highlighted. Well, there are several approaches to it. So uh, with the growth rate assumption of 4%, it is projected that uh, the CO2 emission will be uh, very far away from the, from the target that we are aiming of net zero emissions. So in order to achieve that, uh, it was uh, highlighted in a lot of studies that certain amount of uh, improvement can be done with improving the efficiency, which is, let's say, the efficiency of the aircraft, the engines, all that. But if we have to reach the net zero emission target, then SAF is specified as one of the key measures in this direction in order to reduce these emissions. Now, SAF production can, because I said in the starting, I'll be focusing more on the technological solution that are there in the market. Uh, now, SAF production can be done by various pathways. These are the six pathways, uh, which has been some certified and are compliant with ASTM specifications. I think uh, this was something also shown previously in earlier slides. Uh, if I start from the top, well, FT, Fisher Trop, when I, when I say FT, it's Fisher Trop was the first process which was certified way back in 2009, which was later followed by the second process, which is hydroprocessing of lipids. Both are part of our portfolio, our bio portfolio. Later on, there were several, several more processes. Those were also certified, uh, out of which alcohol to jet, I mean, this is something that is quite gaining a lot of momentum uh, in recent time. The key thing here is we believe that no single pathway will be able to meet all these demands that we are projecting. So it will be, uh, the, it will be a basket of solution that will be able to meet these demands and achieve these uh, emission targets. And additionally, we ha always have to keep in mind that economics always be the technology side. So unless economics is there, nothing will make sense. Now, speaking of the impact of these processes on the emission part, so there are multiple factors to it. So when I say factors, the factors such as what kind of feedstock you are using, whether it's a waste, whether it's coming from the crop, like palm oil or whether you have to do deforestation to grow that crop. Second uh, factor is the technological choice that you make. I mean, technological choice out of the certified routes that I've shown you in the previous slide, because that uh, tells you what will be your net emissions, your consumption of the utilities and everything. The third factor is the integration, the integration in a unit which means how you are utilizing your resources last not the least is how you are i think this is something main uh, this is a main factor the how you are utilizing your byproducts because apart from your main product there are some byproducts associated with these kind of processes so how you utilize it that also is quite important so all these factors in mind uh, it can be very well said that all these the processes that we have in our portfolio, it uh, can eventually uh, help anyone to reduce emission between 60 to 90 percent. So that can be achievable based on the factors that I have mentioned earlier. So quickly jumping on to a very brief snapshot of the processes that we have in our hands. And I'm limiting my scope to the processes only producing SAF although we have other bioprocesses in our portfolio to produce chemicals and other stuff. 
So the first pathway is the hydro treatment of lipids, which you see at the top. This is very well known in the field of refineries, oil and gas. They have been doing it for ages. So here, what you do is you have a lipid feedstock, which could be used cooking oil, which is a waste. So your uh, emission target can be easily met. And then you hydro treat it and convert it into uh, HBO, hydro treated vegetable oil. The process name is vegan. The second that you see here is the FT route, Fisher Trop route. The process name is bio T fuel. And this is the Fisher Trop route by gasifying the biomass, producing a thin gas, and then producing SAF. The third step uh, that is there on your screen is uh, conversion of alcohol. Primarily, we are talking about ethanol. So converting ethanol into SAF, uh, this ethanol can come from 1G or 2G route. Now, which type of ethanol you actually use uh, will derive what will be your uh, eventually carbon footprint, what will be your carbon intensity, which is CI index. So this is, uh, I mean, a very quick overview. But one interesting thing that you may be seeing is uh, this green power. So we are working on this route as well. And this is where we talk about e-fuels, where you convert green hydrogen and CO2 uh, into SAF, power to liquid. So this is a very quick summary of the processes that we have in our hand. And if I go through them, each point, each of them very quickly, very briefly. Uh, well, the first one to start with is the vegan process. I mean, this is, uh, I'll start by saying that this is a very flexible process. When I say that flexible, it means it because we are talking about it can process all kind of lipid feedstock, all kind of vegetable oil, but then your carbon intensity will not be that good. I mean, it will be very high because you, you for that, you have to grow a crop. But then it can also produce second generation feedstock, which are like phased, uh, waste oils which are, let's say, used cooking oil or free fatty acid from the meat industry or any other waste fat. So what happens here is you take those oil and fats, you process it into two steps, uh, and then you produce SAF. Now, the advantage of this step is it is it produces a product. Uh, it actually produces a mix of products. SAF is one of them. But let's say if you are targeting green diesel, the same unit can be modified to produce green diesel just by changing the operating condition, as well as uh, you know uh, it 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 is it also produces some light components, naphtha, LPG, all those things. So all those kind of products can be targeted based on the requirement of the market. The another advantage is this is the minimum investment solution that is there in the market because uh, the existing hydro treatment or hydro processing plant that are there in oil and gas industry, which people are using for the last 60 years, can be revamped or retrofitted into these vegan units to produce SAF or green diesel. So this is something, it's like a quick fix. You know, if someone really want to switch to SAF in a very short duration with minimum investment, well, this is the solution. But the only challenge remain here is the availability of these waste feedstock, which are UC or free fatty acid. So that's why, again, there are certain limitations to it. Now, there, this is already commercialized and a lot of refineries around the world have moved their existing hydro treating unit into bio refineries by retrofitting their existing units. And this is one of the examples. And there are more to it, uh, one in Poland and Spain. Now, if I talk about the second route, again, uh, I'll start with the same page, which is, it is again a very flexible and uh, flexible process. When I say flexible, it can process wide range of feedstock, wide range of biomass. It should only have carbon and hydrogen in it. I mean, that is the intent. And then you can target a mix of products and that mix of product is SAF, green diesel, or green LPG, bio LPG. I mean, uh, all the green products that you can have. 
it actually provide it actually utilizes uh, ft root which is there in the chemical industry for a century now so the only thing that we have to do is take that know how adapt it to the right market condition the right feed stock that will be there and try to figure out how we can do it efficiently and reliably so this is done and the name of the process is bio t fuel project uh, you know when i say bio t fuel project it actually is a complete value chain of converting a uh, biomass as a feed stock into a and liquid fuel which which is saf and it involves primarily four steps the first step is the storefaction step where you do the uh, i mean drying part of removing some some part of the moisture you grind it do screening and then it goes to a gasifier in the second step you produce syngas then in third fourth step you condition that syngas you remove the impurities and then you fed it to fischer trop step now the key thing is this step number 1 here is uh, like uh, you know it can be disassociated with the downstream units i'll tell you why because biomass transportation is a very big challenge okay and it's not possible to bring such a huge volume of biomass to a site and do the conversion so in place of that if you have a challenge or if someone has a challenge they can build this small torrefaction units closer to the availability of biomass convert that biomass into a powder like coffee powder like size substance and then trans transport that powder to a main facility so this is why i said this is a very flexible project where you can adapt this process based on the requirement of the demography or requirement of the market uh again if i talk about a key feature the end product is very similar in molecule to the fossil product that you have and it has a very good blending value in terms of its experience as i explained to you this torrefaction part this is how it looks like uh, this demo facility is there in france at venet and it is purposely built separately from the downstream unit because the idea was to showcase this concept of reducing biomass into a coffee powder like substance and transport it to another part so this is where the biomass is converted into this uh, small size uh, powder like substance and then it is transported to the other part which is in dunkirk north of france where we have this other downstream facility from gasification to ft synthesis now a uh, key thing here is if anyone anyone is interested it uh, we can easily arrange virtual visit physical visit to these sites and they can themselves see how big these facilities are now the third step which i mean which has been talked during this form quite aptly is the conversion of alcohol to jet and when we say alcohol here we are talking about ethanol primarily which is 1g or 2g and converting that into a jet fuel and uh, when i say that so what it does it it involves actually three steps uh, the first step is the dehydration step the second one is the oligomerization step the third step is the hydrogenation and then you fractionate it right all these steps individually are commercially proven and we have been uh, Uh, commercializing or giving services for these parts around the world for last several years uh, because here oligomerization step plays a crucial role because dehydration is quite common i mean ethanol to ethylene dehydration is there for ages so the step name is at all this is our commercial name the second step which is more crucial is oligo oligomerization of this ethylene into tetramers or trimers uh, where uh, this, in this area as well we have more than 65 references uh, not specifically to produce saf but the operation or the chemistry as a whole exens is pioneer in the area of oligomerization lastly hydro treating well this 
as i said in the beginning this is bread and butter for exens we have been in this area for last since uh, exens is there in the history and so we have uh, more than uh, well we have lot of references but the uh, for the deep polishing of olefins we have 71 references so i mean uh, just to summarize now uh i'll just finish by saying that you know in today's time of energy transition where we are aiming to reduce these emissions uh a basket of solution or an overlap of number of pathways will able to meet the requirement as well as solve the challenges that we have and this is where exens is here to provide a complete set of technological solution to have sustainable growth in the times to come so this is it from my side do let me know if you have any question any queries i'll be here to address your doubts thank you ashish thanks for the detailed presentation on the various aspects and the various products and it is interesting to see that you are talking about not only the sf also the by product how can that can be utilized into the different forum and the single plant where by which you can also develop the biodiesel as a sustainability plant so not only the sf is coming into the picture even you can go for the other products that's good to see and interesting part is how you can transport the biomass powder to different production size to bring in the sf which will be much more efficient and most probably economical as well that's uh, good to see and that is one of the insight i must tell you i have not heard of it about the powder product and good to see and perhaps we will be coming out with more qa sessions later on once you uh, finish all the speakers presentation Uh, thank you very much and i would request colonel rohit that to come and uh, give the presentation and i know colonel rohit has got a vast experience of the military and sure alien and so things so uh, would like to hear from uh, colonel rohit namaskar sir jain yeah, so yeah. i'm not too sure if you can see see my face because video is on but i can't see myself so i'm not too sure if you can uh, see me if your laptop has got a camera protection just put it on some oh. of the laptops has the camera protection on the top you just need to slide it maybe okay. that is off. so where is that in the same screen where we uh, are currently no no on the top you can see some of the laptops has got a physical obstruction on the camera okay somebody wants to control my camera i said yes oh, we can see you till now you can see me no <laughs> so, anyway my, my my face is not that good looking so i will start so uh with 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 my sincere gratitude to uh, dr uh, anil garg uh, who has been at you know this juncture of life and pain so to say last two years in covid still been able to you know curate an event like this and get all of us on board uh, it actually uh, is is a remarkable thing because it's an inspiration for, for uh, younger people like us to see you know uh, like you mr dash and got to be here and also for the other joinees from uh, across the globe now we have gone through a, a phase of uh, you know presentations uh, i will be uh, as usual i i don't carry present uh, presentations anywhere and i will give my you know mind and a little bit of heart today of of where uh, we we need to go we all are very clear about our emission the the load of emission and i mean just to give a number because i don't talk numbers beyond a point seven uh, sorry 915 million tons of carbon emissions in 2019 right but only amounting to about 3% of the global total of uh, your ghg emission and we have taken it upon ourselves in the aviation sector uh, to ensure not only that we have a mitigation of the co2 emission uh, but we also do much more for actual decarbonization so there's a subtle difference in mitigating your co2 emission ghg emissions and uh, there is other uh, school of thought uh, which is you know tantamounting to what we call green washing when we say let's have carbon offsets uh, printed on you know your tickets and how much you're going to pay for it and last but not the least is the decarbonization part now to approach this as an industry uh, aviation sector has got many many you know good plans positive plans and especially we have seen since 2018 an influx of of nearly 120 billion usd which has gone into the fleet renewal and getting better technology in order to reduce this emissions themselves apart from this how you get more operational efficiency intermodal you know integration is something which the world will see as we go ahead but there is nothing stopping the corsia norms 
not to be, you know, if I put it mildly, obeyed. A day has come that you have to take an in intentional call that uh, whatever the Corsia norms stand for, it is for good of this planet in the future to start with. We can talk about electrical aircrafts. I don't know what the battery package size will be. Maybe it will be 50 times, 60 times heavier than the current uh, you know, kg of uh, gasoline being put there, aviation fuel, or how the hydrogen powered aircraft will look like. So I think there is a transition in the making. And like any other sector, uh, the aviation sector also will undertake a transition. So while the technology will, will mature, whether you will have hydrogen or you will have any other solar powered kind of a vehicle or anything else uh, flying in the air, uh, it will be have to, it will have to be transitionary in nature, right? Boeing has announced a very pertinent announcement early last year. I think, if I believe I'm not wrong, that they will convert to you know 100% SF by 2030. It's a good call. So it's only a transition in the making, and I would like every you know uh, person present here to see it in that mode. India per se, and when I come to India, uh, we have a huge you know a surge in the aviation sector. The middle class economy today allows. Uh, you to connect more tier two, tier three cities, and and with the schemes the government has has launched for you know um, in our rural sector and and semi urban sector, I think uh, uh, the writings on the wall that you know by 2040 or 2050 we're going to be in the first three uh, in terms of uh, the aviation uh, signature, uh, the largest aviation sector in the world, and there our commitment of decarbonization, how we are doing in other sectors. You know, in the ability to convert 40% of electric power installed capacity uh, to non-fossil fuels by 2030, or by saying net zero by 2070, actually through all these policy initiation, and even when I see not only aviation sector, but national biofuel policy of 2018, which the, with the ethanol blending program, I think is a testimony that India is meaning serious business uh, when it comes to uh, renewable re resource uh, for uh, energy needs. And uh, this sector of aviation is going to be no, no different. Now, when we see the system innovation fuel and when we see typically India and growth of tier two, tier three airports today in India, my uh, you know, uh, undertaking, uh, so to say, or a philosophy today is that we should plan it well. I cannot change Mumbai airport. I cannot change New Delhi airport, which are the two basic hubs for international flights today. But if the Corsia norms are going to prohibit uh, the aircrafts to be fueled in these two lo locations, the hubs of India, uh, just because uh, you know you are not blended, you are not clean enough, I'm quite sure Mumbai and, and Delhi in the years to come will not be able to operate flights like that. So what are we looking at? We are looking at if you can't change, if you can't draw pipelines. So maybe somewhere in Haryana, somewhere in UP, you will be making this sustainable aviation fuel. And through pipelines, it may be coming to large dumps in Delhi near the airport, underground dumps, and then probably you will refuel. The cost of doing that, how cost prohibitive or, or expensive or you know, uh, feasible it is, is for, for, the, for the state and the government to see. But certainly, tier two and tier three cities which are currently being planned for, those are the cities where the airport uh, you know, blueprints are being drawn, land is being acquired, and that's my first suggestion uh, you know, through this webinar, that we should be able to select these stations or locations as in consonance with the biofuel policy to be sure that we have ample amount of biomass or any feedstock from which you're going to make this, even if it's energy plantation based, those hard, large hectares of land, they should be allocated near to the manufacturing units and from where the proximity to the airfield itself or the airport itself uh, is, is, is also you know, uh, sustainable financially. So those are the drawings. The other impact, which is the social cost of carbon, which people call it as a buzzword these days. And whether we take the EU, which is trying to have ma mandatory you know, requirements, Finland, Norway, or even a country like Indonesia, which started in 2015, uh, we, have a, we have a long way to go. Typically in India, when I talk about you know, uh, the farmer sex segment, you know, the annual income of, of the farmer would increase only by the sustainable aviation fuel dream of our country by an additional you know, dollar 50, 150 or so, which is about a 15% increase in the incomes. I'm not talking about the 2G ethanol. I'm not talking about the Satat scheme, uh, which the previous speaker showed about the growth pattern in India. 
I'm only talking about the aviation fuel. If aviation fuel can make a difference of 15% of income in the rural economy, it's a huge social and economic change for this country. And that is the positive way to look at it and not try to contest the global norms, the Corsia norms, and, and try to bite for time. I think time has come already to bite the bullet. Then we see you know, the conversion rates and we see how money is going to be made. It's not only the money for the feedstock. It is that somebody is in the logistics setup, entire logistics setup, is going to do production, is going to do warehousing, is going to do you know, storage, trans transshipment, transportation, logistic cost, areas. And that's where more of the income will come. But last but not the least, the income will also come from the renewed jobs, the green jobs, uh, you know, which are in the offing today and, and which, which can be scaled up and which can be actually uh, put to use. The total green job opportunities on a scale up in this industry in India today is estimated in upwards of 120,000 plus jobs, uh, which are going to come only because of this sector. And it's not a small amount to start with as per the current scale. The other part is that, you know, the energy security part. Imagine the flux our country is in today. And this is a point for, you know, uh, people who are going to make the snapshot of this particular webinar. We are going into biofuels. Satat scheme, CBG, CNG for vehicles, other uses of this gas, 2G ethanol for a complete transition from a two-wheeler to a three-wheeler for a four-wheeler for, and for large load carriers in the country. And by these you know, scales which are rising for demand side, you are now trying to see a transition of an airline or an aviation sector of a country like India from eighth largest to say the third largest in a matter of next two decades. And, and that is where you will wonder that which biomass waste, which kind of technology dealing with a you know, agricultural feedstock or a, or a forestry feedstock or an energy plantation governed by an agricultural feedstock, are you going to source for all these different uses? So finally, the energy transition and security needs to cater for that which of the requirements, domestic, you know, flying, transportation by road, by sea, who is going to use what quantum of fossil fuel and who is going to use what quantum of renewables? And is it feasible to become 100% renewable given the cost to it and given the renewable energy resource itself? Because if it's going to finally fall short because of the quantum or the technological requirements, then obviously the alternate sources which are currently already existing in terms of coal, diesel, you know, gasoline or kerosene, are going to be used. And, and that is how we are going to see this transition coming up. And, and, and I see a lot of revenue. Each city, which is producing about you know, 1,000, 10,000 tons or more of solid waste today, can also be you know, generating about 7 to 10 million USD in revenue per city to do a lot of good only through one of the technologies which leads to SAF. And, and last but not the least, the environmental cost and the health benefit attached to even the SAF is huge because the amount of stubble burning of the agricultural waste we do in India, if we are going to use it into blending into a fuel for aviation and which is going to provide about 10 to 15 percent of economic uh, search for the farmers, I think it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good thing ahead. The previous speaker has talked about a lot of technologies, hydro process, esters, fatty acids, HEFA or GSAFT, or you talked about alcohol to jet or, or power to liquid. These technologies are something which we can, and like, like the previous speaker from, from abroad said that these technologies are not very new. Yes, they are maturing and they are to scale up. There are lab sizes technologies. There are little more you know, aggressive technologies coming up, but it will all take its own time to get through. And the combination of these approved technologies and feedstocks, when I put it together, and why I'm putting feedstock every time is because my company uh, deals with uh, large scale supply chain dreams, uh, both for the 2G ethanol, the sustainability fuel, and also the compressed biogas and CNG sector. So when you use the combination of this approved technology and feedstock, India could very well produce nearly 20, 25 million tons of SF annually, and which is far exceeding its target production you know, currently. And, and that is the way to see the scope. We actually could be uh, the exporters of this fuel and some of our aviation hubs, especially the class two and three, which are going to come up now, could become large refueling hubs for this part of the continent, and especially for India. 
so so that is that is the way probably you know a person like me looks at the growth of this sector and also looks at the growth of uh, the aviation sector uh, globally the other part which is there is about financing and i have been discussing this at nauseam there was a you know study done in which i was also a member with a lot of uh, giants of the aviation globally and i think even boeing boeing was there and that that paper has gone to, to the government of the day i i cannot discuss the tenets of that paper directly but uh, let me you know give you a, a, a brief of what our major recommendations were there which i can talk about because i i give this everywhere so in terms of the financing it is very important to curate apart from a triple p model which is the public pa 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 private partnership model a 4p model wherein the fourth p is the people or the farmer as we call him and that has to be the stakeholder so imagine this and this i have discussed with a lot of aviation giants as well so you want to make uh, this aviation fuel saf so there's a technology player there's a financer and everybody else and we get together and the supply chain partner we make this at zero cost or we make it at cost and once we do as a open book at cost what we are doing for the economy is that for example if i am taking some kind of a feed stock i am paying 1000 inr or maybe 2000 inr for taking that feed stock from the farmers right initially if i were after this at cost business as a consortium get the farmer to get about 0.1 0.2 to 0.3% of our profits which we finally make after putting that aviation fuel into uh, into the aircraft and, and and getting money for it i think we are going to make an ecosystem more robust and the farmer will be a stakeholder for a longer time in this business and then this business itself becomes sustainable and why i'm putting this caution is for everybody to understand you can today go to a geography start with a minuscule 40000 tons aggregation say for a small cbg plant and the rate of biomass which you pick up from the farmer say hypothetically is you know a 1 inr per kg tomorrow when you go into 3 4 years you don't want the farmer or a consortium of fond farmers to get greedy and tell you that now the now the cost is 4 rupees right so you have to make the business sustainable and unless the stakeholders are there from the farming community from the state government who are going to lease you the land for 30 years or the project cost of for 99 years depending on what you understand and what you need i think uh, we have to go a, a many miles today in 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 our efforts to get that done let me just briefly sum up by by giving a few few suggestions we are not looking at subsidies because subsidies i believe kill markets and and and, and kill a lot of businesses we are looking from the government for the cost of borrowing for the supply chain from farm to the factory where you manufacture the saf from green resources to be you know at a competitive 4 or to 5% of cost of borrowing of lending of for us for for the entire ecosystem so if the aviation industry itself takes that amount for making a warehouse for say um, green commodity it should come at that cost that's one way to do it and that's with the way you going to defeat all kind of fossil fuel based business in the future as well the second is the gst needs to go down for this green part of the business once you have made the fuel and you putting in the aircraft you can charge 18% no problem but the balance of it when you are making the ecosystem some part has to be 0% some has to be 5% some has to be even 12% it's okay but then you got to got to get the cost down we're not looking at a great moratorium but if the period of you know influx and everything else to stabilize is going to take 3 to 5 years then obviously certain components of the entire farm to the you know uh, aeroplane this entire uh, you know uh, chain is going to be based on 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 such like sops for a moratorium for for your tax benefits and others in terms of uh, the priority sector for lending there are various components which seek that particular thing from the government and that should come secondly is how to get the technology integration because most of the technologies are are globally available they are foreign technologies and i believe the fdi route which the country has today to in, enable this to happen is very proactive and you know aggressive and with a little bit of impetus on ease of doing business i think these four technologies which i generally mentioned and 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 my previous speaker from the scientific community you know elaborated upon it is important that we select those players and sign off as as partners and consortiums today so that the job is easier going towards to 2030 we are already down by two or three years of thinking so i think this this next decade is is quite going to be important for us when we go into you know this the, the scenarios there are a lot of scenarios uh, in terms of uh, conflicting requirements of the agricultural sector 
the Ministry of Civil Aviation, the MOPNG, MNRE, your you know Environment and uh, and Climate Change Forestry uh, uh, Ministry, and then the overall and overarching belief of the Niti Aayog and the PMO. I think there is a need today that since this aviation fuel also is a you know major a subset of the superset called biofuels so biofuels in 2g ethanol or saf or cbg are should come under one umbrella of policy making in which all these uh, ministries come together and they say they dictate the command areas in the country of where the feedstock sourcing would be for what particular purpose either ethanol or cbg or there's going to be saf or quite contrary to our thinking like people like ntpc doing thermal is going to be for thermal use or otherwise generation of electricity so all this has to come together and i believe today the time has come for people like us who i have collected today and i have seen in the last two years a very good you know initiative taken by mckinsey and the global uh, you know giants in in the industry and including stakeholders like uh, my company punjab renewable energy systems private limited i think we need to push that pedal and through such forums uh, push the pedal even harder internally in india to make sure that we don't miss the boat uh, for compliance of the corsia norms to start with and we are dedicated the health cost benefits 5 billion usd is the report of 2018 which talks about the health you know hazard in a country the bills we are paying and nearly 40% of the lung or respiratory diseases are emanating because of burning of stubble all over and and and, and other ill effects so we actually owe better health to ourselves and our future generation and we actually owe a better environment to our future generation and if we mark up this cost and add the add them up i don't think so we are looking at subsidy we are looking at rational thinking here and as and as see saf as a very good future for our country and uh, and and maybe you know if, if we have a saf coalition of sorts globally in which major players in every component of this industry join hands together i think as private uh, sector will be able to do a, a, a lot more uh, in be able to convince our governments to do it as a non subsidized model financially viable and in especially india good for rural development rural economy financial inclusion meeting all the sustainable development goals all 17 by the t is the capability of the saf so i think the saf challenge is up and about and let's face it head on as a team head on so i will just put my you know voice to rest right now and we'll be happy to take on questions or anything else which the chair wants me to answer or the participants want to ask so thank you very much for the opportunity once again thank you dr garg uh, for this beautiful uh, you know energy you bring into this sector in terms of biofuels petrochemicals and 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 even renewable energy so thank you for this opportunity Unmute, sir, please. I think, um, Dashi, you are muted. Yeah. Thank you, Colonel Rohit, uh, for bringing out the complete ecosystem and a great insight of the complete sustainable system. How this can benefit across all divisions and across all ministries. That's one of the great insight. Uh, perhaps I look into and uh, as you rightly pointed out, to one policymaker on the PMO must be talking about the complete sustainable biofuel system rather than talking about silos. i really appreciate the point where you have been talking about being the from the 3 ppp model to 4 ppp model where everybody is a stakeholder including the farmers which actually brings down the sustainability effort which we are talking at the same time what have you said with respect to the health benefits and the majority of the sustainable of how we can be sort of planning to export the SF rather than importing in the particular day, number tier two, tier three, where we see the business is going up, and having a GST, which is again sustainable for the complete system. That's a great insight. I must thank you for all your thought process and bringing it forward to the webinar, and the people must be taking note and which can be produced to the right forum to act on us. And with this, I'm not going to talk whether I would request Ms. Ekta Agarwal to come and. give her presentation or the speak or whatever it is so that we can finish some time and we don't have much of the time we are left with 20 minutes more for the qa session so ekta you can continue good afternoon everyone 
first of all thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity to represent my organization here my thoughts here this is my first time representing uh, presenting myself in such forum so almost all the parts of my presentation have been covered by our earlier speakers whether it be saf whether it be kosia or whether it be the challenges we are facing and uh, i must congratulate uh, colonel uh, dev because his talk was very much enthusiastic and i just missed two things one we cannot see him and the second was if he could have got the all the points written in the form of presentation or a, uh, or a writer it would have been great for us so that in future we could have uh, taken uh, help of those so not to waste much of the time i'll start my presentation very quickly so rightly said this is a sustainable aviation fuel we see as the future of our civil aviation because the technology and operations have freezed somehow to an extent so what is left is now the saf uh, already we have talked about this that how aviation is contributing to the emissions in the environment it is right now said 2.5% of the overall co2 emissions globally which is going to rise very sharply in the coming years as we, as the aviation industry goes throughout the world and the other sectors have been covered which you can see in the diagram Now, IPCC produced a special report on the aviation and the global uh, atmosphere under which carbon dioxide was considered as the principal greenhouse gas, and concluded that aviation represents approximately two to three percent of the total annual global CO2 emission from human activities and has impacts on climate from its non-CO2 emissions. So, which has been, uh, which has been, which I already told that it has now really increased to two point five percent. Now, if we talk about the recent global risk. in the report we see the top most which comes is the climate action play there no other uh, conditions like not the uh, you know infectious disease or biodiversity loss natural resource crisis these have all be all been left behind the what we see is the climate action failure it really means that whatever has been decided it's not meeting those standards and the emergency call of the situation is uh, to address the climate change now if we see what are the impact of climate change on our aviation has been uh, it is due to the disruption to operations reduction in airport throughout inundation of transport excess loss of local utilities provision and what are the extreme events we have seen we that not to tell in india that we see all the extreme events here it rather be the flood or be the droughts so disruption to operation disruption to ground transport excess uh, disruption to supply of utilities wind changes convective weather disruption to operations uh, route extensions jet stream cross winds then temperature changes there's in changes in the aircraft performance and also the sea level rise the loss of airport capacity impact and ke baad bhi koi nahi kya due to lack of ground capacity and loss of ground transport access Okay. now uh, why saf has been talked so much uh, in the recent years it it is not uh, it has not been just uh, brought uh, to the table as an uh, it's not a recent talk in india we do not have we didn't had any domestic uh, measures to curb emissions in the aviation because our being a non annex country we do not uh, we don't have any commitments we don't have uh, we have all the voluntary commitments so our ndcs do not uh, focus on the sector specific emissions our ndcs are overall for the uh, for the country and they don't say that aviation has to decrease so much but when we talk about the international commitments where we are where we are uh, required to follow uh, the icao norms because uh, it is uh, fit for all purpose and it is for it, they treat all apples uh, as apples they don't treat uh, different uh, oranges and apples so if we talk about the three aspirational goals of icao For, uh, relating to aviation environment they had 2% improvement in fuel efficiency per year from 2019 until 2020 second was carbon neutral growth from 2020 onwards and the third which is going to come is the long term aspiration goal on net zero emissions so in order to achieve icao's aspiration goal of carbon neutral growth the 2% increase has already been uh, achieved somehow because of our new fleet in fact it is doing very well and we can see the 2.5% improvement in the fuel efficiency now if we talk about the carbon neutral growth concept of car, uh, global market based measure was adopted in icao as general assembly meetings so icao member states agreed to implement a global market based measure G, uh, to compensate post 2020 emissions growth from international aviation in 30th assembly of icao in october 13 it is not uh, 
very common to say that uh, we cannot consider the year 2020 as the year now why because of the covid scenario we all we have all seen a very much uh, decline in our emissions due to the 2020 scenario so we are working on it ICO is working on it that what could be the baseline now right now we have adopted for 2019 for the first phase of COSIA. so the much talked topic about the uh, throughout aviation in these days is COSIA. it was uh, adopted through assembly resolution 393 the first global MBM scheme for any industry sector. Now, to achieve ICRAW's aspirational goal of carbon neutral growth, the, we had three basket of measures, which was our aircraft technology, operational improvements, and sustainable aviation fuels. You can clearly see through the diagram that a large portion of to meet the goal of CNG20 is being ma met by sustainable aviation fuels and COSIA. So, if you do not use SAF, your offsetting will increase through the buy of your carbon credits. Therefore, SAF has a major role to play to reach your carbon neutral growth. More you use SAF, more you can save on uh, curbing your uh, emissions through offsetting. So what is a sustainable aviation fuel? A uh, lot of experts have talked about it, but um, being, a, uh, being a regulator, being a layman for me, what is it? It must meet the same safety standards at, as, as current aviation fuels. They should be the drop-in fuel, which means they should have no effect on the aircraft system, engine, and its performance. They are fully compatible with existing aircraft and fuel supply systems. And in addition to safety standards, SAF needs to meet the sustainability criteria. Yes, it's not just production, it's not just availability, but it's also the uh, meeting of the standards. Mm -hmm. Now, SAF has been termed as what we talk is cost eligible fuels because SAF in general can be used in domestic international market, but if you need to make a, if you need to earn profit in your emissions or you need to claim your emissions through its use, it has to be a cost eligible fuels. So how, how can, how is it different from a SAF? So air, airplane operators may claim emission reductions from the use of cost eligible fuels that meet the cost cost sustainability criteria as defined in the ICAO documents, which are available on the ICAO website. Cost eligible fuels include both SAF, that is sustainable aviation fuels and low carbon aviation fuels, where we have some, uh, I would be very happy if we could have uh, some session on even on the lower carbon aviation fuels, which is also right now in the studies. The emissions reductions will be proportional to the life cycle emissions benefits of the alternative fuels used. And to it, CF has to meet well eligibility criteria for the economic operators, mainly pertaining to documentation management system, auditing, non-compliance, monitoring and reducing system, transparency and risk management, as well as approved under the sustainability certification scheme, which, ha which has all its criteria being mentioned by ICAO on its website. Now related to SAF, there are five documents available on the ICAO website, which continuously need uh, keep updating as per as, the, as per as any new updates are available. You can find it easily on the ICAO website, which is the cost eligibility framework and requirements for SCS. COSI approved SES, sustainability criteria for COSI eligible fuels, default life cycle emissions value for COSI eligible fuels, and COSI methodology for calculating actual life cycle emission values. We'll not go into the details of these documents as you can easily get them to the website. Now, when we come to the uh, regulator point of view and if we see what developments we have made. So we, as we all know that in India, we yes, we talk about technologies, we talk about uh, the pathways, everything, but when it comes to ground, we see there is no production viability, there is no availability. So there's, uh, there, is, there is no fuel available, if I talk in a layman's language. Now, in two, year 2018, we have conducted a demo flight from the Jatropha food seeds, from the fuel, biofuel produced from Jatropha seeds by our, our institute, Indian Institute of Technology, CSIR, based at Dharadun, uh, under which we have blended SAF in the ratio of one is to four in one of the engine of the Bombardier Q400 aircraft. And the flight was conducted for one hour from Dharadun to Delhi. In Japan, performance was satisfactory and parameters were well within limits. In continuation to it, Bureau of Indian Standards have issued Indian standards for bio jet ATF, which came into uh, existence in January 2019. And yes, scaling up of production is under active consideration. The recent development that Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas has constituted a committee to explore and take forward the production of SAF in the country to promote the use of clean fuel in aviation.
committee has a group of experts wherein DGC is also the member. And uh, yes, we have uh, formulated a report being submitted to the management and the final approved report is awaited at, uh, at our end. These are some of the pics you can see, which was being uh, the flight which carried the SAF for the first time in India for the domestic flight. Now, this is the recent development. I can tell you right, right now we are sitting here and Dingo is preparing for its first international ferry flight for 10% blended fuel. The flight is scheduled tomorrow from uh, Toulouse to Delhi, though it is a ferry flight, not commercial, without passengers, but yes, it's first of its kind in, for, India, for any Indian airline. Now, if we talk about the challenges ahead, though SAF is the only alternative as of now to reduce carbon emissions from aviation, it, is all, it comes with a lot of challenges, as all my key speakers have already informed us, that is price, availability, certification standards. If I see from the airline's point of view, the SAF is around two to three, time, three times higher than what the normal ATF is just right now pricing and the availability. As of now, SAF is only produced at the liberty level, which is not sufficient. We need sufficient volume to replace at least one to two percent of ATF to start with and the certification standards. Showing compliance to the certification standards for any aviation fuel is a paramount requirement. Further, it must also comply with the sustainability criteria in order to be considered for international purposes. So when we make SAF, we should not just focus for a domestic use, but also to cater uh, to the international requirements. Concluding my presentation, sustainable aviation fuel is the most feasible option to be decarbonize air travel in India and globally for the next 15, 20 years without altering the design of the aircraft. I'll, I'll see that biofuels, you know, are going to be indis indispensable for decarbonizing the transport sector as a whole, uh, among which road transport is likely to remain the largest market for biofuels. They are especially crucial for applications where electrification does not uh, look to be a viable option in the next several days, decades, in fact. In these markets, including heavy-duty vehicles and aviation and maritime transportation, biofuels will play an increasing power role. And then it comes to the scaling up of refineries. Scaling up of refineries to cater the demand of SAF is the need of the hour and will also bring the price at par with normal FTF. We should also focus on international certification standards and sustainability criteria for development so that industries benefit both in domestic and international aviation. And meeting the uh, you know, standard sustainability, uh, sustainability criteria and by ICAO will require, the, this is another area. First is the SAF production. Now to get it certified, you know, we should have we have to be required discrete project assessments, verification processes to be conducted at national levels, which we don't talk about. There is also a need to include domestic third party verifiers that should be accredited by ICAO by verifying compliance to all twelve sustainability sustainability criteria, or at least verifying domestic interna internal sustainability criteria, criteria which includes labor and human rights, land use rights, water use rights. So with this, I'll end my presentation and some food for the thought as our key speakers have already told what we actually want. We can easily see we should make up Earth a better place for us and for our coming generations. Thank you very much. And I'm open to any question answers. Honorable Chairperson, now it is a time to have a, your presentation, Mr. Dash. Oh, I, don't, I don't think we have time for my presentation, rather I would speak. And I have got a couple of questions, perhaps I would devote more time onto those slides. And I have okay. three questions uh, for the panel of the speakers, perhaps that would be more enlightening than uh, yes. giving me. a lot of things has already been talked on the okay. different uh, by the different speakers on the same format so there is no point i am going okay. to repeat those things again uh, i have put one question for the mike uh, mike how to expect we know that the us has been forefront and running on the one of the industry leaders in the aviation um, fuel sustainable aviation fuel but how do you expect the other countries who are not producing and to cope up with the cosian norm and the aviation fuel so globally it will be feasible for all other countries to follow the pattern. Yeah, and what we're seeing is, is each country has a, a, a different value stack. Um, as an example, we've discussed India, um, you know, you could potentially one um, exempt the SAF from the 
the jet fuel taxes, uh, which would add a significant chunk of value. Uh, also, the airlines are starting to develop what they call SAF certificates. So uh, they'll sell these certificates, the greenhouse gas reductions to, to some of their business uh, travelers or something that want to uh, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, and so each country is a little different, but everyone has uh, different values and incentive programs that they can stack on one another to, uh, to get the, the cost of production in line with the, um, with the available incentives, so. Yeah, um, that's great. I mean, what we should, uh, we should see is our strengths to come back, come back onto the sustainable aviation fuel rather than depending on the different technology, we should be using our strength. That takes me back to the Colonel uh, Roit. Uh, Roit, what do you think about to the Mike's question, how to make it sustainable by using your own system that you use own strengths to bring out the sustainable aviation fuel. Rohit, are you still there? I don't know whether he's able to hear this or not. Okay, uh, Mike, that's uh, great. I, as you said, that people should be looking at each country's strength to overcome so that they make the sustainability aviation, sustainable aviation fuel for the complete future, rather than just looking at what the world is doing, how best they can come into that picture. Colonel Rohit has joined back again. Colonel Rohit, can you hear us? No, I, I don't know. Okay, uh, Dr. Patrick, uh, I have one question for you. When we have talked about the reverse energy and the sustainability, where you count the footprint from starting and what the energy you put into the system, then to bring it to the SF. How do you think this is going to be economics? Because the, as we all know, that energy can neither be created nor be destroyed, but transforming one energy from to the other energy, how do you think sustainable aviation fuel is going to happen when talking of the complete energy cycle? Oh, I think Dr. Patrick has also left. I, I can see that uh, perhaps the next speakers have joined into the presentations. Okay. Uh, my next uh, question to Harshit. Harshit, we have been talking about the various methods of the shifting this powder technology to the various production side to the transforming the biogas. How do you think in India, whether we can leverage that part of converting at the small scale at a different farmer level and transforming this to a various factories or as you mentioned to France or to other places to bring in the SF cost down, how do you think this is going to happen? Is there a possibility that we can look into those areas? Uh, in order to reduce the cost of the SAF, I mean, this is something that is there for all the bio-based technologies because the economics for these technologies at this stage is not able to compete with fossil fuel based uh, pathways. So, I mean, the way uh, people are targeting to make it more economically viable is certainly uh, one of them is to uh, utilize the bio, uh, your reuse of bio products. You know, this way, the overall scheme is, uh, I mean, it makes more economical sense because once you do the project evaluation in the form of NPV, that certainly, you know, uh, IRR for the main product is not very attractive. But with bio product, yes, then it starts making sense. Plus, uh, in terms of the feedstock, I think uh, other than economical viability, one of the challenges that has been there is the availability of one feedstock, right? If I talk mm -hmm. about biomass, it's very diverse, I mean, dispersed over a wide geography. So, I mean, that's why I, sh I showed in one of the slides that, you know, if there is a need to accumulate a biomass in an economical way and transport it so that, you know, you do not incur that amount of cost. So one of the approaches that we found out during our research was converting it to a smaller size, which is let's say in the pyrodor form which eventually improves the economics at the front end. 
now okay. eventually in terms of uh, let's say the building up the unit all these units are capital intensive so if i give you a very quick comparison i will not take long time but the pathways that i showed you i think the fisher drop route per se is the most capital intensive i mean okay. that will that has the maximum capital intensivity so the quick fix that we see is the hydro treatment route from liquid feed stock to producing fuels and other one is the conversion of 1g ethanol into saf these are the two routes that we really see that can fit into the domain of quick implementation and economical viability i mean better economical viability in comparison to other routes i don't know if that answers the question yeah. thanks sir somebody is speaking something okay, uh, just before concluding i would like to ekta to answer ekta we have been talking about the regulator perspective and the eco consideration how do you think that the regulator come into the picture making it more sustainable rather than acting as a regulator and blocking it so what all things you think that we should be coming as an approach and the first method to use the sf what are the things we can look into from the regular perspective that yes we can do it and rather than depending not depending on the eco itself the regulator from india where it can use guidelines where it can make sense for airlines to go for sustainable aviation fuel regulator never blocks anything first of all oh, i know that because but the regulations we have to follow yeah ever it is because for the safety of the passengers and you have to follow the regulation secondly uh, if saf is available we are the ones who uh, you are happy to you know hand hold our airlines the example is been i have shown you that if spicejet came up uh, to us with a project we showed them the way and uh, this was new to us also right what all will be going into the approval what kind of reports will be required and same similarly it's for the other airline which is doing right now uh, the second uh, time it is operating for the international international from the saf uh, availability first the fuel should be available as as the airlines even moka even dgc and moka we are the end users for 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 us the fuel should be available we are not the fuel production uh, agency we cannot control on that aspect but yes when it comes to the regulatory approvals and all that will be very easy and it will be very e very easy for the our airlines to cope up with but uh, what we see is right now the fuel should be available then only we can uh, formulate any guidelines and regulations into picture thanks sakta thanks for uh, answering that question so we have already exceeded 5 minutes i am not going to take much more of time but i just want to summarize the couple of things where we have the key feature of people from the manufacturing and from the operations and the sales distribution and for the implementation part all together and we know that as an ecosystem we have to come together hand holding each other how to come bring the sustainable aviation fuel into india and make it sustainable so that we can achieve our targeted goals and the net zero emissions by 20 i mean uh, 27 the net zero by 2050 where we must achieve those kind of things so as it is a lot of speaker has already moved or spoken about it is not only one system it is a complete ecosystem whether it is operational efficiency whether we are talking about the airports or the atc the transporter the engine efficiency all these things the aircraft efficiency all these things has to come together along with the sustainable aviation fuel or the whatever we are talking about the biofuel plant bring into the sf all has to come together so that we can achieve those targets and i'm not going to take more time but at the same time we have to see as uh, Dr. Patrick has said that whatever the energy is we are talking about, we should not go into the negative things by talking about the sustainable aviation fuel as a complete mass. We should not go into negative things also. So that's a great thing. And with this, I would like to conclude the session. And thank you very much. Thanks for all the participants uh, taking time and coming to uh, present the very suspects of the sustainable aviation fuel. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Dash, for very ably chairing the session and bring a lot of new things in life and in this session also. Aviation sustainable aviation fuel is a need of our, and government is very serious about it. 
and hopefully uh, this will have a bright future ahead. Thank you very much for your. Thank you, sir. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to speak our mind and to take this presentation and the webinar forward in the right in the right direction. Thank you, one. Thanks, Acharya. You can disconnect. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dash, uh, for. Uh, sharing the session so wonderfully. Of, co of course, it was a very, very thought-provoking and a great session uh, that focused on advances in sustainable aviation fuel. I'd also like to thank all the speakers who have joined us uh, uh, from as far as the USA. We, uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Mike, Dr. Patrick. I'd also like to thank Dr. Harshit Agarwal, Colonel Rohit Dev, and Ms. Ekta Agarwal uh, for making the session a very fruitful session indeed. And uh, I'd also request everyone to please go through our 3D virtual platform. Uh, it has information about all the speakers and everything you'd like to know basically about this conference and exhibition. And uh, with that, I will wrap up this session. We have another very important session on uh, green hydrogen, zero emission fuel for mobility coming up in about uh, 20 minutes from now. So thank you all gentlemen for having joined us. It was indeed a pleasure having all of you in the program. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Leave the meeting for me.
Mark Dust. Yes, hello, met Ad van Wijk. Can you understand me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, fine. So mark this, mark this. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay, you know. thank you very much. Thank you.
गुड आफ्टरनून राजदान साहब Very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Rajdan sir, very good. good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good uh, afternoon, indeed. Hi, very good afternoon. Good afternoon. So we have all the speakers uh, who have joined in. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Nikhil wouldn't be there because he's. Uh, Father is uh, hospitalized. Um, Sorry to hear that. We should. But we have the rest of the speakers. Room. So, um, as soon as you give me the green signal, we can start off the yes, session. Yes, sir. we have. Uh, let's just formally introduce ourselves. Well, uh, uh, gentlemen, I'm Anil Razdan, and I presume Professor Irene M. C. Low is that. Yes, I'm here. How you address yourself, Miss? Uh, yes, uh, I'm a uh, Professor Irene Low. Okay, Irene Low. Okay, that's nice. And then we have Professor uh, Fan Weijich. How do you pronounce it? Yes, indeed, it is Professor Ed Van Weijich. Weijich, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Then we have uh, Nikhil is not joining us, Dr. Anjan Ray. Dr. Anjan Ray there with us? Uh, not right now, but uh, we do. I'm, I, yeah. I'm here. Yes. I thought I, I saw him. Okay. Uh, how are you, Mr. Azan? Good afternoon. Good afternoon Good to afternoon. all our fellow speakers. Thank you very much. So I think, you know, let's just... Uh, Rajdan, sir, we also have a professor, uh, Hirohisa. Hirohi, is that correct, sir? Yes, uh, I'm Nam from Japan. Yes, Hiroshi yes. Joining us Kofi from Hiroshi. Japan. Yes. Professor Hiroshita. Yes. Okay. And pardon me, your designation? Sir, um, so it is uh, uh, Tokai University. He's a distinguished yes, professor. Yes, I'm distinguished professor at Tokai University, and also I'm working as a vice president of International Association for Hydrogen Energy. And also I'm representative of uh, the state of Baden-Württemberg, Germany. So okay. usually I speak better German than English. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, I think since we have four speakers, it seems, who will be speaking today in the absence of Nikhil, and we have one and a half hour at our disposal. So maybe we target 10 minutes for the questions at the end, if possible, mm -hmm. which will roughly give us about uh, 15 minutes for each speaker. Okay, we get going then. All right, so we start. So I share the PowerPoint. Well, let's see. That. A very warm welcome to all the speakers and all the participants in this uh, very pertinent session for green hydrogen, uh, a zero emission fuel for mobility. And uh, we have with us a very distinguished uh, panel, Professor Irene Lowe, is Chair Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Institute of Advanced Study, and Senior Fellow, Hong Kong University mm -hmm. of SNT, Hong Kong. We have uh, Professor An Wyk, He's from uh, the Netherlands. 
TU Delft. Mr. Nikhil Moge may not be able to join us. Let's hope he can. We have Dr. Anjan Ray, Director, CSIR, Institute of Petroleum under the CSIR and a very distinguished institution for fuels. We have Professor Hiroshita, he's professor of Tokai University and Vice President of the International Association for Hydrogen. I would now request Professor Irene to kindly begin the presentation. And okay. we will 15 minutes maybe for each speaker and 10 minutes at the end. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, can you see the uh, PowerPoint? Yes, we can. Okay, yes. very good. Now, um, thank you for the invitation for this conference. Now, um, I am very glad right, to share with you about uh, our recent research work, which uh, is very innovative uh, in regard to the hydrogen productions from treating the wastewater. I'm not sure the background, your background, but then uh, I tried to make the talk uh, in a layman way because I'm not sure how many of you are working on the uh, wastewater treatment. But this uh, research basically using uh, the photoelectrochemical process uh, to treat the wastewater, to remove the organic pollutants, as well as to kill their bacteria. The good, good thing is that by doing this, we can generate the hydrogen gas, which is considered as a renewable energy. Now I'm uh, Irene No, I'm the currently the chair professor of civil and environmental engineering at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Right, it takes time to go to the next slide, seems. It works. Seems that cannot go to the next side. Let's see. It. Yes. How come? Right. Can you see the PowerPoint or not? No, no Irene. I oh. think you try again. I see. It seems it's stuck here. Because I cannot move to yes, the next come slide. Back to your screen. It comes back. All right. Now it takes time. Oh, there we go. So, it. get it. Now, for the wastewater, basically, we have the organic pollutants. Nowadays, the most uh, important emergent pollutants is PPCP, which is uh, pharmaceutical personal care products, like the uh, antibiotics, the uh, uh, personal care product which cause the water highly polluted. And then the other is their pathogenic bacteria. So all these two kind of pollutants often found in wastewater. And then nowadays we have the conventional wastewater to treat this pollutant. But then all these treatment process are energy intensive. So it consumes a lot of energy in order to do the treatment. But then as we all know that we are shortage of the energy so then for these reasons, uh, our research team trying to find a way to come up uh, innovative technology, which can remove these two, two pollutants. At the same time, we don't need energy, but generate additional energy. So that is the ideas behind. So regarding the pharmaceuticals and personal care products, what well, in short is a PPCP, and also the uh, bacteria E. coli. And uh, these are three commons of commonly found uh, PPCP in wastewater. And then uh, today we will concentrate on these uh, pollutants, uh, benzophenol in our research. Actually, we did all of them, but then may not have time to present all the data. And then uh, the uh, bacteria E. coli, uh, which cause uh, human health sickness, and also finding in the wastewater. So then uh, the, uh, the way we want to remove them, right, using a uh, new technology, later on I will share with you. 
But then, as I said, right, hydrogen nowadays considered as a green energy. And then uh, it is uh, reported that in uh, 2050, and uh, the hydrogen uh, might uh, be about 18% of the final energy de demands. And then uh, the uh, hydrogen is green and it can reduce the production, it can reduce the six gigatons of the carbon dioxide emission. So as you might all know that regarding the hydrogen production, we can uh, roughly divide into the gray hydrogen, blue hydrogen and green hydrogen. And the green hydrogen is uh, used for renewable energy uh, usually can be generated from electrolysis process, and uh, it is considered as uh, potential uh, energy for zero greenhouse gas emission. But then for the green hydrogen, the production cost is usually high compared with the gray and the blue hydrogen. And today, what I want to share with you is our new technology, which is also uh, advanced level of the electro uh, process, which is called the photoelectrochemical process to generate hydrogen. Uh, Irene, so, is, the, yes, is the dollar uh, denomination in US dollars or Hong Kong dollars? It is uh, in the US dollars. Okay, thank you. And then uh, for this uh, new uh, technology, what we call is a photoelectrochemical process. Actually, it is not Brand new, but then the, in the old days, actually we have been using for a long time, but not for hydrogen production only. And this is the diagram showing the basic concept of the PEC. Uh, basically, we need the, uh, uh, the uh, photo anode, all right? And then absorb the sunlight, that is uh, the solar energy. So the energy or electron drop from the valency band to conduction band. And because of the electron, it has the electrical flow. Uh, and then uh, the uh, photo the cathode from analog, and then uh, the electron will react with water to generate the uh, hydroxide energy, uh, uh, hydroxide uh, ions. So this is the basic PEC. But then now, how we can make use of the PEC to generate hydrogen is that you now we want to use this technology to treat wastewater and make use the presence of the chloride ion, which is often have the high concentration in these uh, water bodies, such as the wastewater. So because of the presence of the chloride ions, it will react with the uh, photo host, what we find here is photo host to generate a number of very reactive species, such as the uh, carbon radicals, hydroxyl radicals, hypochlorite, uh, radicals, they are very, very uh, strong reactive species to kill the bacteria and also to degrade the pollutants. So because of these high redox potentials. So then the current research gap of the PEC is that the uh, effectiveness of performance of degradations to the pollutants and the, to kill the bacteria is not that high. So then uh, we make use the uh, current atoms to react with that. And also we have to develop uh, very new materials, coatings on the photo anode in a way that it will prevent the uh, electron recombination. So that more electron will go from the photo anode to the cathode. And because of this, because of the electron flow, and then you can see this electron can react with the water and producing the hydrogen gas and also the uh, peroxide. And hydrogen gas can be collected and used it as a renewable energy. And then uh, the uh, chemical reaction is that the electron generate from the PEC can react with their water or hydrogen ion to produce the hydrogen gas. And then because of the strong reactive species that can oxidize and then degrade the pollutants and the kill and also to kill the bacteria. That is the, the ideas behind. So in this uh, research, 
Uh, it takes time to go to the next slide. How come? It won't happen, actually. Sorry about that. It, hopefully, it won't. I don't know why it always. Uh... Okay, so the uh, objective is that we develop a new materials. This material is for the photo anode, and it can prevent the uh, electron recombination. And then uh, by applying these new materials to treat the real wastewater, which contains high concentration of the chloride ion. And we expect, right, to have a simultaneous degradation of the organic pollutants, PPCP, produced hydrogen gas, and also to disinfect the E. coli bacteria. And then we also want to study, investigate the uh, key mechanisms and why the chloride ions can be activated and then how it can promote the PEC reactions. So then this is the, the materials we uh, synthesize and develop. And uh, it, is, it is the, um, you can see that three kinds of the uh, materials we develop. One is the power structure, business validate, and a single layer, uh, bismuth validate, and also by layer, bismuth validate. And you can see different pictures just to show they have different, same material, but different kind of structure. And then we compare which one is the best for wastewater treatment. And then uh, after we are producing the uh, bismuth validate, and then we call the uh, modalliums disulfate onto the bismuth validate as our photo anode. And this is the byproducts, that is the photo anode we use for PEC study. And then you can see this is the experimental setup for the PEC, basically, as we said that we develop these materials as the photo anode and it absorbs the sunlight and then now uh, these materials has high absorption for the visible light from the sun. And then after the uh, light absorption, then the electron will be excited, right? From the valency band to the conduction band and the electron will go to, do, to this uh, cathode. And this cathode, it will react with the water and generate the hydrogen gas. So we can collect the hydrogen gas and then treat the wastewater at the same time, all right? And then uh, the visible light we use, okay, is generated from the solar light simulator to mimic the sunlight. And then uh, the uh, light wavelength, okay, is so around 420 to 600. And then uh, we do, we test our PEC system and also to compare two control. The first control is electrocatalytic catalytic process, all right, just uh, without the photocatalyst in dark condition. And then now uh, we have the photocatalytic condition using the sunlight, uh, visible light. And then uh, this is uh, our photo envelope. And then you can see that now with the power structure, single layer structure, by layer structure of the bismuth validate coated with the uh, modadium disulfate. And then you can see that and then uh, the top line is the bilayer structure, which absorb more sunlight. And that's, that's the reasons why we use this structure for further study. And this is the bilayer, all right, bismuth validate coated with the modalium disulfide. And this kind of structure is called the BN junction structure. And the good thing is that the electron is jumped, excited, and then it will go to the uh, bilayer business validate for further reaction without the uh, electron recombination. And that is the major developments which can uh, prevent the uh, electron recombination and also have the high effectiveness. And uh, we use the, the wastewater, real wastewater, and you can see that this is the, the pH of the wastewater, the total carbon, and also E. coli, it is exactly from the wastewater treatment plant. And then uh, we used our newly developed PEC system with these new materials to treat this uh, benzophenol. And then uh, this diagram shows that for this uh, photoelectrochemical process, 
and then uh, that is the pink line. And the pink line, you can see that in uh, 30 minutes of time of the wastewater treatment, and then we can produce about 90 mic micromoles of the hydrogen gas. Bear in mind that we just treat small amount of the wastewater, around 200 mil, but we can produce such amount of the hydrogen gas. And in, in our real world, in the wastewater treatment plant every day, we are talking about to treat uh, several hundred or million gallons of the uh, wastewater. So you can imagine how much hydrogen gas we can produce. And then now uh, regarding the uh, uh, organic pollutants degradation, that is the uh, 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 benzophenol. And then again, using the PC system, that is the pain line compared with the control. And then the PEC system actually performs much better in uh, 30 minutes of treatment of the wastewater, basically 100%, close to 100% of the uh, benzophenol, this kind of organic compound is completely uh, degraded, photodegraded. And then, uh, and then uh, regarding the reaction rate constant, basically, uh, the, the PEC system is uh, 30 uh, to 21 times higher than the two controls, right? The control is the electrocatalysis process and the photocatalysis process. So then you can see now uh, how good is this uh, new uh, system. And also we uh, use uh, this uh, scavengers test to find out what are the major reactive species to degrade the uh, photo, to degrade the organic compound, benzophenol. And also we use the EPR measurement to find out uh, what are these uh, reactive species involved in the system. So then after this test, and then uh, we have the conclusion that basically it is the uh, chlorine radicals, hypochlorite radicals, hydroxyl radicals that are the dominant uh, reactive species contributing to the PEC for the degradation of the benzophenol. Right? Benzophenol is our PPCP. So then uh, we can uh, make a general uh, mechanisms to see, to explain how right, the PEC works. Basically we develop these uh, photo loops and then uh, we use this PEC system and then uh, um, in these uh, new materials, and this is uh, PN junction materials. And then when the materials for the envelope absorb the sunlight, and then the electron is excited from the valency band to the conduction band. And also the, the uh, electron react with the uh, uh, water to generate the hydroxyl radical. And because the wastewater contains a lot of the chlorine ions and chlorine ions will react and generate the chlorine radicals. And then uh, the uh, water, all right, the electron flow through this uh, electrical system and then uh, circuit and the electron will react with the water and generate the hydrogen gas. So then uh, we can see, all right, because of this uh, strong reactive species involved, it can degrade the uh, PPCP completely to CO2 and then the bacteria's E. coli is completely killed after the 30 minutes reaction. And also electrons, all right, we have with water to generate the hydrogen gas. And then uh, regarding the uh, bacteria, all right, uh, in the wastewater, and then we find that using the uh, um, um, MOS2 code on the uh, uh, power structure, single layer structure or bilayer structure. And then uh, the bilayer structure is much better than the other two kinds of structure. And uh, the equalize is completely killed. So without, and also meet the discharge standard for the wastewater treatment, all right? So then uh, bear in mind that in the wastewater treatments originally, we have so, so much bacteria, right? 13,000 counts of the E. coli in the system. But after 30 minutes of treatment, right, it dropped to zero. So in summary, 
right? Basically, uh, it is be a, a new PEC system using the newly invented visible light driven uh, materials as our photo anode. And uh, it has very good performance. It can simultaneously degrade the PPCP, generate hydrogen gas and kill the bacteria. And these three uh, the reactive species are the major uh, species involved in the system. So with that, uh, I conclude my uh, presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting uh, analysis that you're doing, a very useful utilization of uh, the electrolysis technology. Okay, so... Reading, reading the water, the sewage water of the E. coli infection and also producing hydrogen. Thank you very much, very innovative. And uh, now I turn to our second speaker, Professor Ad Van Wyk. He is from TU Deft, the Netherlands. Yes, Professor, thank you very much. go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Um, let me try to share my screen. What I will try to do in this uh, 15 minutes is uh, uh, showing you why hydrogen as a uh, as uh, carbon-free energy carrier and commodity is important in the total system change towards a uh, sustainable energy system and what it will do uh, as a fuel for, for mobility. Um, and I will start with showing you this graph because what you see today is that electricity and electrification of our energy system is the trend both for the production side as well as for the demand side. And the key driver that we see today is the low cost for wind electricity and solar electricity production. And that's shown by this graph from IRENA where you, every dot is a large wind or solar farm and you see the evolution of the levelized cost of uh, electricity over the past 10 years, 12 years. And what we see is that we have a very low cost for electricity production by solar and wind. And it is even, uh, you see for wind onshore and for solar, that it is below the fossil fuel electricity production cost range that we uh, experience or that we have today, which is that gray area. Also for concentrating solar power and offshore wind, we see this tendency of very low cost and decreasing cost for electricity production over the years. But when you have a careful look to these costs, then of course the low cost of solar and wind is especially at these areas where we have the best solar and wind resources. This is, for example, an, a map of the solar irradiation or the solar uh, photovoltaic power potential. And uh, it is not surprisingly that, of course, in these areas where we have the highest irradiation, that is the desert areas, there we have also the lowest cost for uh, solar uh, electricity production. And the same is valid for, uh, but most of these areas, uh, they are far from the energy demand. And that's where we find, and that where we can produce at the lowest cost. And the same is valid for wind. If we look to the wind uh, speed map at 100 meters height, as uh, you see on land that in uh, several of the coastal areas, but also in desert areas, we have very high wind speeds. Some areas like in Argentina, we have a very high wind speeds uh, in, in the south. And of course, at the oceans, we have the very high wind speeds, which you see on the right on this map. But still, these areas where we can produce for the low cost uh, electricity are far from the demand. And if you look to this, uh, then you say, okay, uh, it's interesting, but how uh, the next challenge that we uh, face is how can we produce this cheap electricity in these remote areas, but how can we get transport and store it so that we can bring it to the right place at the right time to the demand. That we have a sufficient um, potential for this is showing by this, uh, this graph 
uh, the total world energy consumption is about uh, 155,000 terawatt hours, which is billion kilowatt hours. And you can produce that energy by using 10% of Australia, for example, covering by solar panels, you produce this amount of energy. And that's not only the energy for the electricity demand. This is the energy for electricity, for mobility, for the industry, for heating, cooling buildings, etc., etc. It's all the energy use. But you can do that also by using 1.5% of the Pacific Ocean every kilometer. You place a large wind turbine, you produce also this energy. But of course, hey, looking to Australia or to the ocean, it's not at the place where the demand is. So the challenge that we now face in the going to a fully renewable energy system is how could we transport that energy? How could we store that energy so that we bring it at the right time, at the right place to the demand? And that's by converting this electricity to hydrogen. And uh, it was already shown by the previous speaker, the technology that we uh, uh, have today is water electrolysis. And there are several uh, ways of uh, doing this, water electrolysis. Uh, the most uh, mature technology is the ele alkaline electrolysis that we have today. But we have also the more new technologies, the membrane, the PEM electrolysis, and we have also high temperature electrolysis systems today. But today, especially alkaline and PEM electrolysis is, is the most advanced technologies and uh, are developing rapidly also in cost. What you see here is a table also showing the efficiencies of the electrolyzers. Uh, this is an alkaline electrolyzer from Thyssen Coop, for example. And um, you see that the efficiencies for the electrolyzer, has tech, you could say, is above 82% on higher heating value as is shown in this table. And when you look to this technology structure, uh, of course, the production cost of, uh, of hydrogen is very much dependent on the electricity cost because that is 60 to 80% of the cost of the, uh, of the hydrogen. So it is very important to go to these low cost electricity production sites, but then the the other cost is, of course, for CAPEX uh, cost uh, and OPEX cost of the electrolyzer. And that's interesting because the technology structure of such an al alkaline or PEM electrolyzer is the same as for solar cells or batteries. If you look to this picture of the electrolyzer, you see that we see all these blocks, which are called the stacks of an electrolyzer. And in these stacks, you can maybe see the stripes, uh, but these are cells, electrolyzer cells. And that is the same technology structure as you see with solar. It's also cells, and you put uh, more cells on a plate, then you call it a module. In this case, it is called a stack. And uh, if you need more output, you put more of these modules or stacks next to each other. And uh, it is not uh, that there is some uh, mechanical thing in this, uh, in this uh, technology. It's not high temperature in this case. So you can really do by mass production of cells and stacks, uh, bringing down the cost. And that is what you see here, learning rates. Uh, we experience learning rates for batteries and solar above 30%. And the expectations is that for uh, electrolyzers, this, this will be most probably also above 20%. And that will bring down the cost uh, uh, drastically uh, when we increase production, of course, uh, of these uh, electrolyzers. But it has already been said, we are looking to a solar and wind and electrolysis, but there are many other technologies to produce uh, hydrogen uh, because hydrogen is not an energy source as some people believe, it is an energy carrier. Like electricity, you have to make it from an energy source. And you can make it from uh, electricity, uh, uh, splitting water, but you can also use natural gas and have a technology which is now very much uh, developed also in in, uh, in the US, for example, but also in other places, which is called methane pyrolysis, superheating uh, the, 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 the methane. And then the methane is split into hydrogen and solid carbon. 
no CO2 emissions are there. And that's called Turquoise uh, 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 hydrogen. But this is a very promising technology also to produce hydrogen, not from electricity and water, but from uh, methane without any CO2 emissions. If you, of course, put in green electricity or use part of your produced hydrogen for this uh, process heat. But there are others, and uh, 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 my previous speaker has already explained, for example, photoelectrochemical technologies to, uh, to do even more than splitting water, uh, which is, of course, also a very promising uh, technology without any CO2 emissions to the air. Now, why do you want to, to convert electricity into hydrogen? Uh, because then you can much uh, cheaper transport it and also much cheaper you can store hydrogen than electricity. And this is an example of uh, that you can even reuse your gas infrastructure in a country or in, in a region to transport hydrogen. And that is what we, you see here for, for Europe. Uh, what we now uh, experience, this is the gas infrastructure on the, on, the, on the left. Also, we have connections to uh, Africa, uh, at sea, we have a gas infrastructure. We can reuse it. And that is what the gas transport companies now in Europe have uh, made up a plan to convert part of the gas infrastructure to hydrogen to transport uh, from the, for, for example, the Sahara Desert, but also from the North Sea, uh, uh, the hydrogen produ produced to the demand centers in, in, uh, in Europe. And then the cost is uh, about a factor 10 cheaper than to transport electricity, but also a pipeline capacity is about 10, 20 gigawatt uh, for, an, uh, for a middle-sized pipeline. Uh, we have even larger size uh, capacities uh, pipelines, and that is also a factor of 10 larger than what you see with electricity cables, which have in general a capacity of uh, one to two gigawatt at this moment, although also larger cables uh, more capacity cables are uh, coming uh, online too. Uh, but also you can transport hydrogen not only by pipeline, but also by ship. If you have even distances over, say, three, four, five thousand 5,000 kilometers, you can transport it by making it liquid. That's now what we see in Japan and Australia, one of these uh, developing this total supply chain. But you can also you could say connect hydrogen to another carrier, for example, to nitrogen, and then you produce ammonia. Uh, and uh, ammonia is, of course, uh, the major part of the fertilizer. Uh, and yeah, that's an existing uh, industry, also with shipping it around the world, which is much easier to transport hydrogen than, for example, to make it liquid. Or you bind it to another element, and uh, here you see toluene, then it is a liquid, and then you can reuse your normal oil tankers to transport it. But then, of course, you have to unbind it on the, the other end and to make uh, to yeah to get the hydrogen back. So for very large distances, and therefore hydrogen can become the commodity, uh, the zero carbon commodity in the future. And you can transport it by pipeline, or for very large distances by ship, and. So you can transport the cheap electricity produced by solar and wind, for example, around the world. Also for storage, you see that it is very easy to store in the same way as that we store natural gas in the underground. We can, for example, use salt caverns, the leftovers of the salt production, but you can create also salt caverns. Or in some cases, you can uh, 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 use empty gas fields to store uh, hydrogen. Looking to the cost again, uh, you see that the salt cavern can store about 6,000 tons or 240 gigawatt hours uh, of uh, hydrogen. And the salt cavern capex costs are only a half euro per kilowatt hour storage. Now, for comparison, if you have very cheap batteries, we are not there, uh, then the, the, the battery capex costs are 100 euros per kilowatt hour. So you see there is a large difference in cost uh, for storing energy uh, in large quantities. Uh, uh, it's uh, even almost impossible to do that for batteries for a longer time period. Also seasonal storage can be done 
in these salt caverns and empty gas fields. And that is why you want to convert electricity at the good resource uh, sites where it is low cost. And then you transport it by uh, via hydrogen and store it to bring it at the right time and the right place. And that's what we have experienced now in the world. In the past couple of years, uh, about 250 gigawatts, uh, over 250 gigawatt of uh, electrolyzer capacity projects are now uh, announced. Uh, the projects are in size uh, from a couple of gigawatts to uh, even 30, 40 gigawatts of, of capacity. So a very large scale, a very larger scale also than what we see, have experienced today in electricity production with solar and wind. And for example, this is a project in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. They are building there that new city, Neom, uh, and they are now installing two gigawatt of electrolyzers together with four gigawatt of uh, solar and wind. Um, and they produce in the end ammonia, which they sh ship to, yeah, for example, Europe to uh, use it, to crack it back and to use it as uh, hydrogen in uh, buses and trucks uh, for, for fueling them. So why hydrogen? That the first and almost important reason is, is and most important reason is to deliver cheap solar and wind uh, energy cost effectively at the right time and place. So that's transport and stor storage. And then of course, you can use it, uh, especially to decarbonize the hard to abate energy use, uh, which is not so easy to debate with other uh, energy carriers like uh, electricity. In industry, the feedstock, uh, heavy mobility for heating, but also for balancing the electricity uh, supply. But you have to be, why it will it become a commodity? In the end, you will have cost competition between locally produced hydrogen uh, with higher electricity cost, even with locally produced electricity and hydrogen that is imported from uh, yeah, places where the, uh, the cost for, uh, for solar and wind electricity production is much, uh, much lower. Now, okay, we can use hydrogen in the same way as that we can use gas or oil in every sector, energy sector, but also for the feedstock in the chemical sector, the petrochemical sector, we can uh, use hydrogen uh, for electricity production, for electricity balancing, you could say, in the transport sector, but also in the heating sector, as you see over here. Now, for mobility, uh, it is really that we want to go to uh, electric mobility. But there we think that it is battery electric, the only uh, uh, variation, but uh, where you store the electricity in the battery and you charge your battery. But you can do that also, of course, by uh, using a fuel cell that is producing from hydrogen electricity, and then you drive an electric engine to, uh, uh, to, uh, yeah, to drive the, the car or the truck or the bus or even a ship or a plane or whatever. And this is how it looks like. Uh, it is an electric engine, but the fuel cell is in the middle. And you see some uh, tanks where you store the hydrogen at the pressure of 700 bar and some batteries uh, to, to, to run it uh, smoothly. And also to, um, uh, this is the system that you see in a car or in a bus. But that's the first idea. And of course, this will be the end solution. But today we see that we can also blend in hydrogen in diesel engines. And we do that by injecting the hydrogen in the air inlet of a diesel engine. And even we can go uh, to uh, yeah, a combustion engines with, which use 100% uh, hydrogen in these combustion en engines. But here you see an example of an, a tractor from uh, New Holland, a company where, where you have an existing tractor, but you have an add-on where you inject the hydrogen into the air inlet of the diesel engine. And on top of the cabin, you see the, uh, another cabin where the, 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 the tanks of the hydrogen are uh, for storing about 11 to 12 kilos of, uh, of hydrogen in this case. Now, that's what you see uh, as an intermediate step by you can use hydrogen also in existing diesel engines to, uh, to store it. 
Okay, let me end by showing you some uh, some uh, some very advanced uh, examples. Here you see, for example, a fuel cell uh, a Hyundai uh, uh, truck, uh, uh, which drives uh, autonomously uh, uh, without any truck driver again, can drive around for a range of a thousand kilometers. And to show you the, the final one, uh, we see also in, uh, in, in a car racing, that hydrogen will, will, will be there. Uh, the 24 hours of Le Mans in 2024 will be the, the race on hydrogen uh, cars only. So you see the implementation of electric driving is there, not only with batteries, but also with hydrogen. And hydrogen can be also blended in the fuels that we have today, like in diesel, as an intermediate step to go to this electric driving. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor. That was a very interesting and a practical, diverse uh, analysis, giving us comparison of uh, various modes of energy and your very valid point that, yes, it's a carrier of energy and can be transported. That's what makes it fungible. Thank you very much. We we'll get back to you for questions if there are. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Anjan Ray. He's director CSIR at the Indian Institute of Petroleum, which is a CSIR run institution. Dr. Ray, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chairman, sir. <laughs> and um, uh, thanks to the speakers before me, because uh, the context that has been set by both uh, Professor Irene and Pr uh, Professor Van Wyck um, will be very useful in the few slides that I have next. I will be speaking on behalf of my colleagues across CSIR. We are a publicly funded uh, government autonomous body consisting of 37 laboratories across India and a scientific workforce of close to 14,000 people. Hydrogen is an area of great interest to us, and it is of great interest to India because India is a very significant energy importer and also a very significant uh, uh, committer for emission reductions in the energy transition between now and 2030. As it happens, we import close to 80% of our primary energy requirements, out of that, it turns out, if we do a little bit of atom counting, we import about 350 million tons of carbon atoms every year, mostly as petroleum and coal, but a bit as natural gas. And that import both carries with it an associated carbon footprint and an associated foreign exchange outflow. So if we are able in some way to transition to an economy that is dominated by non-carbon energy, or by domestic carbon energy, we make a significant dent in our sustainable development goal deliveries, as well as in our economic security. A lot of this is known to us because we are speaking in a hydrogen economy session, but I will still highlight a few points. One is that hydrogen does have, of all known substances, the highest energy per unit mass, not per unit volume, and we'll come to the implications of that. Uh, in a Vehicle, you have zero tailpipe emissions because hydrogen has no carbon-carbon bonds. The moment I have a carbon-carbon bond, I will produce at least carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and some particulate matter. So even if I go down to something that has carbon but no carbon-carbon bonds, for example, if I can use methanol as fuel, I will eliminate the particulate matter that plagues a lot of Indian cities, for those who are used to Indian cities, especially in winter. The other advantage of hydrogen is that it can use existing fossil fuel infrastructure to a significant extent, especially pipelines, and we will see that. The last two statements, which have been part of the hydrogen positioning, are the ones where we have to be a little bit more attentive in our due diligence. One, where we believe that it might decarbonize hard to electrify sectors, particularly long distance transport and heavy industries. And the second, where we believe hydrogen could replace fossil fuels as a zero carbon feedstock. 
Is hydrogen really zero carbon? We will come to those questions as we proceed. So first, uh, helicopter level or a stratospheric level look at where do we find the hydrogen that we will need? We will need a lot of hydrogen. To replace 350 million tons of carbon, we will require uh, almost a corresponding number of million tons of hydrogen. Uh, not all of it because it will be used directly, but because there are more losses when I use hydrogen instead of carbon. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. But when I come to the earth, it's not so easy. Pure hydrogen is not there in the atmosphere. It is always bound in the earth's crust. And while it is there in very significant quantities in the oceans, it is not there as free hydrogen. So I will always have to do something to get the hydrogen out of my very basic natural resources. The technology imperatives, which were hinted at by certainly by Professor Van Wyck, but also by Professor Irene, are that we will need a sustainable generation. It will have to be affordable. And both delivery and durability have to be kept in mind. It is exciting, but like all things exciting, the challenges must not be underestimated. That can actually lead us to false conclusions and delays. So we get to the basic question of how much of this energy that we need can we get stored in hydrogen? And immediately you see that unless I compress hydrogen and I compress it very significantly, the storage is a lot more challenging. And ammonia, for example, can actually store more. This compressed hydrogen at at least 250 bar, probably at 700 bar, is beginning in the range of what gasoline would be today. But on a volumetric, on a gravimetric basis, Hydrogen is already three, three and a half times that of gasoline. The issue is, can I make the hydrogen sufficiently compact at a sufficiently low cost at an adequate safety for automotive applications? So can I make the volume available for fuel tanks for hydrogen capable of holding that hydrogen by the right choice of materials of storage and the right... Uh, delivery systems. Similarly, for long distance transport, I can't just keep increasing the diameter of pipelines. So what can I do to ensure that the hydrogen moves effectively? This also gives some credence to approaches on on-site generation like liquid oxygen carriers and to hydrogen storage that can densify the hydrogen, for example, in metal organic frameworks. As of now, however, if I look at the mobility market, because that's the theme of this session, we can see that of the main mobility areas, high density, heavy vehicle trucking, aviation, rail, etc., the appetite is there, but the penetration is still lingering. And volumetric energy density being a challenge, a combination of high density storage and pressure or of onboard production with an FCB will continue to attract interest. A lower hanging fruit, which we haven't mentioned today, but I believe it will be there in the next session, is HCNG that is compressed natural gas with about 18% hydrogen injected. That's something that can be utilized immediately and can be encouraged right away, especially in economies like India, where production of bio-natural gas uh, is a relatively easy uh, mechanism and there are incentives available for this already. Do we here keep hearing the debate about electric vehicles? Should you have a battery electric vehicle or a FCB. Right now, question is not of an or, it's of an and. We need all these sustainable solutions we can get to decarbonize the economy. So where we look at all these possibilities, battery electric vehicles will allow fast decarbonization. It will also allow us to use hybrid power systems like the ones that were mentioned in the last talk. And these hybrid power systems will allow us renewable energy going into our electrical systems. Similarly for fuel cell vehicles, it is imperative that we use renewable energy as far as possible for hydrogen production. We will quickly see why. If we do not, then the notional gains of going to a clean fuel will be lost to the very real losses of an increased carbon footprint due to an unfavorable net energy ratio of hydrogen production and compression. Let's look at the economics first. 
the, on the total cost of ownership basis for a fuel cell electric bus, and these are real numbers done in the last year or so by one of our laboratories who is running an electric bus in partnership with KPIT in the city of Pune. And we can see that you're saving about 10% on the total cost of ownership compared to the IC engine bus. But a big chunk of this is the CapEx. And a big chunk of that CapEx is the fuel cell stack. So that is where a lot of the research must go. You have to keep maximizing the power density for the operating stack voltage that you require. And you cannot sacrifice the stack voltage because that will link directly to your bus performance. Now looking at the sustainability lens and doing the same maths, this analysis is done for four different cases of hydrogen. Um, assuming water electrolysis, um, assuming different levels of compression or on-site delivery. So the first one is compressed, transported through pipeline. The second one is compressed, transported through road. Third one is on-site. And the fourth one is liquefied hydrogen, which is then distributed. We've made a certain set of assumptions. Assumption D is particularly critical. We know that in solar cells, the low cost of solar is partly because we don't take end of life disposal and recycling energy costs into account. So the end of life impact on environment has not been accounted for. We must keep an eye on that as we grow the hydrogen economy. And if I convert what I had on the previous page into a diagram, you can see that the net energy ratio is actually quite unfavorable. So per unit energy use uh, from hydrogen, which is one, I might go all the way up to four in life cycle energy consumption uh, to deliver that one unit of hydrogen. So if this energy is all fossil energy, I have actually defeated the purpose. All or substantial part of my input energy in the hydrogen economy will have to be renewable. But I'm not saying it is desirable, it is imperative. It will have to be renewable. And that is why hybrid systems and electrolyzers that depend predominantly on renewable energy or on nuclear power will have to become the norm if I want to scale up the hydrogen economy. This is our hydrogen program across the value chain um, in CSIR. We look at every single piece because we know that there is a headwind both on cost and on sustainability. So with every single component in CSIR, as I said, a very large team of people across all our institutes, I will not read out all the acronyms, but you can see that whether it is various ways of generating hydrogen, storing the hydrogen or utilizing the hydrogen, we have research programs in every component. And we believe that these uh, multiple research programs will help us uh, eventually deliver green hydrogen or other shades of hydrogen economically and competitively um, the way India requires. In summary, what we have is a solution making great strides, but one that requires diligence. It's also one that will take time to scale up because we have such a humongous installed base and infrastructure already for our carbon fuels diet. There's no magic silver bullet. It won't be either fuel cell or battery or uh, hybrids or uh, HCNG. It'll have to be all of them because every available solution must be deployed. And more importantly, must have undistorted markets with technology neutrality so that the clear winners emerge economic and ecological parameters. We've already highlighted the importance of life cycle analysis and net energy ratio tools. The input energy streams will have to be renewable. And with regard to FCVs, in fact, for any part of the hydrogen value chain, we will need sustained and significant R&D investments to maximize the power density and the durability, the two areas on which I did not dwell too long today. With that, let me thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Professor Ray, for a very well-analyzed uh, talk. And I may request you here that being a trustee of the Lavraj Kumar Trust, I think we'll get you again to organize this session, kind of session, and we'll have perhaps the other members of the panel here, because online has become a very useful methodology and an affordable methodology for people and for scientists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our
Uh, next speaker for the day will be Professor Hirohisa Uchida. He's professor of the Tokai University and vice president of the International Association of Hydrogen, baden württemberg State, Germany. Thank you very much. So I share my figure. So my talk is going on, on the perspective of Japan's hydrogen energy and application of hydrogen storage alloys. Today, several themes also, uh, hydrogen storage, how we make. And main contents may, is uh, going like this. First, Japan's energy policy. And I tell you some typical active tackling on spreading hydrogen technology in Japan. And then I tell you uh, two typical applications of hydrogen storage alloys. Actually, this is an uh, application of waste heat. Not many people are thinking of waste heat. Waste heat, you can apply also hydrogen technology too. And also we applied waste heat in the, uh, this uh, technology to agriculture and also fish breed too. So uh, as many people know, uh, the hydrogen technology, if we say it's advancing hydrogen technology, mostly going on mobile technology. But uh, in Japan, more than 300,000 houses have uh, any farm. Uh, this is a heat pump system. Uh, we use a, a CD gas, and then we can use it for electricity generation and also heat. This is also quite interesting application of fuel cell. And the Toyota recently published uh, the internal combustion engine using hydrogen gas. This is called quite interesting things. And when I was in, seven, in Germany in 70s to 80s, the Daimler-Benz Mercedes used titanium ion and magnesium nickel hydrogen storage alloys for car, uh, right? Oh. And then uh, later, uh, BMW, they use uh, uh, liquid hydrogen in Munchen. Uh, you can see here, right? On the other hand, Matsuda, uh, they used uh, hydrogen water engine. Uh, this was also very quite interesting one. And in Japan, there's around so 160 to 170 uh, hydrogen store, uh, stations that must be go farther. And if we speak CO2, many people are speaking a negative side of CO2, but I should say CO2 is a very, very important element for our life. Without CO2, we cannot live because CO2 is needed for all plants and uh, other things. So you can see, because increasing CO2 in the air, the greening is advancing too. And in Japan, uh, we have a national project uh, utilizing CO2 uh, from uh, incinerator and the power plants uh, combined with the uh, hydrogen from uh, renewable energy. And we fall, uh, so uh, olefin and so on. And then we want to make a new mat organic material. And in Japan, we have no our own uh, hydrogen uh, system. Uh, I mean, uh, so pro hydrogen production system. Therefore, we are importing hydrogen from Brunei first uh, using uh, methyl cyclohexane, so liquid state. And another case is uh, liquefied uh, hydrogen from Australia. In this case, brown coal is a very important one for us. So now I come to the, today's main theme the hydrogen storage technology using hydrogen storage alloys. Hydrogen storage alloys, I'm, I've been already 40 years in this field and we can combine so different types of uh, alloys. And very typical case, I, I tell you. So A to B or AB5 or AB type, AB2 is a magnesium copper or magnesium nickel, or another one is natural nickel five or mission metal five uh, for nickel metal hydride battery, for example. This is, is, activation is very easy and cyclic stability is very high, but very expensive. <coughs> On the other hand, very cheap one is ion titanium. This, but this is very inexpensive, but activation is very, very uh, difficult. Then we uh, developed quite new technology. We uh, modify the surface or non-obstruct the surface. And this 
this, then this is a very nice effect. I show you that the data. So the typical case, this is hydrogen source alloys. If they absorb hydrogen, and this is exothermic reaction, and if they uh, release hydrogen, this is endothermic reaction. So you can cool surroundings. 1988, we demonstrated for the first time that we can use nickel metal hydride recharge battery. Uh, this alloy is very good as negative uh, electrode for battery. And Toyota adopted it, a nickel, nickel metal hydride battery for Toyota Prius. This is a hybrid car of time. Of course, nowadays you can see everywhere uh, this small size uh, nickel metal hydride battery. And the renewable energy is, of course, attracting very uh, interesting. But very important point is renewable energy is fluctuating. We have to store it. How? In many cases using battery, these chemical reactions. But another case is uh, uh, this uh, uh, electricity, using electricity, uh, we can decompose uh, water and uh, hydro, uh, ox ox oxygen, and we can store as hydrogen gas, high pressure or liquid state in a way. But I want to ex uh, suggest you using a metal hydride. This is very easy, and by that room temperature, uh, you can store hydrogen very high density, much higher than the liquid state. And 2070 World Economic Forum Davos Conference, they decided to store a larger a capacity, larger amount of hydrogen and longer time, uh, better to use uh, uh, such a metal hydride uh, instead of chemical battery. So more than 100 companies are participating in this. Um, Toshiba, this is a very typical Japanese uh, company. Uh, they have a very nice one, H21. Uh, if you apply electricity from renewable energy or anything, inside they have a small uh, water electricity uh, system and produced hydrogen is stored in a hydrogen storage alloys inside. And if needed, they release hydrogen and outside, people can get electricity and warm heat. And uh, the fundamental type is just uh, for supporting 300 people for a week. Why we make it is because every year we have a typhoon and the natural disasters and such system are very important for us. You can see, for example, this is a railway station. Another case is we can carry this system using a train or trucks. And in case of Kawasaki City, this is quite near to Yokohama and Tokyo, um, they have very nice view, but very big industry city. And this city, now we have a, a very new hotel. We call it Hydrogen Hotel. Why? You can see the, in the front of hotel, this is H21 system. So about five kilometers away, uh, there is a Showa Denko. Uh, they are producing uh, hydrogen from waste plastic. And then it was transported from 500 kilometers away here. And about 30% of all energy, electricity and the heat is supported by this uh, Toshiba system, H1. So plastic, waste plastic is a very big global problem now but we can apply this uh, waste uh, plastic for hydrogen production or ammonia production. Ammonia is also a very nice uh, carrier. And in a national project, we demonstrated and succeeded to produce a nanostructured iron titanium alloys. And this is a very nice reactivity and very cheap, about one third of conventional hydrogen storage alloys. And uh, one batch, you can produce 300 kilogram nanostructured hydrogen, uh, hydrogen storage alloys. This is fundamental data because of the time is limited. I don't come to details, but anyway, the reactivity is very high from the first uh, reaction. And also this is a typical uh, mixture of nanocrystal and amorphous phases. And I don't say details, but uh, for dissociation of a hydrogen molecule, uh, electron exchange is very important. And this nanostructure, this facility, this dissociation. And we published everything is here. Maybe you can refer it, please. 
Yes, and we are applying these uh, systems for many different types. And uh, for example, in uh, northern part of Tokyo, uh, one university, 40 kilowatt wind turbine and 10 kilowatt solar cells. And of course, this uh, renewable energy, this uh, uh, fluctuation is very big, but we tested throughout years and no problem. Input, fluctuating input, and then we can get a very constant output. And another case is, uh, of course, this hydrogen storage alloy is now is applied for uh, wind ship, uh, so ship propulsion by wind, Mitsui and so on. Okay, the next time, if we have, if we have a time, I tell you more. And the last 25 years long, I was involved in the application of metal hydride or hydrogen storage alloys for uh, strawberry agriculture and fish production. How? As I told you, hydrogen storage alloys react hydrogen. This is exothermic. It makes heat higher. Uh, on the other hand, the desorption make uh, endothermic reaction. If we combine these reactions, uh, we can really good apply. Okay, exothermic re reaction and thermic reaction. Actually, we prepare two different types of alloys, MA and MB. And I tell you, uh, if you have waste heat from incinerator and so on, then we uh, give this waste heat. And then from AH, metal hydride, we use hydrogen gas to B. This uh, alloy has no hydrogen inside. But then the, the hydride later, this is exothermic heat, but in this case, we don't use it. But later we release this hydrogen back again to the first hydrogen storage alloys. In this time, we apply uh, groundwater just uh, surrounding this uh, system. And by dissolving reaction, uh, the heat will be uh, take, take away and we can realize around, around so zero degrees, even a minus 30 degrees. This is a very nice system, they're very easy. For this, we use very special alloys, titanium, zirconium, chromium, iron, nickel, manganese, copper, and so on. And Japan steel works is, is very nice, this one. And first we established a minus 30 degrees uh, refrigerator, and then later, so it's cold water production we have, and we apply this cold water for hydrogen strawberry cultivation. Even summertime, higher, uh, high temperature area, you can uh, cultivate strawberry like this. On the other hand, if we have a, enough uh, cold water, about five degrees, we can uh, breed. So uh, fish, this was a very interesting one. And totally, because we use only waste heat, we can save energy and the CO2 reduction more than 80%. This is very effective. And now I'm concluding. Uh, hydrogen utilization technology is not limited to fuel cell, but extremely diverse. And waste heat from industrial sectors can be applied to produce freezer or cold water, actually for agriculture, fish breeding, for example. And waste heat utilization using hydrogen storage alloys has high energy saving and CO2 reduction effect. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, June uh, this year, uh, we uh, hold a 23rd Wild Hydrogen Energy Conference. And if you have time and chance, please come join us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Hirohisha. I don't think I let you go so easily. There are a few <laughs> questions I thought I'll put to you since you are uh, been putting across very uh, innovative ideas for hydrogen production. Uh, what is your uh, take on uh, generating hydrogen in seawater from offshore nuclear plants oh. mounted on ships? In this so case, before our supply, yeah. Of in this case, uh, how how do you produce hydrogen? It doesn't matter because we have two different types of hydrogen storage alloys, yeah. And the hydrogen gas is just moving between this uh, alloy A and B. If A dissolves hydrogen, this is endothermic reaction. You can get a very cold tank. 
On the other hand, other times because it becomes very hot. So if you change this reaction, so you can use heat transport actually by moving hydrogen. This is a trick, very interesting trick. And if you can, uh, if you apply uh, some uh, temperature uh, system, very simple one, very uh, simple one. So you can, uh, you, if you want to cool water or if you heat water, you can use as you like. Yeah. No, I, my question was slightly different. I was saying that if you were to use nuclear reactors located in the sea. Nuclear reactor, okay. Yes, presumably on ships. Okay. So that you have a 24 hour availability of energy rather than utilizing only wind energy, which you mm -hmm. are thinking of offshore hydrogen production. What would be the economics as uh, either you or Professor Anjan Ray thought of that possibility with modular reactors put across in the sea on Actually, yes. barge mounted reactors or ship mounted reactors, you might say, and they could be producing hydrogen round the clock because nuclear power flows uninterrupted. Actually, we don't use any nuclear power. This is just normal uh, uh, ship uh, moving uh, wind propulsion. But if wind is weak, so we can switch to fuel cell and we generate electricity and just normal electric motor is moving. And for this, we use metal hydride inside. Yeah, we don't okay. use any nuclear energy. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, between the panel, is there any inter -se questions or something? We can uh, easily have 10 minutes on that unless the audience wants to ask a question. But I think within the panel, maybe have five minutes. So uh, maybe questions within the panel to each other, being panelists. Professor Ray, would you like to? I was uh, particularly fascinated by the talks of both Professor Uchida and Professor Van Wyck. Um, you know, to build on what you asked, Chairman Sir, the, the idea of putting a nuclear reactor in the sea where you have an infinite source almost of uh, hydrogen atoms in water yes. is uh, per se interesting. The challenge would be evacuation. So, unless you have a really efficient storage, of hydrogen, you come back to the same issue of how do I move it back to shore? Uh, the, the challenge with all low density uh, energies is coupling the demand and the supply, even with conventional battery storage of, sol uh, of solar, that has been a challenge. So I think as we see the storage costs fall and the storage systems become more efficient, as Professor Uchida mentioned, for example, using methyl cyclohexane, organic hydride, those are relatively high density storage solutions. Once the storage cost comes down sufficiently and we can maintain sustainability, I do expect this kind of approach will scale up. And especially if you can produce, uh, you know, work with very small scale nuclear reactors or use the idling time of nuclear sub, something like that, that might be quite valuable. Uh, I you, would, see, uh, you see yeah. what uh, Professor Ray, what I had in mind was that it was very, ably put out that you see the gas pipelines can be used for uh, hydrogen transport quite effectively. Now you can just uh, connect pipelines under sea, mm -hmm. supplying these uh, gas from the ship, the mother source, yeah. from the electrolyzers onto the onshore, mm -hmm. to the demand points. And you don't have to run that far away and you see it's very rightly pointed out that you have to look into the oceans and certain belts of high uh, wind intensity. We have a technology with us and which can um, produce the constant energy. Yes, there is nothing cheaper than wind or solar, but then you have those devices. And if you are using solar cells, it was very ably brought out that the disposal, the full life cycle, something which I mentioned in the in the morning session also, 
the environmental impacts of the womb to tomb for any technology has to be kept in mind because i mean having worked in the nuclear sector also luckily besides petroleum and uh, power i know that uh, uh, nuclear waste was always an issue and of course the indian view is that there is nothing waste it's your lack of knowledge that you are treating it as waste it's your lack of the appropriate chemistry now looking at that way i thought you see that nuclear reactors ship mounted can't you use them for electrolysis round the clock yeah. i think this sorry different for, an idea whose time should come uh, <clears throat> yeah well yeah. So, uh, sorry yeah. for the wild yeah. cards but uh, uh, so I, I i think we have to explore all these uh, possibilities but uh, maybe i can show you a way that is now uh, 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 technology that is uh, studied and that is uh, providing also a base load uh, uh, power that is uh, this one i will share my screen and will show you a picture uh, of a kite system where you have a kite pulling a, a boat and that is producing electricity and you sail with this ship around the ocean at these areas where you have uh, high wind speeds so you have always wind and you uh, uh, convert the electricity to to hydrogen you store it and when the ship is full uh, the tanks are full then you go to the shore and you unload the, the hydrogen this is a, a really interesting uh, development which you see around uh, many universities but there is also a company a south african company now uh, uh, building this type of uh, ships uh, with these kites uh, and th this is uh, what you say you you need of course or storage or base load supply of uh, of uh, electricity in this case to uh, to make uh, hydrogen and make it also a valuable product uh, but there are many of these new developments that you see today uh, which are very promising uh, also in the cost of producing hydrogen uh, uh, and and of course nuclear is one of them too of course but uh, you see also in the renewable sites that we are now uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, this type of technology but also for example uh, uh, concentrating solar power systems at uh, the cost come down very rapidly there you can store the energy in in heat eh, in in, uh, in an oil tank and then you have a thermal cycle uh, or what we see also uh, which uh, professor low has already uh, uh, the photoelectrochemical uh, 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 production where you use the photon directly to split the water molecule yeah that is studied in uh, uh, and and uh, is now at the TRL levels of four or five at, uh, at at many universities technical universities around the world uh, but also there you already see some companies uh, for example the Spanish company Repsoil and uh, they announced that they will produce for about one one and a half euro the kilo uh, and put a plant uh, online in 2030 with this photolysis or photoelectrochemical uh, water splitting uh, technology. So uh, there is uh, a lot going on, and that was already said by Professor Ushida also. Uh, the, the, the technologies are not only fuel cells or electrolyzers, that is, of course, but many, many new technologies will come up also on the production side also on the storage and, uh, and, and transport side uh, and, and of course at, at the application side as you all also said uh, the fuel cells in houses or uh, other type of uh, technologies this is really an exciting time i have to say but the costs of production will come down also very rapidly in the, with these new technologies that's a very useful suggestion without sounding wicked I can say with global warming and rising ocean levels, more and more water is going to be available. So more and more hydrogen can be procured. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, 
Professor Irene Lowe, would you like to come in at this point? Well, um, I think you know, most of the speakers, I, I think it's really good job. And then I enjoyed too much about the, uh, the talk. And then now uh, regarding the production of the hydrogen, uh, although we know that electrolysis uh, is currently uh, mostly uh, presented by people, but actually uh, uh, we should consider more advanced system. Now our system, I must say, you know, you, you have to recognize that we, we use this uh, photo envelopes which absorb the sunlight. Sunlight is free, you don't have to pay. Right? Using the sunlight to generate the photon and then for the water speeding to, to produce hydrogen, that is the innovation part. So if you use electrolysis process, it still need electricity to initiate the process. That means uh, it has the energy consumption behind before producing hydrogen. So at the end, at the end, whether, whether uh, it is uh, in terms of the life cycle assessment, whether it really reduce uh, the hydrogen uh, emission or how much, no, sorry, uh, how much carbon reduction is, uh, is, is, is done or in terms of the carbon emission or uh, it, it actually uh, uh, generate uh, some kind of uh, uh, greenhouse gases I don't, I don't know, but then we have to do some kind of life cycle assessment, right, to see, right? Uh, but then for the technology, we, 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 we develop in our, in our teams, and then we can see the potential is that because uh, uh, it, it uses sunlight in, uh, rather than using uh, the uh, electricity in order to produce hydrogen. That is the comment I would like to say. Thank you. I think... Uh... You see, the point is very well made in the morning session while uh, inaugurating this event. I had mentioned this very point that I think we've got to develop some global standards for assessing the life cycle emissions or environmental damage of any uh, source of energy production that we are talking about. And uh, there has to be an acceptable international scientific standard for uh, assessing the life cycle environmental costs mm -hmm. of any particular technology. And I would strongly urge the scientific community to try and stoke that debate so that we arrive at some international acceptable standards and are able to assess the realistic environmental impact from virtually, as they say, from womb to tomb, right from extracting a mineral to its final deployment, disposal, or an element, let me put it that way. And there you try and assess or give it a rating of what is its environmental cost. Uh, sorry for putting that uh, idea across but I thought I'd put it across in the morning and I'm quite serious about it because that would be, in my view, an agnostic, equitable assessment of the relative environmental impact of the various technologies that are being talked about. Well, thank you very much. I think if the audience has any question or the participants, we still have four minutes to go, I think. It's been an extremely stimulating session, and we only hope that we can get the group together maybe on another occasion very soon, and maybe having a round table on the subject itself. Well, Professor, Ray, why don't you initiate it? And we can do it for the Lavraj Kumar Trust. I offer that forum because that would be a real tribute to the chemical engineering technology because I believe that the coming times is the era of the chemical engineer and the chemist. Thank you. I will take this up. Thank you. I must thank... <laughs> all the eminent speakers. 
for their very interesting uh, thoughts and excellent uh, analyses. I'm really grateful to all of them. I felt extremely enriched by this discussion. Thank you very much. And I hope all of you enjoyed it. And let's hope we can meet together again soon. Thank you Thank very, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone, to all the speakers. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Rajdan, sir, for uh, chairing this session and concluding it, uh, 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 especially on a very happy note on uh, new solutions as well. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers. And I'd like to also mention that uh, uh, all of you can also visit the virtual platform. Uh, it has all the information regarding uh, the summit and uh, also about all the speakers. Uh, so I'd request you, all of you, to please also visit uh, the virtual uh, 3D platform that has been made. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank uh, all of you. It was wonderful having you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure listening to all of you. Thank you so much, Raz Dansa. And uh, we have another very interesting uh, plenary session that is going to come up in uh, about half an hour from now. And that will focus on hydrogen for green energy transition. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen. It was a pleasure having all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rajdan, sir. Thank you, mm. thank you, Raj thank thank you, you Raj sir, for very ably chairing the session. And thank you, all the eminent speakers, for giving their views their discussion and focus points for hydrogen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Must be night in Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
गुड इवनिंग मिस्टर चंद्रशेखर जी प्लीज अनम्यूट ओके ओके या गुड इवनिंग यू आर फाइन एंड यू हैव अ प्रेजेंटेशन yeah i have a presentation uh, which i am just finalizing it will be through in next 10 minutes okay. so i'll show that presentation not a problem okay fine fine yeah okay and session will start sharp 6 okay okay thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. bye thank you
Hello? Hello? Hello, Dr. Panamalu. Yes, please. Hello. Hello, Dr. Panamalu. Hello, Uh, Puneet, uh, is is my video visible? Yes, your video is visible. Achha. Okay. I mean, you can see me on the screen, right? Because I am unable to see myself. No, you are visible. Achha. Okay. Good evening, Dr. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Puneet. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes it's fine. fine. It's okay, fine. thank you. Thank you. Puneet? Thank you. 
Can you hear me now? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Yeah, it's good good evening. Uh, we can hear you, sir. We can hear you. Good. Uh, Anil, are, sir, are, are you, you able there? to hear me, Ashwarya? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So, hi, Ashwarya, welcome you all uh, to the plenary session seven. And uh, this is going to be a very interesting session because this is going to talk about hydrogen for green energy transition. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Anil Garg, who is going to be moderating the session. He's the CEO of the Energy and the Environment Foundation. He is going to chair the event. Dr. Dr. Garg, are you there? 
Okay, uh, I guess Anil sir is going to join us soon. He is going to be chairing this session. Uh, meanwhile, I'd extend my very warm welcome on the behalf of Energy and Environment Foundation to the plenary session seven. And uh, I'd uh, welcome all of you, Dr. John W. Sheffield, Professor of Engineering Technology, Purdue University, and the President of the International Association for Hydrogen Energy, United States of America, joining us. Um, very, good e very good evening, Dr. John. We also have Dr. Eric Steen, CEO, LIGOS USA, joining us. And uh, we have uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar Chincholkar, Strategic Advisor, Electric Mobility and Clean Tech, KPIT Technologies Limited. Dr. Prashant uh, N. Kumta, Edward R. Uh, Wielding Indoor Chair Professor, Department of Bioengineering, Chemical and Petroleum Engineering, University of Pittsburgh, USA. Very warm welcome to you as well, sir. And Mr. T.S. Venkata Raman, Chairman and Managing Director, Eswin Advanced Technologies Limited. Very warm welcome to you as sir. And Dr. T. Parvatalu, Domain Expert, Hydrogen Program, ONGC Energy Center. So a very um, eminent uh, uh, speakers uh, we have in this particular session. Dr. Garg, very good evening. Uh, Dr. Garg, uh, uh, you're going to chair the session yeah. and uh, without uh, any further ado, I'd request you to please uh, start the session because we have all the speakers who have already joined in. Over to you, Anil, Anil sir. Thank you, Ashwarya. And welcome to all the eminent panelists, plenary and speakers of this session, which is very, very important from the economic point of view, from the environment point of view, and from energy point of view. This means hydrogen for green energy transition. You know that hydrogen is a cleanest fuel on the earth. And it can be produced by various means, blue hydrogen to green hydrogen like that, or through direct electrolysis of water with the help of various catalysts. So this green hydrogen, which is light in weight, is used for shipping, for airways and also for the trains, apart from light vehicles. I'm talking of heavy vehicles and that's why it is very, very important commercially. I will request, first of all, Dr. Parvatalu to address the gathering. I have started from the bottom. So Dr. Parvat Parvatalu, please. Thank you. Thank you, Gertsa. Uh, just let me share my presentation. Hello? No, oh, actually, I have to. Yeah, if you have time, then uh, I will ask Ashwarya Puneet just to have the video presentation of Dr. Sheffield. Sure, so I'll ask uh, Puneet sir to get yeah. this started. Yeah. Okay, we have presentation uh, uh, of Dr. Dr. Sheffield. Yeah. Please continue. No, just uh, 
<clears throat> no, just I'm. I wanted to share my presentation. Okay, after some time, Dr. Parvatulu. After some time, first. Oh, uh, no, no Thank you. Yeah. Puneet, voice is not coming. Puneet? Yes, yes sir. Just the voice is not coming. Hello. Uh, my name is John W. Sheffield, and I'm a professor at Purdue University. And the title of this presentation is Global Hydrogen Energy Update. My career in hydrogen energy began in 1976 when working for Pratt & Whitney Aircraft in West Palm Beach, Florida. Specifically, we were developing the technologies for high power, continuous wave, hydrogen fluoride and deuterium fluoride chemical lasers. Later working uh, at the University of Miami and California Institute of Technology, Missouri University of Science and Technology, and now at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. I serve as the president of the International Association for Hydrogen Energy, and I've served as an editor of the International Journal of Hydrogen Energy since 1978. I'm excited to share with you some of my personal insights on a global update on hydrogen energy. Why hydrogen, one might ask. Well, hydrogen offers a unique cross-system opportunity for fundamental changes in the energy industry. What are the three key objectives for global focus on the progress, prospects, and markets of hydrogen energy technologies? Change in mindset, because the global shift in the mindset of regulators, investors, consumers towards the decarbonization, hydrogen projects are receiving unprecedented investments. Second, the total cost of ownership analysis. The total cost of ownership analysis shows cost competitiveness of large scale applications of hydrogen energy technologies. And finally, three, gigawatt scale with correct regulatory framework. At scale, deployment of renewable hydrogen will require the development of gigawatt scale hydrogen uh, production projects, for example, permitting an overbuilding of renewable energy supply with green hydrogen production capacity via the water electrolysis. The International Journal of Hydrogen Energy is published by Elsevier and is our official journal of the International Association for Hydrogen Energy and was established in 1976. I joined two years later as the first assistant editor. Four years later, it became monthly, bi-weekly in 2008 and weekly in 2015. And by 2021, we published 80 issues. In fact, we published 40,312 pages in those 40 issues in the year 2021. The journal metrics provide valuable insights in three aspects of the journal, impact, speed, and reach. I'll look at the first two of those, impact and speed. Uh, these metrics help authors select the best journal for the publication of their research findings. For example, this graph shows that we've improved the impact factor over the last five years, achieving a value of 5.816 by the year 2020. The review speed is very important in getting the information. We track two different time periods. One is a time period in green shown here, is the time between the date of submission and the date of the first decision. The second time is the time period between the date of submission and the date of the final decision. As we see here by 2020, we achieved a response time a submit date to, uh, from submission to the date of the first decision of less than six weeks. And uh, likewise, in 2020, we were able to drop the time between the date of submission and the final decision on the average of less than nine weeks. Now, I'd like to introduce about the Hydrogen Council it is a global CEO-led initiative of leading companies with a united vision, a long-term ambition 
for hydrogen to foster clean energy transition for a better, more resilient future, using its global reach to promote collaboration between governments, industry, and investors. The Hydrogen Council uh, provides guidance on accelerating the deployment of hydrogen solutions around the world. It also acts as a business marketplace, bringing together a diverse group of 120 uh, companies uh, based in more than 20 countries across the entire hydrogen value chain, including our large multinationals, innovative small and mid-sized companies, and others. Re at the recent COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland, the CEO-led coalition uh, conveyed that hydrogen uh, to contribute to over 20% of the global carbon abatement by 2050, a strong public-private collaboration required to make a reality. Here shows some of the uh, major players in the Hydrogen Council, starting up at the top left is 3M and going on down through both large multinationals and uh, small innovative. For example, uh, we see their um, uh, Indian oil. Now, one of the reports that was recently uh, released on the public uh, policy uh, toolbox for uh, low carbon and renewable hydrogen and green hydrogen is this report. And I'd like to share some of the insights of that policy toolbox. And there's six pillars of efficient policy design for the low carbon and renewable hydrogen. First, to make use of local strengths and benefits from cross-border collaborations. Two, to create certainty through targets and commitments. Three, provide hydrogen-specific uh, support across the value chain. And four, support robust carbon pricing. Five, adopt harmonized certification schemes. And finally, factor in societal values and values. In the uh, policy toolbox, there's a chart that looks at the deployment and finance barriers are concentrated in the first two market uh, maturity phases. Shown across horizontally is the time or maturity, the market creation, followed by the market growth, and finally market um, maturity. Under the uh, vertical column of the hydrogen value chain, we see enabling policies as part of this toolbox. For example, in the market creation, we see limited research, development, and demonstration and deployment specific fundings. Continue down the hydrogen chain, we see A, the upstream uh, supply. In the market uh, uh, maturity, we would see in the upstream supply that we might have unstable network and supply including insufficient access to renewable energy and carbon capture and storage technologies. On the hydrogen chain, we see B and C here, the midstream transmission, distribution, and storage infrastructure, and C, the downstream demand. For example, in the market uh, maturity under B, the midstream transmission, distribution, and storage infrastructure, we see the lack of reliable infrastructure, uh, the last mile of distribution infrastructure, and the lack of monetization of the flexibility, buffering of the storage that hydrogen will provide to the energy systems. In the downstream, we might see in the uh, market creation to look into existing assets that do not use hydrogen and so on. So now let's look at the electrolyzer capex, the capital expenditures, and demand by sector in terms of US dollars per kilowatt, referenced here, uh, reference two. So here we see, uh, for example, uh, at the um, uh, hydrogen deployment of ammonia and refinery, and the next uh, tag is the road transport, steel, and methanol. The next is power, maritime, and aviation. So we know that the scale up of the gigawatt electrolyzer and the capital expenditure and demand by sector are critical into meeting uh, our uh, goals. So, what is our goal? Well, hydrogen for net zero, net zero emissions by 2050. 
This report was prepared by uh, the Hydrogen Council in uh, support by McKinsey and Company. Hydrogen has a central role in helping the world reach net zero emissions by 2050 and to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Complementing renewable energy technologies, enhanced energy efficiency improvements, clean hydrogen offers the only long-term uh, long scalable cost-effective option for deep decarbonizing in sectors such as steel, maritime, aviation, and ammonia. Again, complementing renewable energy technologies and enhanced energy efficiency improvements, clean hydrogen offers the only long-term scalable cost-effective solution uh, for deep decarbonizations in sectors such as steel, maritime, aviation, and ammonia. Very important point. Scaling through 2030 is critical for meeting the long-term target, say, of net zero by 2050, unlocking cost efficiency decarbonization uh, opportunities. So 2030 is the inflection point, the most important aspect that we need to face in the reality of achieving net zero by 2050. Setting our energy systems on a trajectory to net zero by 2050 requires firm commitment and rapid acceleration. It is estimated the deployment of 75 million metric tons of clean hydrogen is needed by 2030, an ambitious yet achievable target. This is from the, uh, the report that uh, we see here, hydrogen for net zero. What else? Well, a strong momentum, but there exists a $540 billion capital uh, gap that remains until that inflection point of 2030. The hydrogen energy shows strong momentum around the globe with more than uh, 520 projects. We'll actually look at in a few slides later, the 522 projects announced in 2021, up 100% compared to 2020. These projects will produce 18 million metric tons of clean hydrogen supply, infrastructure, and in use. Now, later we will look at that with three aspects, the supply, infrastructure, and in use. Considering investments to achieve government targets and support equipment value chains, the total sum estimate uh, will grow to more than 600 billion US dollars by 2030. 2030 again is that inflection point if we're to reach the net zero by 20, net zero by 2050. How do we frame hydrogen for net zero? Well, we uh, do that by looking at the developing this ambitious yet realistic plan for net zero by 2050. We have current trajectories. We have hydrogen for net zero and net zero unconstrained. Those we are convey to you are these uh, steps. Now let's look at the global demand by segment until 2050. 2020, we see the uh, light blue, the existing industry. As we head out to 2030 at the inflection point, we see that the that uh, existing industry has grown. And in uh, small amounts, we see the black, uh, the power generation, mobility, uh, building an industry heat, and even the new industry feedstocks. By 2040, we see a dramatic growth in mobility. We see a, a significant increase in the building and industry heat. And likewise, we see a noticeable amount of new industry development. And to some extent, we see power generation. And going on to 2050, we see the power generation has grown, mobility continues to dominate, and the uh, building and in, 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 uh, industry heat is uh, playing a significant role, and the new industry as well. So let's see what we might have. Now, before we do that, uh, we, we think of what clean hydrogen is, either renewable or low carbon hydrogen. In reality, the clean hydrogen should be changed to green hydrogen. The clean hydrogen with low carbon is really not a solution. It is not a solution. Renewable hydrogen is produced from electrolysis from excess renewable electricity. The low carbon production is from the fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage. We know that that's a, a limited and maybe not even a short-term solution. Now let's look at the sector coupling. 
hydrogen pathways in the energy system as these transitions. If we start out with the green hydrogen production from a, a renewable electricity and water, and we use that electrolysis process and we can store the hydrogen, store the hydrogen, very critical part. We can then use that uh, energy directly for fuel, for ground mobility, for synth uh, fuels, for aviation, when hydrogen is not the solution, and we can go through and use for heating. We can also use hydrogen directly for power generation, uh, and those then feed into uh, end use. If, on the other hand, we have some uh, non-green hydrogen coming in as a uh, uh, methanol or biogas and it goes through the, the carbon capture and storage and uh, we have the hydrogen produced and maybe those uh, lines should uh, indicate these would be used in the hard to meet in terms of uh, uh, ammonia, iron and refining industries and from the say ammonia to fertilizers. Now let's look at cross the demand by region in the world. In the North America, we see the transition from 2030 to 2050 with a dramatic increase in the uh, darker blue mobility. Likewise, we see heating both in, in, uh, in industrial heat, uh, process heat, and in Europe, we have a very similar demand, maybe starting with a smaller amount in 2030 at the inflection point. China, on the other hand, a bigger market, uh, exceeds uh, by 2050 both the combination of uh, summation of Europe and North America. Its uh, large amount in mobility is there, but uh, significant is also their power. Uh, but heating uh, and new industry is uh, well. Now, in Japan and Korea, more like island nations or peninsula nations, their growth uh, out to 2050 is seen where the power of uh, uh, use of hydrogen is becoming the dominant. Now let's look at uh, the rest of the world. Well, the rest of the world has similar characteristics uh, in terms of power, mobility, heat, and new industry, as well as the uh, existing industry. At that inflection point. We start out in 2020 and go to 2030, we see the inflection point where uh, the gray and blue, low carbon and green, green hydrogen from renew electrolysis from excess renewable electricity. What we need is actually to have the green become uh, the dominant part, not the blue. So there is some uh, concern here with this inflection point, because as we extrapolate on out to try to achieve the net zero, <coughs> yes, we diminish the gray hydrogen. However, we still have this uh, low carbon, the so-called clean hydrogen, so-called. Instead, what we need is the green hydrogen to grow at a larger. So we do see a, a, a shadow effect here. Um, what we'd like to have is the growth of the blue hydrogen uh, uh, controlled. So we do reach true uh, net zero uh, by our desired target of 2050 or earlier. So what are the hydrogen project announcement? We mentioned earlier it was over 520 worldwide. Out of those, we have 43 at the gigawatt scale, 200. 21 a large-scale industrial use, 133 in transport, 74 in integrated, and we see 51 others. Now, the important ones at that gigawatt scale, the 43. Now, look at those 43 where they're distributed. We might recognize that we see three out of the 43 in the country of Chile. Why Chile? Well, Chile is a major mining uh, uh, industry and in particular open pit surface mines that use large uh, haul trucks that carry up to 400 metric tons per truck. And these trucks, <clears throat> we see that that is the break-even from the total cost of ownership, the break-even from total cost of ownership, probably within the next five years. We have projects and companies that already are committed to converting 100% of the diesel internal combustion engines to hydrogen fuel cell and the hydrogen being green hydrogen from renewable. So there's players there. If we look across the, the, the dark blue and the 21, we see those uh, somewhat more distributed. And if we look at the total number of 
522, 261 in Europe, 121 in Asia, 67 in North America, and 43 in Oceania, 10 in Latin America, and 20 in the Middle East and Africa. Now, uh, this should be a wake-up call from India. This should be the wake-up call from India. Those projects need to get on the books and, 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 and the, in line. So where's the investment gap in the hydrogen value chain? Announced and required uh, direct investments to, into the hydrogen uh, until 2030. So the gap is uh, is 540. Uh, that's distributed among the production, transmission, distribution, and in use. We mentioned that earlier in terms of the three components. While the production is that gigawatt scale projects, we still need that gap in the transmission, distribution, and in use. How uh, must hydrogen be unlocked and scaled? Well, we think of uh, in, in three aspects that are connect, interconnected. We create a demand incentivize decarbonization through clean hydrogen. Should be. Scratch the clean, make it green. Now we also have low cost um, uh, to consider. How do we lower the cost? Create economies to, of scale to reduce the cost and open new markets. Now the cost we should be thinking about in total of total cost of ownership, not just the CapEx to ensure access to make hydrogen accessible through the right infrastructure. You remember on the previous gap, the transmission distribution is a major, major component in the gap. So these three play into each other. So with that, I thank you very much and I wish you all the best in this wonderful conference. My coordinates here, my name is John W. Sheffield, Professor of Engineering Technology at Purdue University. My email is jsheffy at purdueuniversity.edu. Also serving as President of the International Association for Hydrogen Energy, Senior Associate Editor for the International Journal of Hydrogen Energy. Thank you once again. Uh, don't hesitate to contact me about the presentation or about the association or the journal. Thank you. So, Mr. Dr. D. Parvat Talau? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, kindly address. Yeah, I, I'll, uh, I'll share my presentation. Is it visible now? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, is it in the, uh, the presentation mode, no? No, it's not. No, I have done it from my side. Okay. So please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Gert Sir, actually, for giving me an opportunity to talk uh, in this uh, uh, forum on uh, green hydrogen development initiatives at uh, ONGC Energy Center. I'm going to talk today. And then, uh, as we all know, that uh, there's a lot of thrust is given on for uh, green hydrogen. So in the coming years, at least by 2030 onwards, actually it will be momentum is going to pick up. Actually, as Dr. Sheffield has already said that by 2050, it is going to be this thing in India also has announced something of 2070 will be getting more and more of hydrogen in this uh, thing. So next, uh, let me briefly tell you about, uh, <clears throat> for, for some of the people who are not aware of ONG Energy Center, this, is, this ONGC Energy Center Trust has been started sometime during 2005 and we, have, we are doing some collaborative work, collaborative R&D projects and all. And uh, some of the things in 2007 onwards. So then these are the key areas of uh, our activities, research, development and demonstration projects which are taken. Green hydrogen is one of our uh, topmost priorities. And then solar thermal, biotechnology, uranium, helium and geothermal, so many other things and so on and so forth. And hydrogen has relation with so many kinds of uh, these, these activities. So what I wanted to talk about uh, today, about some of the 
hydrogen activity is uh, green hydrogen we are largely we are working on uh, thermochemical hydrogen generation projects and then related activities uh, like uh, high temperature electrolysis and then some sea water electrolysis and all we recently started some kind of activities on this but purely it is an indigenous development that is our main thrust area uh, in conjunction with uh, solar or nuclear so uh, already several people have been uh, talking about this thing hydrogen is the uh, as the theme implies that uh, green hydrogen for energy transition secondly see uh, it is obviously it goes without say that uh, hydrogen will be the bridging the gap between what is the fossil fuel uh, based in today's economy to tomorrow's green and clean green and green hydrogen tomorrow so that's why just uh, the during and beyond transitions actually there are several activities which are going on in several kinds of hydrogen production activities which are going on that is the kind of uh, so the thrust which is going on so hydrogen can be produced by several things like uh, uh, renewables or uh, non renewable sources like uh, fossil fuels and all already it is going on refineries and all right now 97 to 97% of uh, today's hydrogen needs by refineries and uh, fertilizers are produced uh, by fossil fuels only but tomorrow it will be transmitted to translated into renewables that is the thing which is going on so ultimately this hydrogen this is an energy carrier it has to be produced by some means so that either it is renewables or non renewable during transition or beyond transition ultimately the hydrogen which is produced it has n number of applications and uh, things like as you can see the doi report and all so it can be used for vehicles and uh, it can be in conjunction with co2 it can be synthetic fuels and for that circular circular economy and all things can be going on it can be transported using the ammonia for fertilizers and things like so these are some of the things like uh, uh, about this thing so if you see the thing about uh, uh, green hydrogen where we stand normally we start with uh, rich carbon sources like gray hydrogen to ultimately to brown hydrogen and then blue hydrogen and then ultimately green hydrogen is our net zero carbon emissions by 2050 that is what is told the already brown hydrogen is in as far as affordability and all things are concerned it is matching with green hydrogen that is what has been said commercially proven like and blue hydrogen is coming up in a big way green hydrogen is rightly right now it is very costly and it by 2030 and all leveraged costs will be slightly going down so when we start talking about uh, global hydrogen development programs we start seeing that uh, several technologies are going on in different uh, lab scale to bench scale to pilot scale and ultimately commercial scales and then what is affordable and are what are commercially proven technologies are there so as i was telling about uh, the previous slide then you see that the green technology today's green technology by largely everyone talks about green hydrogen it is only just by electrolysis by several kinds of pm electrolysis or alkyl electrolysis or chloralkyl electrolysis that is chloralkyl by product either this or this thing commercially these are all proven like so but smr process and all and coal gas application and all several technologies the one which i am going to talk today also they are in the research stage and the beauty of this particular thing this chemi chemi any energy initiate what i been i have brought down i have brought from there the thing is that uh, most of the technologies the the point is that uh, when you are going to pilot scale and when you want to do there is a valley of death valley of death in the sense that uh, the investment costs are very high so obviously future planners and all when we are talking about even government of india has been supporting lot and these things actually very heavy investments are envisaged in the near near, near term by 2030 and all also so to translate lab work to bench scale and pilot scale and then finally reaching the affordable and then large scale efficient uh, hydrogen generation technologies so something about this thermochemical hydrogen generation production and all if you start seeing that sometime you in 2025 2030 that is they are all planned in large scale so large scale productions will be obviously yielding the affordable hydrogen generation productions 
So obviously, when I start talking about uh, green hydrogen, then it has to come from water from tomorrow's uh, for affordable technologies, and then either by electrolysis or by thermal means. So right now we are uh, mostly concerned with the people are talking more and more green hydrogen means everybody talks about electrical way of generating hydrogen, but tomorrow's energy needs are not going to be satisfied with electrolysis alone. You have to convert to by any kind of thing, solar PV, solar electricity, or even hydropower and all the things. You generate electricity and convert to hydrogen. It has got its own limitations. The efficiency factors and so many affordability things will be coming out. Already we are uh, trying that right now it is around $8 to $9 uh, per kilogram of hydrogen. That, will, that has to be brought down to $2 per kg. So thermolysis by solar thermal or nuclear thermal using excess heat, that is what is the thing that is going to be the future. I'm going to talk about those technologies that I'm going to talk about. Essentially, when we start talking about uh, thermochemical hydrogen generation technologies, it is just input is water and then excess heat, whatever that is available heat is there, large amount of quality heat and set of chemical reactions, coupled chemical reactions will be taking place to produce hydrogen and oxygen and the uh, ultimately the formation of hydrogen, this quality heat why I was talking about is it needs around 286 kilojoules per mole, even 3000 degree centigrade equivalent like or 236 uh, kilojoules per mole of electrical energy like, the Gibbs energy like. So when we start talking about that quantity, uh, uh, type of uh, quality heat that we want, ultimately you have to make use of nuclear or solar energy in future. That is the reason actually the thrust of this thermochemical hydrogen generation in an efficient way, then you have to produce these are the things like that. Either in fuel cell mode or this thing, this water is a very beautiful uh, uh, molecule that you can as well, uh, okay, it doesn't require any kind of uh, carbon emissions and all. So globally, when we start talking about, normally we, we see that uh, copper chlorine hydrogen cycle that is 550 degrees centigrade that works medium temperatures and then you will be finding iron sulfur cycle recent uh, uh, offshoot of this iron sulfur cycle we are we are developing in collaboration with uh, iip dehradun uh, csir iip dehradun that is iron sulfur cycle open loop so when we start thinking about this thing i'll briefly tell you later on but the thing is that pioneers in this uh, area copper chlorine cycle is usa canada combined a uh, Arizona National Laboratories has started with gas technology in shoot initially in 2003 and then finally they have come to some kind of 55 cubic meters per hour demonstration work is going on at UIT Canada now with some kind of thing and we have a variant of this copper chlorine cycle we have developed and it is patented and then it is right now we are at uh, some lab scale lab engineering scale and we are planning to go for very soon 350 cubic meter per day in our own premises very soon, within one or two years gap. And then we are working on this uh, iron sulfur cycle globally. It is Japan is leading in this. And then uh, USA, China, Korea, Europe, largely the work which has been started in iron sulfur cycle is basically from nuclear groups, basically, because of their, their own, even in India, compact high temperature reactors or helium gas cooled reactors, tomorrow's technologies, they they will be able to provide you the required 900 degree centigrade quality heat. That is the thing that what the planners have been doing, including PRC and ONG Center Center. I've been doing. We are working in, in collaboration with IIT Delhi. And in the, as I already said, that this open loop is a concept which has been introduced to make use of large quantities of HTS that is available at refineries. That is otherwise it is going to sulfur route now. We want to make use of it in future so that we'll be producing sulfuric acid that can be marketed and that will be utilized also internally for the refinery for uh, alkali plants and all. So when we start talking about this kind of technologies, the thing is that the efficiencies are the goals for this thing, affordability or even conversion efficiencies and all. The efficiencies of these thermochemical cycles are obviously they are 50 to 60. That makes the point that uh, when we want to develop this kind of technologies in near future using solar thermal and all. 
so the the other kinds of things the alkaline work like water electrolysis or even so solid uh, um, polymeric exchange uh, membranes and all kinds of things so these things their their efficiencies are somewhere around 30 and all proven commercially proven electrolysis rules and then future the matching with high temperature electrolysis of 50 to 60 degree centigrade line so to tell about our own program as i said in the beginning that we are working in three different cycles so right now the proof of concept of all these three different types of groups have been done and by 2025 we wanted to go for some kind of pilot scale demonstrations as i said that dio and all we are on par with any kind of uh, international agencies now well, as a means of uh, this kind of technology development or large scale hydrogen generation using thermochemical water splitting in an efficient way in an indigenous uh, with totally indigenous thing our main thrust is atmanirbhar bharat uh, like so several supporting technologies and all the things are getting done so i cycle program started sometime during 2007 uh, year 8 and this one i started sometime during 7 but now we are at pilot scale and pilot scale demonstrations are going to be pilot scale we are inching towards that so 12 metric per year that is our main target there in case of ice cycle we wanted to go for this thing alternative means i said that we have already initiated some kind of work with this uh, um, alternative high temperature electrolysis and sea water electrolysis and all apart from this we have started parallelly this hydrogen storage using colloidal gas afrons so that has given some at some 80 bar pressure it is giving some very good uh, uh, storage capacity of 8% uh, storage capacity in terms of weight and then fuel cell applications we have some kind of joint some new national level consortium with arca ccra and all and several other supporting systems that we are developing is that corrosion test facilities standards development and moc for reactors and all the things like molten salt systems for solar thermal storage all the things and many of them are patented now even especially this uh, nafian equivalent membrane that has been developed recently and it is going to be commercialized soon with some kind of indigenous fabricators and manufacturers so this is the kind of activity that is going on and we are fortunately we got very good uh, things in all the systems like so see obviously when i am talking about indigenous development and technology development it cannot go in isolation when i am talking about the energy source then we have to see plan about my water systems for large scale water needs we are going to treat our own effluent water that is produced in lary for every barrel we are going to we are producing around one th- uh, three times of water that water will be used for this kind of hydrogen generation or in industrial scale and then backup studies for redox flow batteries and graphene oxide super capacitors etc are developed and then co2 utilization and valorization for circular economy which is we are working in that so this is the concept to commercialization plant that is going on in hydrogen uh, program in this thing we collaborate and then we are going in a collaborative consortium Dr. hello hello uh, kindly, kindly take 2 minutes and finish please yeah 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 just i'm going to finish that this thing so the, this is the kind of thing that is what i already said about this membranes pilot scale demonstrations and all the things are going on ecosystems and then ultimately when we are going to go for this kind of green technology development then we want to go for solar thermal so energy storage and water splitting technology it should be in conjunction with that and ultimately this waste biomass and all this hydrogen oxygen will be used for that hydrogen will be going for these bold things so this is the glimpse of uh, various kinds of uh, uh, milestones that we have achieved that's what i was telling already so by the 2022 this project ucl project is coming up at uh, our own uh, institute at epson goa and remaining all our uh, things are at different stages stage of this thing game open loop we are going to do at uh, mrpl um, uh, mrpl refinery like that i think all the things are going on and uh, we are at trl 4 5 level now and we are going to aim at 2009 by 2025 we have wanted to go for trl 9 thank you very much for your uh, kind attention and uh, i am through now thank you sir thank you dr balvatalu for nice presentation now i will request dr venkat dr venkat are you there
Dr. Venkat? Yes, very much there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I don't know whether you can see me in the screen. I'm not able to see the full screen. I can see only a box. Okay. Is that good enough? That's good enough. Okay. Now I hope the presentation is all right. Thank you for this. The third time I'm talking on this forum. This is the third summit. And uh, Dr. Gurg called me Dr. Venkat Raman. He has also put me along with all doctors. I'm not a doctor, but I work with all the doctors in my company. Secondly, the concept I'm going to talk about now is more practical uh, nuts and bolts to take it to the commercialization. So that we'll take it up there and talk. So let me start uh, sharing the screen. Can you see the screen now? I don't know where I am. Puneet, can you help him? I'm not able to get, I had it earlier. It's a problem even some people had in the morning. Sir, can you uh, use share the screen? So I had to go down. Yeah, I'm trying to see. Did you see yeah, a file? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. 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 Okay, now I go on. We see your computer. Are you able to now? See your screen, but uh, you just, just go, go to your presentation. presentation. I had to go to the share. Your PPT file. Just leave it on your PPT file. So the share now. We double click on this. I can see my video, but I am not able to share the screen. Puneet? Yes, sir. Can you help him? I had it this morning. Sir, so just, just open, open your PPT on your system. system. What is it? Can he come on the phone? Or will you please uh, send an email to Dr. Aminina to the one that I email ID, so we will share on the screen. You can't hear it because a lot of echo is there. So I can see here. How do I go from Zoom United only I see here? Yeah, now I can see share screen. And this one comes from which one I share. And this now here, I'm not able to. Now it's fine. Yes, it is seen. Now you can see. Please make presentation mode. Yes. Can you see Dr. Gurk? Yes, yes. Can I proceed? Yes. yes. Okay, so this is a subject we're having and uh, I want to say we belong to a group. I don't know how to navigate this. So this is SWIN group. Well, you must be wondering what I'm doing here as a technology, technology company. We have developed gasification technology, which will talk about it. We belong to a group, paper mills, which uses biomass for the paper making, and they also do the biomass co-firing, and then they have a 
which is trying to put up an ethanol plant to go for uh, ethanol in future. Then a battery manufacturing unit, which is, uh, are you able to hear me now? Can you hear me, Dr. Gar? Yes, yes, please continue. Okay, okay. battery manufacturing unit, which is uh, going to make hydrogen fuel cells in the future. And we are trying to see how to get them to make hydrogen. I'll talk about it. This is our signals, and this is what Eastern Advanced Technology is about. Then, Eastern Tech Extreme Gasification, we have been doing this. We set up a demo plant and I set aside paper, indigenous manufacturing for a capacity of 10 tons per day of solids, even as early as 1992, and pioneered the gas of black chicken displacement to us. So, we are one of the earliest one. Currently, the company is promoting biofuels by a syn gas derived from feedstocks like biomass, MSW. The technology source from their principal thermochem record in international ball. And we'll be interested to talk about TRA later. TRA is right now commissioning a commercial plant of 500 tons per day, MSW2 SAF, Sustained Aviation Fuel or SAF, as they call it. So we'll talk about it tomorrow morning. TRA CEO, Dr. Barshaga will be, Mr. Barshaga will be talking on that. So I don't want to dwell much on that. So I'll proceed with this. Okay, these are the things everybody is talking about, but um, very few talk about this uh, green hydrogen from biomass gasification. You can see all of them talk about gray hydrogen, brown, of course, it starts with brown. They started with gray, then went to brown. Then uh, looking at blue now, then green. Well, this is what I'm going to talk about, the transition from how to get from brown to blue. We are not yet even in brown. There is Coal gasification. We have been doing it more for fertilizers and, and petrochemicals like Reliance has done it with pet coke, calcium thing with coal, and then uh, JSPL. One of the few ones were done for uh, gone for sink gas to direct uh, reduction of iron or DRI. So all of them are using sink gas, not necessarily brown hydrogen or blue hydrogen. So they can go to blue hydrogen. That's what JSP are talking about. So I'll be talking more on how to get to brown hydrogen. The country requires to make 100 million tons of coal gas gasification. Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji has announced two years ago that you go for 100 million tons of coal gasification. And as part of the Nitya Yoga, I'm talking about the Nitya Yoga committee. I mean, on a technical committee, we are talking how to promote this with the four or five projects in coal gasification to methanol and earthing, also lignant gasification to methanol, DME, et cetera. Then I'm trying to promote blue hydrogen. So now let us look at blue and hydrogen both. And uh, let me take you step by step as to what, uh, well, this is global production, all of you know that mostly is natural gas is 48% and then 30% is um, oil and then electrolysis is only 4%. So this is the gray hydrogen production. You can spell it either way, G-R-E-W-A or G-R-E-W. <laughs> this is in fact a gray part now production using steam reforming. This has been going for ages now, so everybody knows about this. So this is where we learned how to take the syn gas and clean it up with the water gas shaped and gas vegetation to take it to the next level to green hydrogen from biomass. So we'll come to that in a while. So this is the schematic. Lignose is biomass is what going to be my thrust. This is what we are trying to do. Do the, the pyrolysis gasification. If you go to pyrolysis, produce oil, and then you do catalytic rocking, cracking, and do light oil things. Straight gasification, very simple, like if, any other gasification process. Go with the use of oxygen blown or steam, no air. The air is you have nitrogen dilution. Then go with syn gas, which is got a high hydrogen carbon monoxide ratio. 
two is to one. That is very important. Seen gas. You can't produce from producer gas the hydrogen because there's so much of air introduced, nitrogen introduced. Then you go for water gas shape, then produce hydrogen. Then you can do candy synthesis, methanol, DME, etc. So this is a basically the thrust in a biomass gasification. Then I'm talking about little bit early. I want to have the slide later. So here we have hydrology PowerPoint, high pressure water, and then we are using PM electrolyzer. And then we talk about this green hydrogen where electricity is used to produce ammonia in the Haber-Bosch process. So this is something we'll discuss later. So this is for the biomass, is what uh, TRI, our principles are doing. You go from biomass to biomass feed system, that's very important, whether you have to dry it, you have to crush it. You don't need to have briquettes for fluorescent bed, which you are using, that is very important. So we can have crushed biomass, but we need a dry biomass because we don't want to load the reactor with a lot of moisture, but you can still use, but it's inefficient to use a lot of moisture. The gas has got a high moisture of 50%, we like to reduce it to about 10%. And then maybe crush it also a little bit. And then you go to a steam reformer and then two stage take the balanced carbon to carbon trim cell and produce syn gas. I'm not going to much in the process details. Then it's called RTO. It's a box oxidation. Then we go to primary syn gas cleanup, syn gas compression, et cetera. FT catalytic reactor, then FT liquid, and then you have finally from liquids you can make uh, so many things. So that's what is important. So production of green hydrogen from thermo conversion of biomass and electrolysis using renewable energy. So many of people are talking about green hydrogen from biomass. All the presentation, including from what I just saw from um, ONGC, I think, all talked about only sorry about the phone calls. So this is what you want. We're going to be talking how to take the biomass in India. We have bagasse and rice accounting for more than 40 million tons. In fact, it's an underestimate by me, available across India. And when I talk bagasse, it is surplus bagasse. So that means a surplus. Once upon a time, we're looking for surplus bagasse to make paper. Now you're looking at surplus bagasse to make uh, hydrogen because conventional bagasse also refired into the boilers or goes for cogen. So we are trying to see how some of the plants who don't have the cogen of bagasse can send the surplus bagasse to make uh, to make hydrogen. My friend Sunil Singhal uh, is trying to make a thousand tons per day bagasse to hydrocarbon fuels using shell technology. So that's a very interesting thing. And also bamboo, this morning you heard you about chem policies being from bamboo. That's a great thrust uh, and uh, making it making basically ethanol, so not hydrogen, but uh, ethanol to hydrogen is the next step. And then the gas and rice are available, okay? Then you have to see how to get uh, cheaper energy storage system required for green hydrogen from other renewables. When you use renewables for electrolyzers, you need to have storage for the hydrogen. Whereas in the biomass, you have to only store the biomass for the off season, as I said here. So this is what is very important. This is very critical in terms of practical usage. So when you go to electrolyzers, you have to have energy storage system. So it's going to be very big, it's going to be more expensive. Transportation is also the next thing I will be talking about. So all these logistics are very important before we talk fundamentals of green hydrogen. So production of green hydrogen from thermal conversion of biomass using, this is what we just discussed. It is that it is estimated that a minimum size of 100 to 200 dry tons per day of bagasse straw or sweet stock might be viable. That's a good show. In fact, we have put up on a 500 tons dry tons per day of steam reformer in Nevada. 
making uh, from MSW to SAF, and they also can make it from bagasse. So this means we can produce green hydrogen 24 seven for 350 days to the extent of about 30,000 dry tons per year without the need to some tons for hydrogen, without the need to acquire large land area that is required for renewable power, used in electrolysis to produce green hydrogen. These are some of the practical problems and they're very much relevant to India. We don't have big land area available, populations big, acquisition of land is a big problem. And we can get of the biomass in plenty, getting rid of the biomass is a problem. So let us address what is required for the day. So as we go along talking about it, we'll talk about why we should look at blue hydrogen more and green hydrogen later. So I'll come to that in a minute. So power hydrogen, look at green hydrogen power culture, 55 units per kg. So half of your energy goes in the putting input to the green hydrogen. So further, the power available is only when the sun shines or the wind blows. So you need ESS, such as battery storage, all adds to the cost of delivery of green hydrogen. So we must deliver green hydrogen, not at the production site, because everybody knows which I'm going to talk about, transportation of green hydrogen or for the matter, any hydrogen. So there are some commercial gas production technologies that offer hydrogen production 900 kg per ton of dry bagasse price to about 500 kg per ton. So from 20 million tons of uh, rice available here in Punjab, we can make 1 million tons of hydrogen per year. That's fantastic if you can do that. So we take care of two problems at the same time, but there is very little focus on biomass gasification. Everybody's talking about biomass, everybody's talking about green hydrogen, they're also talking about gasification. They are not talking about comprehensively biomass gasification taken into green hydrogen. So this is what is should be the thrust, and this is what I'm trying to talk. Then comes to logistics. Hydrogen gas is similar to natural gas. Everybody knows it's a very light number one element on the world. And then hydrogen is non-toxic and safe to breathe. Hydrogen is also waterless and colorless. Mind you, all the brown, green, all we are talking is only the way we produce hydrogen is colorless and tasteless since it cannot be iodized like natural gas, odorized, sorry. What natural gas and the LPG are all doped with some metal mercaptans so that it can betray itself when it leaks by the smell. So hydrogen detection ventilation systems are employed. Like all fuels, hydrogen is flammable and must be handled properly. The thing about transportation, a full truck containing liquid hydrogen can transport tons of compared to 1.5 tons of compressed hydrogen 700 bar. In India, we're using only 200 bar hydrogen. We have to go to 700 bar. In US, they're using 700 bar. Hydrogen is transported safely through 700 miles of pipelines also, and 70 million gallons of liquid hydrogen is transported annually by truck without any incident. So these are something we have to learn as to how to transport hydrogen and dissolve faster to do blue hydrogen like this. Then we go and look at green hydrogen. Because green hydrogen cost has to come down. It takes what we probably if you want to looking at net zero by 2050, you should start looking at by 2030 how much the hydrogen, blue hydrogen will produce to bring down the carbon intensity. Because we have to start now, if not yesterday. So I will keep mentioning that we used to Make blue, we should make blue hydrogen for coal and lignite and purses and making all the endeavors, both to the naval lignite and the other companies. Hydrogen transportation, storage, Mr. hydrogen being Mr. Bankataraman, Mr. Bankataraman, yeah. three, three minutes, please. Oh, yes, no problem. I'm done. So, liquid hydrogen is a problem. So, but Australia has already started to ship Japan liquid blue hydrogen stores from gas to atomic lignite. So if you had to do liquid hydrogen, just be huge volume, but you have shipped. Green hydrogen is more expensive, so storage and transportation has to be more critical. It's your cost effectiveness. Liquid ammonia is a good option, but only for large hydrogen plant using electrolysis split water, as viable ammonia production requires large scale. CAPEX and hence can be deployed only for industrial uses such as production of green steel, fertilizer, etc. 
until the stand green hydrogen gets caused parity with blue hydrogen or gray hydrogen gasification of indian coal lignite with or without ccs should continue until the stand lng lpg import is reduced to minimum this is what the national hydrogen machine is promoting and reliance industries has announced already so that is great news for us that we are moving the right direction hydrogen demand is something we are looking at how to charge the fuel cell vehicles so steam reforming is a method but that's very cumbersome methanol can be done steam reforming cngs cbg compressed biogas we are been talking about how you are going to get hydrogen from that you have to reform it it's not easy it's a big system you are already the reformer you know what we are talking ammonia cracking yes it is but toxicity is a problem p of fuels can't accept the method as the traces of ammonia are not acceptable so hydrogen carrier materials green hydrogen with catalytic cracking of ethanol and renewable dme is what we are now developing along with the overseas of electrons of pairs and this will definitely improve the delivery of hydrogen molecules because there are six hydrogen molecules to be installed in fuel stations so that we have hydrogen on demand so i have kept within my time so thank you for your attention dr gar and uh, mr kenal like to thank all of you and uh, the committee on the world fuel i look forward to again joining you next year thank you thank you dr venkataraman for your excellent exhaustive presentation and now i will request mr chandshekhar chincholkar chandshekhar are you there mr chandshekhar Mr. Chand Shekhar. Yeah. So kindly make presentation. Thank you. Please unmute, sir. Chand Shekhar, are you unmute, please? Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Chan Shekhar, please. Can you see the screen, sir? Yes, yes. So, good evening, all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gurg, for inviting me here. So, in terms of the uh, energy transition, green hydrogen, and what can possibly happen in the future in India, uh, I thank Dr. Gurg for inviting me here and giving this opportunity to, to talk on this particular platform. So. uh moving on from here uh, so you know the index carries about talks about energy transition our commitment to fuel cell electric mobility uh, brief about hydrogen economy and then brief about our company as such so you know energy transition uh, we have been reading so much about energy transition entire world is committed to paris uh, agreement reduction of temperature uh, by 1.5 to 2 degrees reduction of uh, co2 emissions and you know china usa being the top emitters currently india committed to large amount of renewable power you know we are looking at solar energy in a big way and in this recent cop26 uh, prime minister has committed about 1 billion ton uh, co2 emission reduction by 2030 and obviously from the current level of 21 22% of forest cover we need to uh, look at uh, moving towards a uh, 33% of forest cover so you know as we are aware uh, from a mobility perspective 85% of the crude is imported current oil imports are uh, you know roughly in the range of uh, uh, 110 to 120 billion dollars uh, we are a 3 trillion dollar economy trying to move towards 5 trillion dollar economy the elasticity of power or energy requirement uh, is in the range of 1.4 to 1.5 times and you know if you look at uh, a uh, gdp growing at 9% plus or 8 to 9% range you can imagine the kind of requirement of uh, energy in the coming days so 
no uh, this is uh, going to be a huge requirement for india and obviously india needs to develop alternative sources of energy both on the mobility side as well as on the manufacturing side so other than you know after this covid thing uh, people have now started very seriously looking at china plus initiative so this will obviously propel the growth in terms of manufacturing and i think the power requirement in the coming days as well as the overall energy requirement in the coming days is going to be significantly higher uh we have seen what can happen because of higher coal shortages and how the power prices actually have gone up in the last so many uh, months so again talking about energy transition current capacity on the renewable side is 100 gigawatt you know majority of the incremental power generation has can actually coming from solar and wind and uh, we need to really have a new power generation model in wind energy because currently the locations for wind uh, energy are you know limited and to get more efficiency on wind turbines beyond 15 17% is going to be really difficult so you need to develop alternative models of wind energy and uh, can we have wind turbines you know installed on the sea shores to get more uh, renewable power how can india you know uh, current energy consumption in india is around 1200 units per person this has to actually go beyond 3000 because some of the most developed countries have per unit per capita consumption of around 5000 units and uh, the need for replacement of coal using alternative fuel as uh, you know hydrogen so if you look at uh, india's energy transition there are two components to it broadly mobility uh, mobility mobility related decarbonization is something which is around 20 22% and manufacturing related decarbonization is around 70 to 80% so uh, you know where will be the oil consumption in the next 10 years diesel consumption currently is 40 million metric ton and we expect uh, Uh, you know this is only from the point of your buses and trucks overall diesel consumption is around 80 85 million metric ton and if you have to look at india reaching a gdp of 10 trillion dollars uh, uh, you know the, the the requirement of diesel in the coming days is going to be significantly higher this will obviously lead to more energy energy challenges uh, more requirement for uh, uh, you know power as well as for uh, fuel in the coming days so you know power consumption will probably increase from current 400 450 gigawatt to maybe 850 900 but if you look at china plus one strategy i think the requirement for power in the next 10 years could be 1000 gigawatt plus uh, if we continue with diesel consumption how will india and, and the world reduce actually co2 emission this is a big challenge we need to address so looking at climate change farmers income and making it more sustainable for the world is something that is very important biomass based renewable generation and other alternative technology is a real need for india now uh, we as a company what is our commitment to fuel cell electric mobility that is a green mobility using hydrogen as a fuel so we have developed this but first uh, ground of fuel cell in the country um, uh, you know uh, the efficiency of the fuel cell is currently much on the higher side and uh, 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 you know this is the first indigenous fuel cell stack which has been developed ground up in the country and uh, we see that over a period of uh, next 3 to 4 years the overall cost uh, once we reach more than 1200 uh, 1000 or 1500 buses in the initial phase which can be supported uh, by government through fem fem2 policy which is already likely to be implemented for uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles also then we can definitely see the uh, 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 fuel cell cost coming down below 400 dollars per kilowatt currently internationally fuel cell cost is around uh, 1200 to 1500 dollars per kilowatt but our costs are currently a uh, little lower than what uh, the the global costs are but looking at higher volumes we are pretty sure that we can definitely come down to uh, less than 400 dollars but obviously the volumes need to increase so that's uh, that is where the government needs to come in and support now in terms of uh, use of hydrogen as a fuel uh, you know highest amount of uh, specific energy it's almost three times that of diesel uh, carbon neutral uh obviously the efficiency of uh, uh, fuel cell is 50% you know you look at diesel uh, ice ice engine basically which is been operational in india or globally for almost 50 plus years now but the efficiency of the uh, diesel engine is currently around 25 27% as compared to that fuel cell efficiency can be more than 50% plus so uh, this is something which uh, uh, can be a great uh, benefit in terms of the new technology and zero emission fuel fuel output is electrical energy and water so in terms of the pathways for generation of hydrogen what are the parts pathways uh, other other speakers also spoke about it so natural gas steam methane reformation methanol reformation water electrolysis uh, uh, msw gasification and hydrogen from uh, biomass so both cellulosic biomass as well as uh, you know msw 
uh, or woody biomass, uh, we have two technologies in India. One hydro uh, technology, which is basically the microbial route, which has been very successful at the lab scale and generation of uh, hydrogen from uh, cellulosic biomass like rice straw, wheat straw and you know bamboo is something which uh, has been experimented in the, in the lab scale. So we are going ahead with a little larger plant at this point of time. Then the second technology is about gasification. Uh, we are also uh, using MSW and other uh, woody material. So our technology demonstration project is currently underway and uh, we should be able to basically come out with this technology which will generate 100 kg of hydrogen on a per day basis in probably in the next month or so. So this is our own contribution in terms of how energy transition challenges for India can be addressed. And uh, we feel that if both these technologies can be successful uh, along with water electrolysis, which, uh, uh, which I believe the cost has uh, started coming down significantly. And uh, uh, you know, since we have developed our own fuel cell, we'll obviously be doing some amount of research on the electrolyzer because Electrolyzer is exactly the reverse in fuel, reversal in reverse in fuel cell. So you know, and we used uh, uh, proton exchange membrane fuel cell, and uh, our first uh, uh, you know demonstration project has actually been already happened in in the country. I will take go to the next slide. Uh, the you know hydro, what is the global hydrogen scenario currently? Uh, the entire world is looking at hydrogen. You look at most of the developed countries. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. John also mentioned about hydrogen council. So these are all members of the hydrogen council. And uh, you know they are all adopting to hydrogen. So we have large amount of uh, global uh, acceptance for hydrogen as a fuel. Obviously, the number of projects which are currently in the range of 300 to 400, they need, obviously need to improve. And uh, moving on from here, uh, you know the entire world is actually moving towards hydrogen. You look at the countries, you look at the changing automotive industry. What are the commitments from big large players globally? Then what are the number of members of the Hydrogen Council? I think the current member strength has actually crossed uh, 100 already. And, uh, uh, you know, the amount of money that is available under the program, under the ESG program, that is the envi Environment, Social and Governance, out of which Environment obviously is the biggest factor. And uh, is significantly large. Currently, $31 trillion is the amount of money that is available. And this, um, this money will actually double in the next uh, three to four years in terms of availability of money from an investment perspective. And these investors who are basically the institutional investors, they actually drive the change. So this, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you look at what uh, Mr. Larry Fink, who's the CEO of BlackRock, who manages around $10 trillion globally, one of the largest institutional fund managers, he has actually, as a CEO of the investment fund, has actually written to all global CEOs where they have investment. And they have asked uh, these companies to take up ESG on a very, very serious note. And I think that will be that will bring in actually a very large amount of change in terms of addressing environmental and social issues uh, and governance issues. But obviously, environment is the biggest factor that we need to look at because most of the large companies globally are reasonably well managed from the point of view of social and governance. So if you look at the number of funds who are committed to Paris Agreement is around 450 plus, then some of the big names which I mentioned here, like BlackRock, Amundi, you know, Calpers, Howard University, Endowment Funds, Breakthrough Energy. So these are all the biggies who are actually committed to all these uh, uh, ESG, ESG issues in the country. Now, from a hydrogen perspective, what is the relevance for India? Uh, you know, we are looking at becoming a 11 trillion dollar economy. Uh, uh, currently, the imports are in the range of 120 billion dollars. Around 40 million tons actually spent on buses and trucks. Uh, India is one of the largest, uh, uh, you know, third largest polluter uh, CO2 emitter in the world. 10 of the large 20 world's most polluted cities are in India. Transportation contributes 30% of the urban, uh, urban pollution. So this is something which is very critical. The number of people who are staying in cities at this point of time will increase to 60% by 2030. So we obviously need to have uh, pollution under control as far as cities are concerned because cities will have large number of vehicles. So those cities which cannot afford metros or, uh, you know, metros obviously will have limited uh, people traveling on it. So, you know, public tra transport, whether it is intercity or in intercity, is something which uh, needs to really improve. And uh, how this can actually benefit farmers is that, uh, you know, we have 50% uh, population, exact number is 58%, which is actually dependent on, on agriculture, and 85% farmers actually own land, which is less than uh, five acres, and uh, their income is in the range of 17 to 18,000 per acre. So, these are all challenges which need to be addressed. Uh, you know, uh, what can be the impact of hydrogen economy? Uh, India consumes around 80 million um, um, metric ton of diesel, 40 million ton, uh, tons actually come from buses and trucks. 
8 million tons of hydrogen can actually completely replace 40 million uh, tons of diesel. So as far as the buses and trucks requirement is concerned, something that can actually be made through uh, uh, hydrogen as a fuel. And these are the this is something which is uh, you know as I as I move ahead, you'll see these slides also. This is something which is intercity transport, which can in a big way 350 to 400 kilometers daily use uh, transport can actually be significantly replaced using hydrogen. And uh, uh, you know if you look at the the current prices of hydrogen that are in the range of 56 dollars, but if you look at biomass based production with dedicated cultivated biomass, I think the cost can actually come down to 250 300 rupees. Some of the bigger players like Reliance, they are already talking about $1. OMEM is also already talking about $1. So if we can get hydrogen at $1, the dispensing cost can actually be in the range of 200 rupees. And with a mileage of around 15 to 18 uh, kilometers per kg, I think this can be a significantly win-win uh, situation for uh, intercity bus and truck transportation in the country. Uh, our estimates show that economic value for biomass generation of hydrogen dispensing can actually lead to uh, you know around 12 to 15 lakh crores of economy in the coming days from a hydrogen perspective and uh, use of hydrogen for decarbonization of steel is something uh, which is very much required because steel and cement are the largest polluters if you look at europe europe is actually going to ban any steel import beyond 2025 or 2026 if it is not from uh, uh, you know it has not moved towards decarbonization as a process so globally trade is also shifting towards decarbonized uh, manufacturing processes and products and, and that is something which will actually uh, uh, drive this particular change in terms of uh, uh, green hydrogen and the economy now what is the what are the what are the uh, uh, you know what is the mega scale opportunity for india strong move towards uh, you know large solar and wind projects as a renewable source of energy hydrogen policy is around the corner i believe it should be out from government of india uh, mnre ministry in the next 8 to 10 days Internet of energy is something which we have suggested to the government. Current cost uh, of uh, intercity in, in uh, you know uh, uh, interstate uh, power transport landed cost for solar if, if they if the cost of uh, production is around two rupees uh, still actually goes beyond four rupees today because of various charges. So the, the government is actually talking about twenty five to fifty paisa you know uh, uh, transportation cost which will actually bring down the solar power cost to around two rupees or two rupees fifty paisa per unit. As we are aware, electrolyzer actually consumes anything between 55 to 57 kilowatt hour units per kg of hydrogen. So if the cost of uh, uh, solar power can come down, then obviously the cost of hydrogen can come down in a big way. Then India has large biomass. I think 200 million metric ton is the bio MSW available. Biomass, of biomass available is also in, in huge quantity. So other than this, we can actually go for ded dedicated biomass production, which can actually help in terms of uh, bamboo as well as energy cane. Carbon credit for farmers and producers. Basically, the entire value chain needs to be benefited because of this, and we need to move very quickly to all the nature-based solutions. Companies like Shell and all are committed significantly to India. They have they are actually looking at around three billion dollars of investment in this nature-based solution, which can actually lead to large amount of carbon sequestration in the coming days. Uh, you know, mobility-based solutions, 400 kilometers plus, is the, the the easiest way to actually move towards and actually see the results. If you go ahead with the 100 bus project for uh, intercity bus transportation, uh, 12 meter bus, and you go ahead with electrolyzer and uh, dispensing, I think the project can actually be managed uh, uh, below 500 crores, and that is something which can help us to see the results. And actually, you know, measure every every part of the uh, outcome, and that can actually help in terms of uh, uh, seeing the uh, better part of hydrogen economy in the coming days. Uh, we also need to really seriously think about emission trading system in India because Europe obviously has a large emission trading system and UK has recently started. So this is something which is very critical and important for us to move. We earlier had CER tradings in India till 2011, but obviously because of the fall of, uh, uh, you know, the reduction in prices for uh, CERs and obviously the no outcome coming out of COP26. So all the past carbon credits uh, are not getting traded or they are, they are not getting sold. But obviously, India needs to really have a large amount of emission trading system and carbon trading system, which would actually start, start very soon. So this was the first, uh, you know, project that we did with CSIR in India. We demonstrated a, uh, uh, you know, uh, retrofitted uh, fuel cell uh, car in at at CSIR premises here in Pune. CSIR has, has been our partner for this particular project. So this is the first demonstration that we did. Then the second uh, demonstration, we actually launched the first fuel cell bus in the country. 
15 December, the launch was actually done at the hands of Dr. Marshalkar, who has been a PMO advisor and in, you know is the direct ex director general of CSR in India. And the, uh, the middle middle one is our our chairman, Mr. Ravi Pandit, and the person on the left is uh, Dr. Ashish Lele, current director of NCL in Pune. So this has this bus has been launched uh, for for the first time. This is a 100% ground up India made fuel cell bus in the country. So this is our contribution in terms of uh, uh, you know towards clean transportation in the country. So what we see as potential impact of hydrogen economy, uh, you know. Uh, Introduction of fossil fuel imports in a big way, uh, then biomass generation can actually lead to uh, larger increase in income for the farmers, large number of jobs creation. Uh, you know, every ton of hydrogen generated from biomass can reduce 24 tons of CO2 emissions. Potentially, this can meet 30% of India's COP commitments. And at full scale, hydrogen economy can actually increase India's GDP by 6% approximately. So if you look at the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, which can actually be meet, met through hydrogen economy, and which is actually uh, the green ones, uh, is something which is very critical and important, good health and well-being, affordable please, clean energy. Can, yeah. Please conclude within next two minutes, please. Yeah, sure, sir. Uh, a good health and well-being, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth. The green ones are basically uh, what are the direct impacts of uh, hydrogen economy and I think uh, we should more seriously look at hydrogen as a product which can be uh, uh, you know uh, used as a fuel in the coming days so these are these are the benefits and everybody is now looking at 2030 as a uh, SDG meet, meeting goal and I think we can definitely as a country have more national determined contribution which can actually contribute towards sustainable development goals so briefly about us as KPIT you know 100% automotive technologies company on the software side 7,000 employees 25 innovation award, 51 global patents, and we spend large amount of our revenue on R&D. So these are the areas of work we do, electric powertrain, autonomous driving, connected vehicles, vehicle diagnostics, mechatronics, and autosar. And these are our offices worldwide. These are the key customers, BMW, Eton, and you can see the other big names that are, that are our customers actually. And thank you so much, Dr. Garg, for inviting me here, and I will be happy to take any questions or any discussions ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chanshekar, for excellent presentation. And uh, this will continue the tone of hydrogen economy in our country. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, is there any question? If there is no question, then I will request uh, every distinguished plenary speaker to make a one or two line statement. So I will start uh, from you, Chan Shekhar, it's yourself. Yeah, uh, sir, uh, our submission is that India should uh, uh, take a much bigger role in hydrogen economy. Other than what is happening on the electric vehicle side, uh, using battery as a as a uh, you know source of energy, I think hydrogen uh, in our country has a much larger and much bigger potential. So we should uh, uh, you know go easily towards more easily towards hydrogen economy. We have large players who can actually contribute both on the public sector side as well as private side. You can contribute to this particular economy, and maybe initially we can start with blue hydrogen, but moving towards uh, you know hydrogen economy is, is the real need for the country and then slowly move towards green hydrogen sir thank you yeah uh, dr venkat yes sir <coughs> can you hear me now yeah yeah i think i would agree with uh, chandrasekhar the idea is a transition so the word transition when i see used dr gard we cannot jump onto a bandwagon and say we all produce green hydrogen. It is a little bit late in the day. We have to start today. So it will take another five to 10 years to get the parity as a gray hydrogen. So we should start with blue hydrogen because we do want to reduce the carbon intensity. And steel industries are importing midcock. We have to stop that with the DRI and we can use blue hydrogen. Similarly, we had to do from lignite and diesel, I'm sorry, 
also we had to stop lpg import and make dme from methanol and pump into all the lpg and gas lines because gail has already started pumping into hydrogen into the cng lines so let us produce more blue hydrogen we don't need green hydrogen there so why at such a high cost and since it's fine when you want to do it you have to go to scale like a reliance have done when for electrolysis but then what i am advocate is go with biomass small scale make it competitive so that is my thrust so that is a lot of development work is being done but i am bringing in new technology state of import india that is what the need of the world we cannot be go on developing indian of science is doing it gail is doing it it's all fine but let us start with what is available now if it is so long it is economic thank you dr parvathalu are you there uh, yes i am there i just i am here on this uh, yeah. thank you very much actually uh, my previous speakers have already told actually what i was talking about uh, the thing is that future needs large quantities of hydrogen as it was projected something something like 12 million tons is by 2030 so electricity alone will not be able to produce hydrogen of the desired needs in affordable way so my suggestion is that we need some patience and perseverance in developing therm thermal sources also for generating hydrogen using water as the source so that it can be affordable and lot of investments also can be coming up and a lot of opportunities exist for doing this thing that's what i wanted to tell. thank you thank you dr parvathalu for giving exhaustive account and now we will close this session uh, and we have to thank excellent presentation by mr chandshekhar by parvathalu and dr venkat for this session and uh, hopefully i got message that uh, two of our us persons could not be here because of date uh, message was not very clear to them uh, that uh, uh, this is morning 16 in us so <laughs> so uh, i have to write very clearly uh, what what should be there so this is a lot of confusion on this and on next time we will take care and wish you good luck and hopefully the economy will flourish with hydrogen starting from blue to green hydrogen thank you very much Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Garg, and thank you. And thank you so thank, much, for Dr. Garg, and thank you to all the speakers for this session. Indeed, uh, it was uh, not only a very fruitful session, but it was indeed a very fruitful day that we saw since the morning in the twelfth uh, uh, Petrocol and the World Future Fuel Summit. The, these various plenary sessions to light on various topics related to sustainable future fuel for green global climate, and these topics are not just relevant for. Uh, relevant, but are also pressing issues that really need to be dwelled upon uh, to to be discussed in detail, and the decisions and the takeaways be implemented upon. It was indeed a pleasure, gentlemen, uh, to have been part of this August gathering that gave us uh, this opportunity to learn and get more insights uh, on this very important topic of sustainable future fuel for green uh, global climate. Um, I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, and uh, these uh, discussions in the plenary session are going to continue for uh, tomorrow as well so i'd request you to be a part of uh, the sessions uh, tomorrow as well and i'll also request you to please also go through our virtual uh, 3d page uh, where you get uh, all the insights and more details on the speakers and the topics uh, but thank you gentlemen it was indeed a pleasure very good evening uh, to all of you and i wish a very uh, great uh, rest of the evening for all of you thank you so much it was a pleasure having all of you in this platform today thank you so much aishwarya if possible please share the youtube link uh okay. sure sir i'll ask uh, yeah. yeah i'll ask the team to please share it with you sir thank you thank you so much thank you aishwarya
thank you, Doctor. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much thank for you. your thank support, you. cooperation. Thank you, and Greg, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. See you next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.